forward. The wise in all ages have always said the same things, and the fools, who at all times form the immense majority, have continued to do the opposite. Schopenhauer Offerismen zur Lebensweisheit Einleitung The prerogative of the present generation to talk and write freely and frankly about sex has been applied to an almost unlimited extent, and as good as exclusively, to the dissemination of unsound theories which pander to the passions of the human animal by sanctioning, encouraging and glorifying sexual expression for its own sake. In order to offset those fallacies, it will be necessary to take advantage of the same prerogative to use plain straightforward language in emphasizing the enormous value of conservation of the generative force, a conservation which is practically synonymous with, yet more positive than what is commonly understood by chastity. Unfortunately, many attempts to prove that value have been so sketchy and clumsy, so little logical or so biased and bigoted, that the whole idea of conservation has nearly lost all power of appeal. Yet many sound and profound reasons can be put forward in support of a philosophy, in which the central theme is an ideal of drastic purification, a philosophy which propounds that a permanently effective solution of the almost inextricably entangled problem of sex can be found only in the limitation of the sex life to reproductive activity. And although this ideal may seem extreme, and not be immediately applicable to general practice, it is of most vital importance that its fundamental principles be widely known. For a recognition of its inherent value, and a turning of face into its direction, may change the current of human evolution, if at first only in individual cases. Personally, the urge to formulate such an idealistic philosophy of humanity's most momentous and mystifying problem became irresistible when the conviction grew that a lack of chastity in act and thought constitutes the underlying cause of nearly all misery, of discontent with life, of marital disharmony, of congenital low vitality, of sluggish intellects, of many avoidable ailments, of human wrecks in body and in mind, and of countless untimely deaths. In final synthesis, the general misusage of the generative force revealed itself as the basic cause not only of humanity's woes, but also of its failure to advance in evolution. If the ideas formulated in this book represented merely the writer's opinion, they could carry but little persuasive power. But it is a verifiable fact that through the centuries the sages have almost unanimously proclaimed the signal value of sexual restraint as an ineludible requirement for the attainment of real human progress. They who possess superior wisdom apparently always knew that higher evolution is impossible without conservation of the sex force. And researches of modern scientists, as well as equitable observations by outstanding writers, lend support to the pronouncements of the wise. However, most of the relevant statements by thinkers of the past are hidden in abstruse volumes that are hardly ever accessible to the average person. And reports of modern findings are usually diluted and discolored before they come, in quasi-popularized form, under the eyes of the lay reader. It has therefore seemed worthwhile to gather brief quotations from a great variety of sources and to incorporate these into the text wherever they could be either directly corroborative or indirectly helpful in leading up to the main issue, the words of others have been introduced. Their profusion may serve to demonstrate the extent of preparatory research, as well as the impersonal and eclectic nature of the work. In order to avoid the cumbersome effect which the introduction of numerous quotations often produces, a special effort has been made to blend them with the text in such a way that the continuity of the composition is not broken. The present volume is intended mainly to inculcate a clear mental appreciation of the ideal. Another manuscript is in preparation under the title, The Conquest of the Serpent, and will deal with practical methods by which the ideal can be approached and realized. Eventually a still later volume will present some deeper metaphysical considerations in support of the claim that the race's one chance for higher evolutionary progress depends on its mastery and transmutation of the sex force. We carry an excessive burthen of sex, and we have to free ourselves from it. Wells, the world set free, in order to reconstruct society we must reconstruct the moral ideal. Adler, Reconstruction of the Spiritual Ideal. Part. 1. Formulating. The. Ideal. For the remoralization of sex, which is so long overdue, we need a more definite turning to higher ideals. Thompson and Getty's life live, heaven and earth were once united, but were severed by a serpent. Bailey, The Lost Language of Symbolism, I, V, 88. I, The Serpent. 
a serpent twisted in spiral volumes as the hieroglyphic of evil. Faber, Origin of Pagan Idolatry Caught in the mighty coils of the giant serpent sex, humanity is on the point of being crushed and strangled. That serpent, which in the beginning was intended to serve human evolution, was foolishly adopted as a pet and unduly coaxed and fondled. Being overfed and pampered and having its slightest whims complied with, the pet has grown into a monster that has overpowered its master, and now threatens to destroy him. Out of the choking throat of imperiled humanity, the inner ear can hear a cry for help ascending, a fearful cry that swells and falls and again rises, pleading for liberation from the malignant creature's rigid hold. But there is no response, no outside help forthcoming. Man's precarious position is entirely self-produced. He himself it was who gave the creature all the power it now has by his habitual yielding to its growing demands, and he himself must remedy this self-created woe by unrelenting self-exertion. The serpent is the monster to be overcome. If man but wills he can reduce its power. He can brace himself against the pressure of the uncanny coils. He can in fact subdue the unwieldy and unruly reptile even yet by opposing its depraved desires. By will he can reduce it to servility again and then its valuable hidden power will aid him in his ascent of evolution's path. Indeed, when conquered the serpent becomes a means of life. Instead of appropriating the life force of man, it will then supply him with the greatest factor that can lead to a higher human existence. The turbulent serpent of sex will then be transformed into the docile serpent of wisdom, which will show the way out of the human toward the superhuman state. But man must not delay. He must unloose the coils before the monster crushes him. The symbol of a snake encoding the body of humanity occurs in the mythology of various peoples. An oriental literature mentions a serpent coiled up in a mysterious center of force inside the human body. While the two are not entirely equivalent, the uncoiling of this serpent within the body, as of the entwining monster, is held to be man's evolutionary task. Records of a serpent symbolism in some form or another have been found in all parts of the world. Especially of universal occurrence are the legends about heroes who conquer an evil serpent. And there can be no doubt that these legends symbolize the necessity of man's victory over the domineering influence of sex, for from the earliest times folklore seems to have connected the serpent with the sexual function. Erudite investigators have come to the conclusion that the serpent always has a phallic signification. But what usually mystifies the student of symbolism is that, though the serpent is exhibited as the representative of the evil principle, it is considered also in the opposite light. However, where the symbolism has not suffered in transition, there is a notable difference between the two portrayals. While the evil serpent is coiled, the serpent of good is always represented as upright. This is the transformed serpent, not any more coiled but standing on its tail, its body slightly curved, reminiscent of the human spine, which plays such an important part in the actual uncoiling of the serpent? It is still the phallic serpent, but conquered tamed and thereby changed into the most valuable adjunct of man. Reflective inquiry into various forms of serpent symbolism shows that they contain a principle of supreme importance, namely, that every effort to resist the demands of the sexual urge will gradually lead to an uncoiling of the serpent, and therewith to spiritual freedom and untrammeled evolutionary growth. But this ultimate result cannot be attained without a conscious realization of ideal purification. Tremendous purity is the one secret of spirituality, of that factor of evolutionary attainment, which must follow the acquisition of intellect, but which has almost entirely been neglected by mankind. To Ignorance The Serpent, Ever in Congress with its Infernal Counterpart of Ignorance Mead called the Oracles 237. Humanity is like a child that is hiding away from its elders, who call to it because they know that it should make an effort to develop its abeyant faculties. It is like a child that wishes to continue to play with distorted images of real things, instead of becoming acquainted with everlasting realities. It is like a child that persists in remaining ignorant of the deeper verities of the science of life. Humanity plays with life. It plays with sex. It wants to perpetuate that playing rather than understand nature's eternal laws, rather than unfold its latent spiritual powers. It would play on until these very powers became stunted forever, until otherwise matured, it would become an imbecile in regard to spirit. If the clinging to toys persists, 
and if ignorance is claimed as an excuse where there is only flagrant and purposeful ignoring, there is imminent danger of incurable idiocy on the spiritual level. Already mankind is subnormal for its age, because it engrosses itself in precarious material diversions, because it is absorbed in frivolous emotional games, because it does far too little real thinking, and remains obstinately ignorant of facts and laws concerning its own true nature. Men err in their choice of pleasures from defect of knowledge, they are content with the little goods they have, and adhere desperately to these in ignorance of the greater blessings to which they could attain did they but open their spiritual eyes. Mental development makes a child gradually set aside its infantile toys. After a while it does not want them again, and would not at any price wish to exchange its arduously acquired mental enjoyments for a return to the foolish playthings which amused it when it was ignorant. So will spiritual unfoldment make man gradually leave his playing, particularly with such things as were never meant for play. It will make him rise above the customary sexual games. After a little while he will not want these again, will not want to forsake the far greater glorious joys gained in his spiritual growth, for a return to the unwisely chosen playthings of his period of sensuous amusements. But through sheer willfulness and cherished ignorance humanity seems to prefer to go on with its playing, even with the most sacred treasures on nature's altar. Childlike, it moans if it scorches its fingers when grasping the sacrosanct vessel in which bums the sacred flame. It groans when sickness follows the quaffing of the holy wine. It whines when it is taken from its ungodly perilous game. It rages when it is threatened with retributory action of nature's exacting laws. And it will not see that all its misery and suffering result from its own stubborn persistence in remaining ignorant of spiritual principles. Such ignorance is unavoidable in the infancy and early youth of a race. But the large portion of humanity that has racially arrived at the advanced adolescent stage should now overcome that ignorance. It should know its own dormant spiritual powers, awaken them, and make them dominant. It should drop the unsanctioned toying and stop its wasteful playing with the life force, which is the most sacred force in nature. Ill Civilization The progress of civilization seems to have been unfavorable to the virtue of chastity. Gibbon, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire I-9-504. The energy of civilization man is directed outwards. It is applied to materialistic and intellectual progress at the cost of the spiritual. Thus our knowledge has increased but not our wisdom. Industrial mechanics have astoundingly evolved, but not the modes of building character. While we are hastening from moment to moment, we have neither leisure nor repose, for the development of character. The stressing of the physical sciences without a corresponding cultivation of the spiritual factors has lowered man's sense of his moral power and responsibility. The most noxious sign of the blight in the social atmosphere is the openly increasing laxity of morals. In fact, moral sense is almost completely ignored by modern society. The race may be more intellectual than it ever was, but it is not more spiritual. Intellect preponderates. At the same time, Consciously hardly anyone thinks today of developing the soul. The great intellectual progress has been achieved to the detriment of soul life. Yet it is the character of the soul which determines man's level. Man has learned to control many of nature's forces. But as long as he cannot control the forces within himself, there can be no question of real civilization. Control of appetites is the first step in human culture. As regards his sexual ethics man has retrograded. Although a milder mannerism and sexual expression has been adopted by mankind, it has not become less sensual, rather the opposite. Human culture has not carried things further than the putting of a finer polish on, our animal impulses. The effort of our civilization has been to domesticate lusts, and now they are found and fostered in almost every home. In comparison with the mode of life which prevailed among mankind for thousands of years, we people of the present day are living in a very immoral age. Sexual morals have been cast aside. Sexual license would seem to be the unwritten code of modern society. We find ourselves in a welter of urban sensualism and immorality. Sex tends to permeate to such an extent man's mental and emotional as well as physical existence that sex and its expression have become an obsession, and the present generation stands practically indicted as one of sex addicts. Characteristically one finds in this age of boasted culture, society saturated with sexual abuses from the bottom to the top, prostitution flourishing on a gargantuan scale, 
white slave traffic amongst the fastest growing crimes, abduction and seduction as daily occurrences, criminal assaults upon children, greatly increased, abortions more frequent than at any period, and as lightly looked upon as is the extraction of a tooth, sexual relationships among students of colleges and schools, epidemics of venereal diseases in high schools, widespread indulgence in perverse sex practices by old and young, even the very young, sex plays on stage and screen attracting largest audiences, sex novels finding the best market, sophistical sex teachings disseminated without restriction, their popularity resulting from the fact that they provide excuses for personal weaknesses, and such a prevalence of male and female troubles that it would seem that civilization inevitably spells civilization. Mere animalistic sex expression has no more place in worthwhile civilization than would mud huts serve as modern houses. But in our pseudo-civilization worse than animalistic sex misuses are indulged in and condoned. There can be no question of real civilization until a relentless campaign against the domination of sex is well on its way. A lessening of the overwhelming influence of sex is necessary before the race can claim a semblance of true culture and of becoming spiritualized. It is just because spirituality has been practically discarded that sensuality has become paramount, for there is a close relation in inverse ratio, between the two, only where the one is absent can the other rule. Hence the great need of consciously and conscientiously approaching a spiritualizing ideal. In themselves ideals, testify to a high level of civilization, particularly when they help to bring the spiritual nature to the fore, the animal nature to the background of human consciousness. Therefore human nature, must be modified according to a definite ideal. And the needed ideal must in the first place diminish the overpowering fascination of sex. Because it is not possible to develop, civilization unless we can inhibit primitive passions, there is as yet no civilized society. Above all other responsibilities, the task of humanity is to build up a genuine civilization, a corpus spirituale of mankind, a civilization in which a purified love, disentangled from all sexual accretions, will come into its own. For Evolution Evolution of The Triumph of Human Qualities Over Animal Qualities Kropotkin Ethics X 254 Whether or not the materialistic theories about it are in every way correct, evolution is a fundamental element in life. It is a change forward and upward, and advancing from the imperfect to the perfect. Many however mistake the growth of our civilization for evolutionary progress, and think of these two processes as being synonymous. But they are neither equivalent nor always parallel. Evolution brings with it a proportionate degree of true civilization. But civilization as we know it is not in every respect the outcome of evolution. Our civilization is largely the result of an exclusive development of mind, of a one-sided attention to matter, and to material life at the cost of spiritual development. High mental efficiency is only then a characteristic of harmonious evolution, when it concurs with commensurate spiritual unfoldment. Evolution will then not only make man scientific, but, by letting his unfolding faculties find expression through a spiritualized mind, it will make him approach omniscience. Overdeveloped brain power however, applied exclusively to material science, is as little a natural concomitant of or an aid to all-round evolutionary growth as our overdeveloped muscles. Therefore most of the remarkable intellects of this day, and most of the modern inventors with their astounding accomplishments cannot be considered to be products of normal evolution. They are more like hothouse products of an abnormal civilization. They are the outcome of a forced and artificial growth of lopsided qualities, carried on through many generations. They are in the human kingdom what exceptionally trained animals are in the subhuman. They are no samples of evolutionary growth toward the superhuman. Civilization as it is distinctly constitutes a hindrance to spiritual unfoldment. In its concentration on materialistic and mental achievements it neglects and suppresses the inner development of man. It antagonizes the higher expression of the life force which evolution seeks to bring about. It is for this reason that our present civilization is on its way to follow the fate of most preceding civilizations. They reached a high state of mental development and of material well-being. Then, when their materialism together with its attendant lack of morality nullified their value in the evolutionary scheme by antagonizing the unfoldment of the spiritual element, they were inexorably destroyed. 
total destruction of our own civilization can be prevented only if cognizance is taken of the spiritual demands of evolution. Evolution is nature's process of allowing the latent qualities of the life force to come gradually into perfect manifestation. For this purpose she constructs ever more suitable, more responsive, more delicate living instruments, through which to express always more of her own innermost being, more of that unfathomable element which we call spirit. In the simplest physical forms of the mineral kingdom nature can only manifest what seems to us unconscious existence. In the plants, which rise above the minerals, out of and above the ground, the life force stirs and shows a consciousness of sentient living. In the animals, which might be called uprooted plants, growing by motion and by emotion above the animal kingdom, life expresses itself in instinctive consciousness. In present humanity, grown mentally above the animals, life's energy displays itself in a conscious realization of self-consciousness. Could this rudimental humanity as it now is be the climax of the evolutionary scheme? Of course not. Man as we know him is by no means the highest creature that will be evolved. There is not the slightest reason for supposing that the powers, which we human beings happen to possess, are the highest of which this planet is capable. Progress is the law of life, man is not man as yet. The process of progress must continue until nature can perfectly reveal its highest powers in a perfected instrument. A superhumanity must be developed which realizes an untrammeled expression of spiritual consciousness. At the primitive human stage there came a change in the evolutionary method. Prehuman progress was involuntary. But human progress can be willed, nay, it must be willed. So far growth had been regular and automatic unopposed. It might have continued thus if man, that is, the human species, had not used self-consciousness to foster self-indulgence and sensuality. He thereby set up an impediment which he himself must again undo by self-chosen, willing effort. Instead of continuing mechanically from without, growth has become an accomplishment that must be aided from within. Further evolution will result solely from conscious efforts towards growth. It can be achieved only through persistent self-exertion. Henceforth man, not striving toward evolution, not helping it, will not evolve. And the individual who is not evolving, goes down degenerates, this is the general law. The choice is man's. Will he successfully progress toward the succeeding stage of fully spiritualized humanity, and finally to that of divinized superhumanity, then he must with self-determination overcome the obstacles to growth. Divinity is in us, animality hampers and constricts it, stunting our growth. Especially sexual activity weakens man in his most essential, his spiritual expression. If the race is to progress, it must somehow become less sexual, for even the potentiality of a higher spiritual life is endangered by fleshly lust. Human evolution cannot proceed unless man sets himself to the task of overcoming the passions which obstruct his spiritual unfoldment. He who shall attain to perfection must be one who has courage to be absolutely chaste. V. The Deadlock in Human Evolution The strength of the sexual appetite is unquestionably the great obstacle to the improvement of the race. Newton The Better Way 15 Human evolution has been at a standstill for many thousands of years. As far as we can look back into history and compare ourselves with the human elements of ancient civilizations, no evolutionary progress is noticeable. Our bodies have, if anything, deteriorated. Human qualities have not improved. Character, emotions and motives for action have remained very much the same. Our materials for knowledge have increased, but not our intellectual capacity. The intellectual power of our brainiest contemporaries does not surpass that of a Homer or a Hermes, or of purported Atlantean Illuminati. Of anything beyond intellect there still occurs only sporadically no more than an almost negligible indication. Since we can trace no noticeable advance in human evolution within a measurable period, it may well be presumed that at some time in the past, a seemingly insurmountable obstacle has been erected, which has checked our evolution. Some powerful factor must have prevented the life force from rising to new and higher outlets. Even a cursory survey of the progress of the expression of life energy in pre-human, as well as in human vehicles, will help to discover the nature and the cause of the obstruction in the path of our evolution. A fundamental difference between various stages of evolutionary growth lies in the ways in which the life force is being utilized. 
In all organisms from the simplest to the most complicated, the action of the life force is sustained by nutrition, which in a wider sense includes respiration. All functions other than nutrition instead of sustaining, consume some of the available life energy. In the smallest and simplest creatures, such as unicellular bacteria, life's energy is utilized in but a single way, in fast multiplication. A bacterium is all germ plasm, all reproductive material. Under favorable conditions hundreds of billions of specimens can descend from a single one in a 24-hour period. Out of the unicellular beings nature has gradually evolved the multicellular and complex creatures, in which groups of cells are differentiated for special purposes. In the jellyfish, for instance, parts of the body's surface have protruded and grown into grasping and feeling extensions. Other cells of the skin have become receptive to impressions of light, preparing what later becomes an eye. And so with other rudimental organs of the senses. Within the body an incipient muscular and a still diffuse nervous system have begun to take shape. Body growth, muscular exertion, and the nascent faculty of perception of the external world, require a goodly share of the life energy which in the lowest forms was monopolized by reproduction. At the stage of the jellyfish reproduction is still profuse, though not comparable with that of bacteria. Fast multiplication remains necessary wherever destructive factors cause a high rate of accidental deaths, but as a rule this need diminishes as evolution of the form proceeds, and new and higher faculties are being developed. At the more elaborately organized stage of the reptiles, the most striking functional change that by then stands out as having been accomplished, is the centralization of the nervous system. The spinal cord has been definitely established, and at the head end of the cord the cerebellum is ready to register impressions. Its functioning and that of the entire improved nervous system, required an additional amount of nervous energy. The new demand for this specialized form of the life force, which again had to be taken from what at earlier stages would have remained available for the reproductive system, necessarily caused reproduction to be slowed down. Ascending the scale of being to the mammals, we find the cerebrum or forebrain developed to a certain extent. As above stated, the reptiles had the cerebellum or hindbrain, but its activities are considered as not entering consciousness. Provided with a b it only slightly active cerebrum, the mammals become conscious of sense impressions, and therewith capable of more strongly sensed emotional responses to impressions from the outside. Again, with the introduction of these newer functions life energy is transferred from the reproductive organs to the brain, and reproduction is considerably diminished. Between the evolutionary stage of the highest developed animal and that of man there is a gap so far as scientific knowledge about it is concerned, an unfathomable dark cleft. It looks as though evolution at this point, quite against its customary gradual procedure, had taken a sudden and bold leap. Before following it in that hypothetical jump across the canyon of missing links a critical look back over the covered ground may well be taken. The point that stands out prominently is that originally the entire flow of life's energy was directed toward reproduction. Inherently from that time on, the reproductive principle has held a first claim on the life force. Every new function of the evolving organisms could be introduced only at the cost of reduced reproduction. The energy needed for each new evolutionary acquisition had to be diverted from the earlier established reproductive tendency, and to be transformed into other modes of expression. The life force had to be used more and more for inward instead of for outward purposes. All the way up through the animal kingdom this process was made easy by the absolute power of instinct, which unfailingly guides all animals in their every activity in harmony with the plan of evolution. The animal is bound to follow that guidance because it has no faculty, no power of its own, with which to oppose nature's will and purpose. Thus it was an easy matter for the evolving animal to yield more and more of its reproductive energy and activity to the needs of higher and higher evolutionary attainments. Now, the human stage. Mind, reason, intellect, conscious self-consciousness are the evolutionary characteristics of the human species. Thanks to a far better developed brain than possessed by any group in the animal kingdom, these new factors can function in man. The additional brain development has been made possible by nature by instituting a long period of childhood, followed by years of adolescence before maturity is fully reached. To make the most of the evolutionary advantages and possibilities, it is evident that in the first place youth, up to full maturity, should conserve all of life's energy for the development of body and of brain. But after maturity has been reached, the law of evolution does not cease to require more and more transmuted energy at every forward step. 
For the adult is truly as for youth, for the married is truly as for the unmarried. Further progress and evolution can only be attained at the cost of diminished sexual activity. In some of the higher animal species, this had already been reduced to as little as a single act in the season of rut, which in many cases occurs only once a year. For human beings, then, a still further reduction, a limitation to the few occasions when propagation is consciously willed, is requisite if evolution is to proceed. In the human body nature continues to be lavish with the production of seed, as a storage battery of life force. But more insistently than ever the evolutionary law demands that, except for limited generative use, the force be kept within the body for regenerative purposes. For mankind this has been always a most perplexing problem. Man is the first product of evolution to be capable of controlling evolutionary destiny. Endowed as he is with reasoning powers, he must independently decide upon his own behavior, without the compelling guidance by instinct. Supplied with mind, he is expected to cooperate consciously with nature in her further evolutionary program. Unfortunately, humanity has errantly failed to make a serious effort to promote its own further progress. Instead of using the power of the mind to understand the responsibilities which freedom from blind obedience to instinct entails, mankind has refused to listen whenever it was reminded of the requirements of the evolutionary law. It was so much easier to lend an ear to the promptings of desire, which was an unknown element up to the human stage. It must have been very soon after the acquisition of mental self-consciousness and his becoming aware of stirrings of primitive impulses, that man began to use the mind to stimulate the desires of the body. In this way he has indulged the almost negligible sexual impulse which he inherited from the animal kingdom, until it has become a desire so strong that he has difficulty to control it. Overstimulated by this unnaturally strong desire of his own making, man has looked for arbitrary ways in which to gratify it. Although reducing actual reproduction, he has discovered ways of unreproductive sexual action. But every such act, whatever form it takes, is a misuse of sex and uses up some of the life force that should be utilized for the support and the development of higher faculties. The record of our race progress clearly shows how our upward movement has been checked by that misuse. At the time when mankind became accustomed and addicted to sexual acts without reproductive purpose, at that very time it put a deadlock into the course of its evolution. Not until this deadlock is removed can humanity, individually and jointly, stride on toward the attainment of the greater faculties and powers which evolution has in store for man. By the Ideal the ideal man is, non-attached to his bodily sensations and lusts? Huxley ends and means I for. Amongst those who give this subject serious thought practically everyone today admits that our sexual life is far from perfect. But instead of attempting to perfect it by lifting it to the level of an ideal, the majority tries to lower that life to a cunningly intensified sensual gratification. The general tendency is to idolize its imperfections, even to worship at the shrines of its deformed images. And the only effort to counteract this degrading idolatry consists in an occasional ineffective mumbling by would-be moralists about so-called moderation. The genuine doctrine of moderation deals with the elements contributing to evolutionary growth. It teaches avoidance of lopsided development. It warns against extremes in physical training, in rigidity of asceticism and receptive sensitiveness and compassionate emotions, in intellectuality and philosophical abstraction and spiritual meditation, all of which are necessary factors that must be practiced, but that must be kept in balance with each other if harmonious evolution is to be attained. The world however has avidly grasped and misconstrued the doctrine of moderation in evolutionary elements, and applied it to its own anti-evolutionary tendencies to self-gratification. The ideal doctrine has been degraded into an excuse for personal habits and weaknesses, every individual proclaiming that his particular standard of pandering to these can serve as a model of moderation. Not moderation, but elimination is the ideal in regard to evolution-retarding habits. In a sanitarium for dope addicts, it may be advisable to allow patients temporarily a restricted, but at the same time gradually diminishing, use of narcotics. Similarly it may be advisable to condone that sex addicts, that is to say, all those who have habituated themselves to sexual acts, do not suddenly break their habit, provided they will gradually overcome it. 
but no sane person can opine that a continuous use of drugs should be prescribed for the dope-addicted patients, not even in a so-called moderate degree. Still less that it should also be recommended for those who are free from the addiction. As little reasonable is it to claim that quasi-moderate sexual activity must continually be indulged in by those who are addicted to such acts, and that also it should be recommended for all who are not so addicted. Once realizing that the sexual life of humanity is far from faultless, it becomes imperative to look impersonally and unbiased for a way out of its unsound condition. Evidently two pathways lie ahead, one leading up out of entanglement, the other down and deeper into it. Man must either climb toward the radiant, though seemingly lonesome summit, or slide into the tempting shadows of the crowded lower path. The one path is the way of self-control, of mastery over sex, leading to purity and progress, the other is the road of self-indulgence, of enslavery to sex, of passion and resultant retrogression. One must either recognize that sexual intercourse is not essential to individual well-being, and encourage continence, or acknowledge the regular necessity of such intercourse for all who are physically mature, and frankly sanction licentiousness. Sexual acts must either be limited to propagation, or perversion must be condoned. There must be either a sane and sanitary living, or there will be a wider spreading of venereal disease. If there is no purification, there is bound to be putrefaction. On the one path there is ethical refinement, clarification of the mind, and general regeneration, on the other, moral decay, mental retardation and all-round degeneration. Either a transmutation of the sex force will bring spiritual expansion, or continued transgression of natural law will dull the already acquired, and limit all chance of developing higher faculties. Man must either consciously help evolution, and make every effort to ascend to the superhuman state, or he will stubbornly counteract and undo the work of evolution, and thereby descend below the grade of the subhuman state. Every human being has the choice between those two paths. Every individual must belong either to the side which is in favor of purity, or to the fraction which practices and advocates sensuality. Which of the two will lead to a more desirable, more worthy, more ideal humanity? Which must we choose and follow? A voice from within in each case definitely and clearly gives the answer, and all that is left for moral philosophy to do is to give it the form of a universal rational principle. Such a principle is contained in the following formula, for advanced evolutionary growth passion must be conquered, and the generative organs be used for generation only. In other words, all the sex force not actually used for the perpetuation of the species must by transmutation be made available for higher evolutionary attainment. The sexual life to which the application of this formula leads is a spiritualized and impersonal one, a life in which the personality's actions are ruled by spiritual motives, and in which the selfish longings of the body, of the senses or of the mind cannot be allowed to play any part. As an ideal this applies to all. Albeit not within immediate reach of every individual, as a final destination it is the same for all. It is an ideal that is set to us as a task, we must strive toward it, even if its realization is beyond our power. For a majority it may be so far away that it seems unattainable indeed. But a close approach to its attainment is possible for quite a number. In individual cases it has been successfully approached, always concurring with commensurate spiritual growth. Amongst those who have fully realized this ideal in the past, are some who have left imperishable impressions of spiritual greatness on human history. They the wisest teachers that ever trod the earth, stand out as exemplars of what mankind can be, and of what it is destined to be when it grows spiritually mature. In the process of that growth all humanity must gradually conquer passion, must gradually diminish the abuse of sex. Eventually the ideal of purity must be seen and recognized, and ultimately reached by all, if the race is to rise from its wearisome condition of the human animal, to the felicitous spiritual human state. Every individual must face the basic facts. Understanding these, one must choose the ideal as a goal, and the will must consciously be applied to approximate that goal as rapidly as possible. A beginning must be made by everyone some time. To deny this is to deny oneself the chance for evolutionary progression. Once one's aspirations are concentrated upon the ideal, its distant glimmering becomes more and more distinct and more irresistibly attractive. Approaching it from wherever one may stand, every conscious step in its direction edifies, until consummate attainment well nigh deifies. All this may seem to many too idealistic. But ideals of today are realities of the future. 
Undeniably, the ideal is remote, but he who will not attain it will fare well for having striven after it. Part 2 Substantiating the Ideal This is supported by testimony from so many independent sources that it cannot be dismissed lightly. Lippmann preface to Morals 3 9 156 or 136 Men as you are today, half men half beasts, are you so satisfied with your bastard and imperfect humanity, with your animality scarcely held in leash? Papini, Life of Christ, 123 7 Considerations There are certainly a number of highly rational arguments against passion, forced or marriage and the sex problem, 29208. Not being a textbook, this work does not attempt to be either complete or systematic. It is more in the nature of a test book, one in which the genuineness of the proffered ideal concerning the importance of conservation of reproductive energy is being tested on the touchstone of widely diversified subjects. Science and metaphysics, sociology and ethics, and philosophical and religious systems of all times are lightly touched upon, at a single point, for the purpose of substantiating the ideal and of proving its intrinsic value. In almost every direction evidence can be found in corroboration of the ideal of purity. A perusal of the following fourscore chapters will reveal how widespread and how well supported is the view that the evolutionary development of body, of intellect of every cultural attainment, of spirituality and of hidden powers, largely depends upon the conservation and transformation of sexual energy. Where each chapter deals with a single subject, each presents but a single argument or suggests only a single consideration. Therefore one chapter by itself may or may not prove strikingly convincing. But each in some way serves to strengthen all the others, each chapter contains a contribution to the central theme of the book. All statements made or quoted cannot be equally strong, and they are not expected to be always generally accepted. More likely than not even the most conclusive remarks would be rejected anyhow by the multitude, which clings to its addiction to sensuous gratification. Evidently least of all can I hope for approbation from those who are, under the power of passion. For he that lives at the dictates of passion will not hear nor understand the reasoning of one who tries to dissuade him. Passion seems not to be amenable to reason. It is still true that this lower principle in man would not listen to reason, and would never naturally care for any arguments. After all each man can only prize that which to a certain extent is analogous to him, and for which he has at least a slight inclination. Therefore the thoughts expressed in these pages are intended mainly for those who have become already somewhat receptive to spiritual principles. Even to those perhaps not all the arguments presented in favor of the ideal will appeal. But if by logic or by intuitive reaction, they find that the cumulative evidence of be it only half a dozen chapters seems convincing, then that should suffice to plant the seed of the ideal in their consciousness. Nearly everyone who is willing to face the evidence frankly, and squarely will have to acknowledge that the ideal is based on a deep, solid stratum of universal truth. And once this recognition is rooted, a little regular attention will make it grow and bloom, and bear the refreshing and rejuvenating fruit, which brings a taste of spiritual realization. Eight Spirit versus Matter The law of spirit is to go up, the law of matter is to go down. San Martin Overs Postums 1,31a In their final essence spirit and matter are only opposite poles of the same universal substance. As the primary expression of nature's law of polarity, without which the universe could not exist, they are states of one unity, divided only in our conception of the modes of its manifestation. On this point the deepest philosophies, the highest occult teachings, the broadest religious viewpoints, and the farthest reaching scientific searchings seem to lead to very similar conclusions. They have come to look upon spirit and matter as being basically one single element, which from one form of expression, can be transmuted into another, by changing its rate of vibration. Regarded concretely, spiritual and material being are two kinds of energy which can be transformed into each other, just as mechanical motion can be transformed into heat and vice versa. If looked upon in the same analytical way, steam and ice are basically one and the same thing, but in everyday talk and for practical purposes, they remain definitely distinguishable, and as good as opposites. Their relative opposition and yet basic unity, may be indicated by calling ice, the lowest form of that of which steam is a higher manifestation. 
and so may matter be called the lowest form of that of which spirit is the highest expression. Only the exceptional mind can occasionally contemplate and still more rarely entirely grasp the ultimate reality of oneness. For a perfect understanding of the state of unity we first must escape from matter, which is but an inferior form of spirit, that is to say, we must escape from the crystallizing power that matter holds over us. For the average human intellect the standpoint of duality is the more logical, the only comprehensible. Therefore spirit and matter are for the present purposes dealt with as antithetical. Justification for considering matter low and spirit high can be found, mainly in a comparison of their rates of vibration, that of matter and its qualities is low and slow, while that of spirit and its attributes is high and fast beyond measure, beyond imagination. Wherever two of different rates of speed are linked together, as spirit and matter inextricably are, there is conflict, push and struggle, strife for supremacy. Thus spirit and matter are in constant conflict with each other, spirit always pushes onward and matter is holding back. But about the final outcome of their contest there cannot be a doubt, the quicker always ultimately wins, in the evolutionary arena as in the wrestling ring. In the end matter, which expresses the static power of solidification of separateness of selfishness and of sensuousness, is fated to be vanquished by spirit, whose dynamic power is that of expansion of unification of self-effacement and of sublime purity. In that victory of spirit over matter, matter is not destroyed but is made, an instrument of the activity of spirit. Matter will then no longer oppose, but support spirit, it will become spiritualized itself, and will manifest only that which is in accord with spirit, namely, absolute purity in every expression of life. Such purity is necessary if real spirituality is to be attained. Nine Embodied Spirit Man is a human being only if he conquers nature by spirit Kieserlino Book of Marriage In humanology the clashing cosmic elements of spirit and matter are represented by the human spirit, which is the emanation from the divine, and the body with its various desires and passions, which is of the nature of matter. And as cosmically matter is lower than spirit by reason of its lower rate of vibration, so the physical human body is lower than the indwelling spirit. Everything that increases the power of matter over man makes the body denser, lower in vibration and less fit to serve as an instrument for spirit. Even the body's finest organs high in the skull, become thereby less accessible to spirit. The attraction of matter is most powerful in the organs in the lower part of the trunk. Hence there are good reasons for designating the sexual tendency as belonging to man's lower nature. It is this lower nature with its animal qualities that must be conquered by the spirit within man, in order that he may become a truly human being. The binding of the lower is necessary in order that the higher may act. To give a clear definition of the spirit in man seems, alas, impossible. Mere words cannot correctly define it because since it is spirit, it can be comprehended only spiritually. As long as man is controlled by carnality, there is nothing in him that can touch or sense spirit, and therefore he cannot be conscious of it. Very few possess the needed faculty of spiritual comprehension. And few are they who are willing to take up the rigid training necessary for the acquisition of that faculty, probably just because for this purpose the lower faculties, require to be strictly governed by the higher. Those wise ones who had acquired the faculty of spiritual comprehension have stated in different ways, but always with absolute certainty that essentially we are spirit, that we are not a body which may or may not have a soul, but that we are a soul or individualized spirit, incidentally using a body, that the body is but an instrument existing for the use and sake of the soul, and not for itself. But to prove this to ourselves we have to discover the spirit in us by stripping off all that is extraneous to it, a strictly ethical discipline is insisted on, an absolute inward purity demanding self-mastery and self-renunciation, in the first place a renunciation of everything that increases the power of matter over spirit. If we wish to become spiritually developed we must, become rid of our sensuality and passions. As expressed in the language of a somewhat orthodox moral philosophy, which nonetheless is basically true, if the spirit is to increase in power, the flesh must be subdued. As long as the satisfaction of the appetites and lusts of the flesh is included in man's ideals and aims, he never can rise above the plane of animalism. Flesh here refers to man's material nature which violates the spirit, is opposed to and exclusive of it. And since the predominance of flesh over spirit expresses itself most strongly, in the carnal union, 
the first step towards giving supremacy to spirit is to master the sexual urge. It is the grossness of all the matter in which material man consists, which holds the soul in continual imperfection. Our body fills us with desires and passions and vain imaginings and a host of frivolities. But once having got rid of the foolishness of the body, we shall be pure and know the clear light of truth. Who then would not strive to wean himself by degrees from the domination and insolence of this flesh? However, to subdue the flesh does not mean that the body should be despised or stunted or neglected. The true attitude toward the body will be one neither of contempt nor of weak pandering to its impulses. The whole trend of evolution shows a tender care on nature's part in the building of better, finer, higher organized bodies, through which spirit can ever more fully express itself. We can help evolution, not by neglecting the body but by disciplining and purifying it, by bringing its vibrations up to a higher standard, by refining and subliming it, and so heightening its powers as to make it sensitive and responsive to all the manifestations of the spirit. The body is not to be put off, it is to be, made spiritual. And the living flesh itself becomes spiritualized in proportion to the inner growth of its bearer. Only by resolutely improving and perfecting it as an instrument for spirit can we, while living in a physical body, hope to know and consciously express the priceless faculties of spirit. X The Sex Principle Sex is a thing of bodies, not of souls. Hermes, excerpts by Stabaeus 26 44. It has been commonly imagined that sex is a primal fact rooted in the very constitution of life, if not indeed of the universe, but there is nothing of that fundamental character about the device of sexual reproduction. Strictly, sex is only that which physically distinguishes female from male. It is but one of the manifold manifestations of nature's unfathomable law of polarity. So also is electricity in its positive and negative poles, so is music in its polar opposites of major and minor, so are the contrasts of spirit and matter, of day and night, of repulsion and attraction. Innumerable are the expressions of polarity, of which sex is but one instance. To reverse the statement and to say that all polarity is reducible to sex, is the specious reasoning of a race mentality so pervaded with thoughts of sex, that it seeks to sexualize everything. Thus the idea of sex often has been connected with the most abstract concepts, including deity. Unfortunately some of the deepest metaphysical dissertations have used the words male and female in reference to positive and negative forces in nature, and to other polar opposites far above the physical plane. This may have been done in order to make the difficult abstract ideas more readily understood by the average mind, but with it all it has contributed to the widespread misunderstanding that sex implies more than a physical differentiation. But apart from that material distinction, nature knows no more of a male and a female principle than of a vertebrate and invertebrate principle. Whatever seemingly important place one may be inclined to assign to sex and individual physical existence, from a higher standpoint one can see in it no more than a mere temporary expression on the physical plane of the pairs of opposites, merely an adventitious adaptation. Spiritually considered we are not men or women, we are spirit using, and using only temporarily, a male or a female body. It cannot be too emphatically reiterated that the sex function exists only on the physical plane, and that it is only in the body that sex exists. There is no sex in mind. Also souls have no sex. Still less can there be any question of sex in the spirit. From which it follows that as one grows in spirituality sex loses its importance. Abundant as may be the neo-psychological and the erotically romantic and poetical attempts to put sex and its function on a hallowed pedestal, only a sense-dimmed vision can lead to the belief that this is where it rightfully belongs. Sex being only a characteristic of the physical body, every sexual gratification sustains the body in its resistance against a fuller manifestation of spirit. Before considering sex to be man's crowning glory and his most godlike possession, one may well take into account that every pig and every insect shares in the imaginary glory of that same possession, which does not in any way crown man as different from the lowest animal. The reproductive process is still an essentially animal function. True spirituality demands its utter extirpation. Man's truly godlike possession lies in the possibility of spiritual development, not in sex. On the contrary, the absolutely spiritual man is entirely disconnected from sex. Sexual reproduction has often been regarded as an expression of man's creative power. But reproduction is not creation. 
even the purest sexual act, even on those rare occasions when it is performed with propagative intention, is not creative. The male's part in the act is at best no more creative than the action of a husbandman who sows, depending entirely upon nature to produce a harvest. The seed is deposited in the womb, and another cause takes it, operates it, and molds a child. Moreover, the comparison of the male's role with that of a sower is still too flattering, and to say that the woman in her conception and generation is but the imitation of the earth, is not giving her sufficient recognition for hers. For she represents not only the earth, but the earth with the seed, the ovum, already in it. The male, far from exerting any creative power, is required to furnish only a fecundating element, which perchance it may become possible to provide without him. The spermatozoon can be replaced by a chemical or physiological agent. Only the female element is essential. No, not in sex lies man's creative power. What is usually spoken of as procreation is not in any way a manifestation of creative faculties of the procreators. No human being knows how to create the seed, nor how to make it grow into a living being. Procreation is a physical expression belonging to the animal part of man, whereas creation belongs to a higher, as yet practically unmanifested part in him. The only true creative function is that of, the faculty of formative thought. Creative power is that which consciously makes the subjective objective by exercise of intensely concentrated thought. It goes far beyond what is so often considered to be the creative power of artists, who even at their best are but extremely skillful artisans giving more or less perfect physical form to what they observe in visible objects, or to what in moments of inspiration may have been impressed on them. The real power of creation rests in the mind. And it can manifest only after the mind has been freed from any connection with sex, and has become indissolubly linked with spirit. Eleven Purpose of Sex The Real Purpose, Propagation of the Species Croft Ebbing, Psychopathic Sexualis Nature or whatever one may wish to call that force which manifests in the evolution of life and form, needs in her evolutionary work an almost endless series of generations, in order to lead up to the final, perfect form. Through innumerable generations of minerals of plants of animals of men, she is leading up to supermen and on beyond. In all her kingdoms nature has instituted methods of perpetuating the species, for the purpose that the perfection which one generation has not reached may be approached by the next. Of every method of reproduction self-evidently reproduction is the natural aim. Thus also, in creating the division of the sexes, nature has only one aim, the continuation of life. The physical use of physical organs of reproduction is by nature intended for physical propagation, and for that purpose only. Certainly those powers and instruments and appetites which are subservient to copulation were imparted to men not for the sake of voluptuousness, but for the perpetuation of the human race. Inasmuch as the object of the sexual function is the preservation of the species, the act of copulation should be performed only at such times and under such circumstances as subserve that object. Sexual action that is not propagative cannot be considered to be in harmony with nature's purposes. Every attempt to justify unreproductive sexual action can only be the result of a wish to whitewash the addiction of humanity to sexual abuse. It is irrational to ascribe to nature the intention that sex should be used for sense gratification, where that misuse is but an invention of the human mind. As well might be deduced from the existence of poppies and of all such plants from which man has seen fit to extract narcotics and intoxicating stimulants, that it is nature's intention to people the earth with dope addicts and drunks. Always to serve in the most effective way her fundamental plan, that is to forward evolution, Nature has evolved different propagative methods for successive evolutionary forms, from fission she has changed to budding, from this apparently to a hermaphroditic system, out of which she has developed the method which requires cooperation of two separated sexes. Man is born in the present way only as the consequence of the law of natural evolution. Each change was introduced when evolution could be promoted by a new method of reproduction. The still unanswered question is, why was unisexuality developed in preference to some other propagative system, and how was this particular method expected to aid evolution better than any other? While the physical aspect of sex is intended exclusively for propagation, a secondary purpose entirely apart from the physical must have been part of nature's plan when instituting the sexual method of reproduction, a purpose that would aim to advance human evolution in higher realms simultaneously with that in the physical. 
emotional and mental and spiritual evolution must proceed on parallel lines with that of the physical forms, and the evolving form enhances the possibility of higher emotional, higher mental and spiritual expression. All of these are at first much more stimulated by the interdependence of the two sexes than by the self-centered self-sufficiency of the preceding undifferentiated and asexual systems of reproduction. But the attainment of the secondary purpose does not depend on physical sex expression. It manifests in the psychological or superphysical relation of the sexes. The differentiation of the sexes has left each individual intact as a soul. Only, where in the one sex a positive principle has been emphasized while a negative was subdued, in the other a negative principle has been strengthened at the cost of a positive. As a result, the same as in magnetic poles, there is mutual attraction. And that attraction, which is not physical but psychological, serves to turn the attention away from self and from selfishness, it lays the foundation for loftier emotions, for a tender care of others, for sympathy and self-sacrifice, for compassion and self-effacement, and for pure love. And so sex fulfills its secondary purpose by aiding in the evolutionary task of leading humanity, in the direction of the goal of conscious spiritual unification. But not by physical union can this non-physical unification be attained. As soon as the lower organs are sexually active, there can be no question of any spiritual expression, except if it be in the form of a sacrificial dedication to the entity that may be born. Apart from this, sex and spirituality are diametrically opposed. Every attempt to give the unreproductive sexual act a quasi-sublime appearance is nothing but self-delusion, it may lead to emotional exuberance, but never to anything of a spiritual nature, never to soul unification. Far from enhancing higher faculties of the soul, each physical sexual act which lacks propagative consecration is a deterrent to those faculties. It cannot possibly promote love, but only lust, which sooner leads to separation than to unification. Instead of aiding, it frustrates spiritual evolution, for every such act draws one down into the world of sense-bound matter from which one should be freed. Therefore a limiting of sexual action to the normal object of the sexual appetite, reproduction will most effectually advance evolution. Twelve Instinct The sexual act in human beings is not instinctive. Russell Marriage and Morals Looking back over the path of evolution we see the mineral kingdom still asleep in nature's womb, the earth, the vegetable kingdom still connected with its mother, directly fed through roots, then the helpless animal kingdom as nature's toddling little child over which she closely watches, holding it tightly by the hand. By this close, protecting contact nature's own intelligence unerringly guides the animal, in which it manifests as instinct. Instinct is given to the animals since they have no understanding. In everything they automatically follow their instinct, and in doing so they act as nobly, as their position in nature permits. The sexual body urge in itself is not instinct. Instinct is the power which in the animals controls that urge, just as it controls their selection of the right food, and their building of a nest, a hive, a web. Instinct unfailingly directs and restricts their sexuality, which it allows to come into expression, only in the season of rut, purely for the perpetuation of the species. This is the rule, unless through association with mankind the animal has become abnormal in this respect, in which case the power of instinct is interfered with. From her older child, from humanity, nature has withdrawn her guiding hand. Instead of instinct she has implanted in man mind, which is an individualized part of her own intelligence, so that in him reason has completely supplanted instinct in the government of conduct. There exists no instance in normal man of a determinate pure instinct not even in the savage. Only the cells and cell groups within the body are still directed by instinct to perform such processes as digestion and the restoration of damaged tissue. But all acts of the individual have come entirely under the control of human volition. For the direction of human conduct by man himself nature has developed in him a brain through which the mind can find expression. Instinctive life does not need the brain. Hence below the human stage instinct could be manifest already before the brain began to be formed, and as long as the brain was not sufficiently developed to serve as an instrument for the mind, instinct remained the regulator of conduct. But since individual mind has become active, instinct has become superfluous. Therefore anatomically, as the brain developed, the centers for the older instinctive activities were covered over. 
physiologists of high repute agree that with the growth of the brain, the place of instinct, was taken by intelligent educability, and soon intellectual powers, had the effect of superseding those of instinct. Surely then, man's overstrong sexual urge cannot be excused by ascribing it to instinct, to an influence from which he has been cut off in the dim past. No instinct is either urging or restraining him. The cause lies entirely in himself, in his abuse of mind. Part of mind's mission was to take over nature's task of judicious direction and restriction of the sexual urge. But instead of using his reasoning power for this purpose, man, becoming conscious of self-seeking, sense-serving, sex-stirring possibilities, applied his mentality to the distortion of the sexual life. In the exercise of reason presumably rational intelligent man descends below the level of the beasts, because he puts his intellect at the service of bestiality. He calls it reason, but pollutes its use by being beastlier than any brutes. It is believed that, the pairing of our earliest human or half-human ancestors, was restricted to a certain season of the year, and that abstinence was the rule at other times. But, the sexual impulse became perverted through lust. In order to multiply the moments of body pleasure man, acquired the faculty of repeating genetic acts during any season. This has been detrimental in several ways. For one thing it was, at the cost of the length of his life. The most serious effect has been that he is manifesting a degenerative tendency instead of taking an upward step on the evolutionary scale. By his chronic animalism man sinks lower than an animal because he lives in a state of disorder, which does not exist among animals. Where animals are only sexual, man has become sensual by degrading the reproductive sexual urge into a desire for unreproductive sensual satisfaction. Sensuality is man-made. By overexciting the reproductive faculty for millions of years man, has only himself to blame for the impelling power of the sexual impulse. And only he himself can reduce that power, and bring it back within the boundaries of its legitimate domain, that of the perpetuation of the race. Thirteen Desire The slave of desire is quickly the victim of lust. Riley, Bible of Bible 7209 In its widest meaning the word desire may be used to express a longing for the attainment of any form of satisfaction, be it physical, emotional, intellectual or spiritual, a longing for anything that can be expected to provide passing pleasure or lasting joy. But in practical application the use of the word more often than not has been limited to signify a passional emotion for sense gratification, and here it will be so used. Even in this restricted meaning desire does not exist below the human stage. Animals are equipped with appetites. In their natural state they are guided by nature's intelligence, that is, by instinct, to satisfy those appetites for preservation of self and of species. They serve nature's need in a natural attraction to food or mate, without being driven by desire. Only in man, endowed with mind and with self-consciousness, desire comes into being for desire is appetite with consciousness thereof. Instead of being wisely led by instinct man is misled by unwise use of mind and driven by desire. At the evolutionary stage of average present humanity mind is used in separative, selfish ways and is largely confined to matter, and thus desire, produced by matter-bound and matter-blinded mind, seeks separative, selfish and material satisfaction. And man not only, satisfies the desires of the moment, but refines upon them and stimulates them, by a continual misapplication of memory and anticipation, these two great powers of the mind. Hence it is that desire is insatiable, and is always in want, and that merely natural impulses make more and more demands the more concessions one makes to them. With it all, no attained object of desire can give lasting satisfaction, it can produce merely a fleeting gratification which only feeds and fosters the desire and makes it grope for forms of self-indulgence which grow ever more noxious. In most cases the desire lasts long, the demands are infinite, the satisfaction is short. And besides, the satisfied passion leads oftener to unhappiness than to happiness, so that so long as we are given up to the throng of desires, we can never have lasting happiness nor peace. Therefore, to do what the ultramodernists seem to propound, namely to make desire a final authority, is to invite chaos in the inner life, whereas to diminish our desires is the same as to augment our powers. Undoubtedly the lower forms of desire have their due place in the scheme of evolution. As long as humanity was in a young evolutionary stage, such desire was as useful as a teething ring is for a baby in the teething stage. 
But the baby does not need the ring after the teeth's cut through, although it may want to keep it as a toy. So does humanity not need the element of desire after the breaking through of a higher consciousness, although it may want to cling to its every desire as to a pleasure-producing toy. At the present time desire still may be the indispensable motive power for those backward ones who will not move or work without anticipating sense satiety as a reward. But that is not to say that it is still a necessary element for all, or that it must remain forever with those who are being helped by it now. Sooner or later one begins to see that desire for transitory things does not and cannot bring any permanent satisfaction, and also that so long as our desires are in conflict with the universal law we suffer pain, that not only all desire is accompanied by pain, but that desire itself is pain, and that there is no pain like passion, no deceit like sense. Then, turning away from the tyranny of selfish sense of desires, one finds an inner spiritual longing for more lasting things, an unselfish aspiration for conscious cooperation with nature's plans and laws, which supplies an even more effective motive power for action than desire. An intuitive knowledge of the reality of a higher form of human existence, and a longing to attain it, become manifest as one's unselfish efforts increase. This longing lies deep down within each one, not like desire fed by misdirected mind but wed to unerring wisdom. It is an essential part of us, yet it is not to many actually known because our animal desires have hidden from us our true life. This is the real misery of man, that he is self-obscured, lost in the midst of his own desires. Hence the idea that man ought to liberate himself from the bondage of earthly desires is the conclusion of a contemplative mind reflecting upon the short duration and emptiness of all bodily pleasures. To expel all eagerness of temporary desire, this is emancipation, and this is the free man's worship. It is but a repetition of the conviction of the greatest thinkers and of the mystics and the spiritual leaders of all ages that for every person who wishes to advance in evolution and to attain real happiness there comes a time when desires must starve, the animal passions must die. Nothing hinders us so much in the development and exercise of our inner powers as our external desires. Those powers are even by the slightest application of desire disturbed and hindered. Therefore all desire must eventually perish. But it need not perish by the painful process of being killed by force. By transmutation the lower desires will automatically shrink, dissolve and vanish. Suffering will then yield its place to constant exaltation, for freedom from desire is like the choicest extract from the choicest treasure. Divine influences will come to him who liberates his soul of all carnal desires. Fourteen. The Pleasure Principle The Pleasure Principle Sex today is slimed over with the thought of pleasure. Carpenter, Lutz coming of age, twenty-one. What a restless, pleasure-craving, pleasure-grasping crowd humanity has become. The chief good is supposed by the multitude to be pleasure. Pleasure is made life's purpose, pleasure its single aim. Not purely recreation but self-gratification, not merely amusement in the form of harmless diversion, but such as is detrimental to the individual and to the race. And closely connected with the pursuit of pleasure is the serious increase of sexual license, for the pleasures of the body are the ones we most often meet with, these have usurped the family title. Not joy is being sought, not happiness, not gladness, but sensuous stimulation and gratification, impairing physical and mental health, for who that is a slave to body, pleasure is not in an evil condition, both as to his body and his mind. Such pleasure exhausts one's powers, while joy increases them. Pleasure is usually followed by its opposite, grief, while it is a characteristic of real joy, that it never changes into an opposite, because joy is absolute, while pleasure is but relative. The mere sum of pleasures does not constitute happiness, more often people are unhappy, on account of pleasure. In grasping pleasure they may imagine that they are finding happiness, whereas they are finding only a frenzied and incomplete oblivion. For that is all that pleasure is, a matter of momentary oblivion, a chasing of shadows, an utmost self-delusion. In pleasure, there is something positively unreal and ungenuine. It is no part of real life. The pleasure principle prevails over the reality principle to the detriment of the whole organism. While imagining that they amuse themselves in the pursuit of pleasure, people frequently destroy if not themselves then at least their chances of perpetual joy. Well considered, pleasure is neither good nor useful. It melts away the moment it is grasped, leaving naught but dissatisfaction and emptiness. 
This void which we try to fill by the stimulus of sensations calls ever for more of the unsatisfying pleasure. Giving to the word pleasure a wider meaning than that of indulgence of the body, it becomes necessary to distinguish degrees of pleasure, supplying either physical or emotional or intellectual satisfaction. And when one gets higher than the intellect, one finds a state of joy in which all pleasures, even of the intellect become as nothing. Naturally, the pleasures derived from the higher faculties are preferable, to those of which the animal nature is susceptible. Pleasures of the mind are more considerable to one's happiness than pleasures of the body. Bodily pleasures rightly are called slavish, they are undoubtedly the lowest of all. Not any person who knows a relatively higher pleasure would ever want to surrender it for a lesser kind. Nobody would choose to retain the mind of a child throughout his life, even though he could continue to enjoy the pleasures of childhood to the utmost. Still less do they who have found true joy, of which there is within oneself an unconditioned and unlimited supply, long to go back to any form of pleasure, the nature of which is to gratify the personality by limited means, conditioned from without. They would not resign what they possess, for the most complete satisfaction of all desires. To make pleasure the aim of life is a sure way to deprive it of all true joy. The moment that reason gets the upper hand pleasure is discarded. This is why the true philosopher abstains from pleasures. He sees that pleasure is one of the chief things that beguile men from the higher path, because it increases and intensifies the personality, which tenaciously holds on to the material side of life, thus barricading itself against the spirit. If you seek pleasures, you are as far short of wisdom as you are short of joy for joy is an elation of the spirit, it can be attained only by the wise. Only when pleasures have been banished then, there comes upon us a boundless joy that is firm and unalterable. The trouble is that in the pursuit of pleasure most people have conscripted the concrete mind to serve on the side of the emotions and the senses, and this rebellious triumvirate triumphantly sweeps aside all higher-minded and spiritual considerations. Each of the three alone, the mind, the emotions or the senses, could be confuted and induced to join the elevating evolutionary forces, but united, the three in one obstreperously hold on to their contemptuous, tempestuous reign of gross material pleasure. They thrive impelling man to snatch at passing pleasure, thwarting his acquisition of lasting happiness. Within each human entity, near the high mountain top of one's own spiritual being, there is a spring of purest joy, compared with which all pleasure drawn from the outside world is tasteless, drab and disillusioning. Not without some exertion can that spring be reached. It lies high above the valley of polar opposites, to reach it one must rise above all opposites, hence also rise above sex. But even though their crops of relative pleasure inevitably are followed by inexterminable growths of pain, most people prefer to remain down in the valley, rather than to make the effort to climb to the source of absolute joy. The spiritual man feels spiritual joy which is superior to material pleasure, exceeding it a thousand times, he looks upon the lower satisfactions of life as stranglers of the real joys. When the elating joy from the inner source has been once tasted, mere pleasure will become not only uncraved for but simply and literally repulsive. Then all the childish pleasures of the world will fade away in the joy of spiritual life, and they who have cast away passion will reach the highest joy. Fifteen The Senses We are given over to the world of sense, we neglect the spiritual world. Roger Bacon, Opus Majus If we compare the organization of human nature with that of an army in the field, the physical senses represent the outposts which report their findings to the Central Intelligence Department. Successful progress depends upon the use made of the data received from the outposts. An army whose scouts are permitted to smuggle intoxicating and salacious supplies into headquarters and into the encampments is doomed to failure. So is human progress impossible when the senses are allowed to introduce questionable sensations into body and mind. In the course of evolution sense awareness, first came into expression in the plants, inciting the beginnings of a development of emotion. In the animals the emotions, stimulated by physical senses under the control of instinct, laid the foundation for a development of mind. In the same way, in order that evolution may progress, the mind in man should intelligently prepare the coming into expression of spirituality. For this purpose the mind should keep a strict control over the senses, and train them to a responsiveness to ever higher vibrations, never permitting them to disrupt the human intelligence, or to carry passion-stirring elements into the system. 
However, in most people the senses are not controlled by the mind, but on the contrary are allowed to dominate it. Thus the senses having mastered reason, have led man into pursuit of pleasure, and lust has become his second nature. Instead of being used to digest the observations of the senses for the benefit of spiritual growth, the mind of the majority is made to serve the senses, and to encourage these in a response to the coarsest vibrations. In this way mind and senses have combined to excite the passions of the body. Instead of serving as observation outposts for the guidance of spiritual evolution, the senses have been enlisted in the service of sensuous and sensual self-gratification. This can never be in harmony with evolution, because such gratification coarsens the individual instead of refining him, and the struggle to acquire for oneself the means of gratification strengthens separateness, and thereby opposes the spiritual oneness, at a realization of which evolution aims. Generally, the senses have usurped a place beyond their station, and dominated an organism which is made for higher activities. The majority not only have submitted to that domination by the senses, but have encouraged it by seeking satisfactions almost exclusively through sentient experience, and by depriving the inner man of all power, in order to use it for the outer man. The spiritual faculty is closed to most men by the incrustation of the senses. In almost every way the inclinations of sense are quite contrary to those of the spirit, if submitted to they blunt the susceptibility to all sublimer things. Under the sway of the senses the whole keyboard of the emotions may be played upon by sensuous stimuli. But especially in the domain of sex unwarranted power has been delegated to the physical senses. Their alertness to sex stimulating impressions has been encouraged and overdeveloped by ages of licentiousness. As a result of the habitual sharpening of the senses in this respect, the sexual system has become artificially and unduly responsive to tactile and olfactory, to auditory and visual impressions, and thus sexual excitement is furnished, from all sense organs of the body. Fundamentally it is not the senses that are to be blamed for the unnatural excitability of the libido. The fault lies with the way in which the senses have been used, and with the mental and emotional response to sentient impressions. Each of the physical senses should be trained and developed to the utmost in its own particular field, for the purpose of expanding one's awareness through conscious observation. But when the activities of one of the senses are used as a reminder, and as a stimulant of other sensations, and when they are turned into means of sensual gratification, then there is abuse of natural faculties, then the senses are developed to the exclusion, and at the cost of higher faculties, then evolution cannot proceed. Always to discriminate clearly between a natural and an unnatural use of the physical senses is a rather difficult problem, because the world of the senses as well as the world of the body is delusive except to him who has escaped from carnal lusts. Until this has been attained men's perceptions are warped by their passions. At least some degree of clear spiritual perception is essential to right discrimination. But human passion and misapplied physical senses are ever in the way of the development of spiritual perceptions. The eye of the man of sensuous perception is closed firmly to all that is transcendental. Until a glimpse has been caught of either a subjective or an objective transcendental world, it may remain difficult to believe that anything exists, except what is observable through the physical senses. Yet it is well enough known that the possibilities of observation through the physical senses are limited. Whether or not assisted by mechanical appliances, these senses make possible an awareness of various wide fields of the external world, fields differing from each other in their ranges of vibrations. But the sum total of all those fields that one can at best become aware of through all the senses together is far from covering the entire outside world. It is scientifically acknowledged that between and beyond the ranges of vibrations knowable by the senses there are wider ranges to which the physical sense organs cannot be made to respond. There is however no logical reason to reject the idea that man, without leaving the physical body, can develop other powers than those of the physical senses for the perception of what these senses cannot perceive. But only few have been able to affirm from experience that there is a spiritual power of seeing, hearing, feeling, smelling and tasting, a power of direct perception of which the vulgar have no conception, and of which even the learned usually do not know the existence. Few know by fully conscious experience that there are loftier beauties which in the sense-bound life we are not granted to know, to the vision of these we must mount, leaving sense to its own lower place. But only whoever gets out of subjection to the senses, can be a person of spiritual vision. And this may be brought about, through oblivion of the passions. Therefore the wise ones tarry not in pleasure grounds of senses. 
Indeed, never was there a wise man who had not to reject pleasures of the senses to acquire his wisdom. For only if the senses are restrained the intelligence increases. To be immune to the attractions of the senses is to invite into expression the spiritual powers, and the more the spirit increases in power the more it is detached from sensible objects. Then it finds that beyond all the physical sensations there is a bliss compared to which the pleasures of the senses are, like those of children's playthings. Then it knows the boundless joy that lies beyond the senses. But already long before this stage has been reached, it becomes clear that true happiness never comes to us through the avenue of the senses, and that even for the sake of simple happiness, the sense nature of man must be subordinated to the aims of the spirit. Man must lead a life above sense, rising till he touches the infinite region of spirit. Moral imperfections lessen the degree of inspiration. Maimonides, 8 Chapters on Ethics Although it may not seem a demonstrable fact, the limit of inspiration is the limit of receptivity, produced by the discipline of the lower nature. The more this is under control, the higher one's aspirations may become. An inspiration is but a negative reception of impressions in response to aspiration. Inspiration is not under the positive control of the will. It comes in flashes, be it through the mind or through one of the senses. It can only find its way where mind or sense is hypersensitive. Art being dependent more on the senses than on the mind, a high degree of sensitiveness of one or more of the senses is indispensable to an artist if he is to receive inspiration. In the course of harmonious evolution such a sensitiveness is acquired along with a proportionate development of all the other elements that constitute evolutionary progress. But in the artist the sense sensitiveness frequently is a manifestation of one-sided growth, such as the athlete, the scientist, the mystic, the philosopher and the yogi, often demonstrate along other single tracks of evolvement. With the sensitized senses as a means of contact with the beauty side of nature, the artistic temperament may sometimes open to inspirational perception of supernal beauty. What is thus caused by nature may be imitated by art, and the thrilled recipient tries to render it in lines or words, in physical sound or shape or color. The business of every form of art is but to mimic a corresponding form of nature. The earthly artist, tries to give us a hint of his glimpse of truth. Only those who have tried know how small a fraction of his vision he can under the most favorable circumstances contrive to represent. It is in the interim between flashes of inspiration that artists crave new sense impressions and a longing for new inspiration. Too often mistaking sensuous excitement for inspirational sensation, they seek an outlet for their craving in sensual gratification, which many of them virtually claim to be an essential aid to the expression of their artistic power. But if this power were increased by sexual activity, there certainly would be more genii. The very nature of inspiration is such that it can only come down from a high source, to which the aspiring one must reach up. Inspiration constitutes the highest purpose for which the senses can be used. Evidently then, true inspiration can never be found on the low level of sense gratification. What sometimes is found on this level, and is then mistaken for inspiration, is an emotional impetus similar to that which is occasionally instilled by alcohol or drugs. Not on account of such stimulation but notwithstanding its degrading quality, the resulting animation of the faculties may find expression in the production of things containing an element of beauty, if their maker happens to possess the necessary technique. But in such a case technique is often used to disguise in a beautiful form an expression of lower emotions, which subtly spread their pernicious influence over those who are attracted by the admirable appearance of the form. Sixteen Inspiration Technique without inspiration can never produce true art. Art can be real only when it is inspired by the muses, whose task must ever be to uplift mankind, by making it sensitive and receptive to the sublimity of superphysical divine beauty. Inspiration can manifest only in response to wholehearted aspiration, and in aspiration all material wants are forgotten. Sense gratification is the irreconcilable opponent of aspiration. Aspiration is stifled by the net of unspiritual desires. Wherever there is but a trace of bodily gratification, there can be no question of aspiration, hence no question of inspiration, nor of true art either. Occasionally great works of art have been inspired by pure spiritual love, when this was devoid of sensual attraction. 
Such were the outstanding historical cases which are so often erroneously quoted as instances of and as excuses for erotic romanticism in artists. Only pure love, free from eroticism, contains an uplifting power that can carry one toward the realm of heavenly beauty. Hence vaguely and crudely though it be, youth is so often inclined to be poetic and artistic in its period of just awakening unsoiled idealistic love, when the fast-waxing life force is by no thought or act diverted to the lower centers. But whenever in young or old the life force is involved in sexual expression, the channel for inspiration becomes clogged. The futile searching for inspiration in the wrong direction is the greatest blunder of artistic temperaments. Even though it may not always seem to interfere immediately with their artistic expression, this error is undoubtedly the foremost cause of the fits of melancholy, the moodiness and lack of balance of which so many artists suffer. And these disturbances within cannot fail to exert a deleterious influence on their art, which as a result in many cases shows a decadence after a short period of auspicious productivity. If artists could always aspire to inspiration in a truly supersensuous way, free from the lower attractions of the senses, it could be theirs almost continuously. But as long as we enjoy our senses, and do not know how to free ourselves from their thraldom, so long will it be impossible, to break through the barrier which separates us from a knowledge of things in themselves. And without that knowledge even a genius remains dependent upon infrequent and deceptive flashes of inspiration, which are possible only when he rises above his lower nature. To be sure, art in its highest manifestation is a path to cosmic consciousness. But such can never be the art of the sense-bound, nor of the would-be artists who fill the world with erotic literature, erratic statuary, exotic paintings and exciting jazz. True art can only be produced by one who keeps the channel for inspiration free from sensual obstructions, be it only in preparation for and during the execution of a special work. There are great artists who feel most fit for work when refraining entirely from sexual intercourse. Many a one knows the harm done by sexual intercourse on occasions of great strain, knows also that nothing contributes more thoroughly to the suppression of inspiration than sexual commerce. Therefore the masters of all the more intensely emotional arts have frequently cultivated a high degree of chastity, and men of great genius have apparently been completely continent throughout life. Whoever looks for inspiration should remember that the sublime vision comes to the pure in a chaste body. Seventeen Intellect and Intuition There is something inherently antagonistic between sex and intellect. Ingram Modern Attitude Mind is meant to help in the liberation of mankind from enthrallment to matter. But it cannot be of any help while so little of it, while on an average only a tenth of its full capacity is being used. Nor so long as the mind's instrument, the brain, and with it the rest of the body are unprepared and insufficiently purified to utilize even that little portion of the mind properly. The mind cannot fulfill its liberating mission, so long as people continue to make use of what little they have available of it in the diffused and untoward way in which most of them apply it. Like any other force mind can be used in multitudinous ways. When applied exclusively to material interests, only concrete lower mind can become manifest, this is a part of the mind which has become blinded by the density of matter, and intellect is its highest mode of expression. When applied to spiritual concerns another part of the mind, abstract mind begins to manifest and to open the way to intuition. In other words, one might say that materialistic intellectual man uses the mind, while intuitive spiritual man uses mind. Intuition, by the way, springs from the same source as instinct, both are expressions of nature's intelligence. In the form of physical instinct this unfailing intelligence is unconsciously and only partially partaken of by the mindless animal. But man having mind, must by positive effort make himself ready to share consciously in the entire cosmic intelligence, and to become nature's full-grown, willing co-worker. Through tuition through all-round exercise of his mind, and by gradually developing mind, he must learn how to acquire intuition, which might be called spiritual instinct. In this way he can re-establish the close harmonious link with nature's intelligence, which he lost when animal instinct was replaced by an as yet imperfectly developed mentality. When the mind first became manifest in man, it was drawn into the vortex of carnal life. The mind's elements of self-consciousness, memory and anticipation, were applied to the main interests of primitive animal man, to his body impulses. Man used his mind to excite these impulses constantly beyond their natural usefulness. 
Having continued this stimulation of the passions through the ages, the greater part of the race still clings to the habit of using the mind inordinately in that detrimental way. Thus in the course of time consciousness and memory have greatly strengthened the hold of sex on mankind and increased the tendency to give it an unduly prominent sway over conduct. The result is that humanity is oversexed and that the abuse of sex has grown excessive. To change this abnormality it is necessary first of all that by purification, man shall make his mind harmonious with mind. Most effectively the mind is purged by abstinence, by subduing passion the mind becomes clear. And in the degree in which a man's mind is nearer to freedom from all passion, in that degree also is it nearer to strength. Contrarywise those who yield themselves to lower desires drive mind away, and their appetites are only the more strengthened by the mind. Unfortunately nearly everyone clings desperately to the lower mind, seeking to overcapitalize on his intellect. But it is the higher, ever-capitalized mind that will eventually lead through intuition to nature's most secret chambers, where she shows her treasures only to the eye of spirit, the eye for which there is no veil in all her kingdoms. Under exceptionally favorable conditions intellectual reasoning may arrive at the door of the spiritual temple. Occasionally some mental genius has climbed the steps that lead up to the sanctuary's portals. If he worked in unselfish devotion on discoveries, inventions or measures by which to help the progress of the race, the spiritual element in this kind of intellectual occupation may have brought him on the very threshold of nature's storehouse of unlimited true knowledge. But in order to be able to cross this threshold, one must first realize that he who wants to enter into the sanctuary must die too, his animal impulses and desires. If the intellect is in the bonds of the flesh, it will be unable to penetrate into the divine mysteries of nature. Even without looking for spiritual attainments the normal growth of intellect itself depends upon a strict limitation of sexual expression. For in individual development as well as in the evolution of the race intellectual power is a manifestation of the life force. Whatever amount of this force is trifled away in sex is lost to the possibility of being transformed into intellectual energy. Of old it has been known that carnal pleasure is at war with intellect. And the latest scientific pronouncement still confirms that in order to reach its full power intellect seems to require repression of the sexual appetite. Therefore, to the attainment of a life according to intellect it is requisite to abstain from all venereal concerns. That at least a measure of sexual continence is the precondition of mental energy is beyond a doubt. For all who have to do intense mental work feel how continence increases their alertness and efficiency, especially if their continence is self-willed and freely chosen. For this reason many eminent thinkers seem to have been without sexual desire. They overcame it, realizing that the continent life gives the greatest intellectual strength. This is not to say that everybody who refrains from sexual acts can thereby become highly intellectual. Not everybody is born with the potential capacity out of which intellectual genius can be developed. Moreover, many who do not waste part of their life force in sexual activity, fritter it away in petty personal concerns, and in endless small talk. Decidedly in the life of every individual a certain asceticism, a grimly gay wholehearted renunciation is, one of the most favorable conditions to the highest intellectualism, that is to say, to the maximum of intellectuality that can possibly be attained in each individual case. Therefore, if the human race is to progress in an intellectual direction, it must become less sexual in its proclivities. To reach up to intuition one has to rise not only above the attractions of the senses, but above the limitations of the concrete mind. Thus alone can one acquire the faculty, through which direct and certain knowledge is attainable. The manifestation of that faculty varies with the nature of the vehicle, through the more finely differentiated fabric, it becomes a stream of spiritual intuition. But the fabric can be sufficiently refined only by those who are content to be continent. Eighteen Unfolding of Spirit So far as man becomes spiritual, so far he puts off the love of sex. Swedenborg Conjugal Love 48 The oldest records and legendary traditions of many nations prove that spiritual teachings have been given to the human race since times immemorial. They indicate that true progress in the individual and in society consists in a growing spiritualization and in the ever more complete mastery of spirit over matter. But few have paid any attention, and fewer have been willing to apply the rules for spiritual development contained in such teachings. 
The great majority has always refused to heed the requirements for spiritual unfoldment, with the result that the very meaning of spirituality remains little understood. Some materialists even deny that it can have any meaning, because they have never been able to see or sense, or in any way experience it. A way must be found, of establishing as a fact that there exists in man a spiritual nature which exalts him. But just as a bushman cannot grasp intellectuality as a concept, because he cannot know it through the senses, so most of modern civilized mankind seems stricken with spiritual blindness and deafness, because spirituality is not only beyond the power of sensual perception, but beyond that of intellectual comprehension. Yet in the words of some of the most advanced thinkers, including some of our own day, the spiritual life belongs to the permanent reality of the world. Not only that, but it is the central point of reality. The nature of all reality is spiritual. Everywhere, the ultimate reality in things is spiritual. Thus also man as he really is, is a spiritual being, hidden though the spiritual side of his nature may be. And whether he realizes it or not, man is essentially governed by spirit. Consequently he must give prominence to its claims, especially if he wants to evolve beyond the sordidness and the shallowness of the average present form of existence. The endeavor to advance in spirituality is the soul of the life of the individual, where there is no endeavor of this kind there is no true life. If the spiritual side of a man's nature be undeveloped, he is not truly full-grown. From an evolutionary viewpoint the goal of attainment is spirit in its completeness. For every human entity, the attainment of spiritual individuality constitutes a lofty goal, only to be compassed by self-reformation and self-discipline. But the animal nature impedes it from steadily progressing on the path of its evolution. In the end spirit's rule must become supreme. In the earliest stages of expression of life and form physical bodies had to be built. In the body sense awareness and emotions were then developed, and they governed the actions of the body. At a further stage intellect became manifest, and it now influences the emotions, unwisely yet, because intellect itself is still imperfect and unwise. Quite logically and naturally this stage must be followed by the unfolding of spirituality, which eventually will rule wisely over all physical and emotional and mental activities. It is only when the spiritual rules and directs that there can be permanent harmony. And the highest efficiency can be attained only when the sex nature is, kept under the control of the spiritual faculties. In each of us the four factors body, emotion, mind and spirit coexist, although they are not equally active. So far we have been largely limited to the lower aspects of the first three. United into one these three dense physical body, sensuous emotions and concrete mind, make up the personality with all its grasping, greedy tendencies, its self-interest and its personal, material wants. We have become foolishly convinced that the highest perfection of man is the development of the wants of the personality, and that happiness consists in gratifying those wants. But the most superficial analytic observation of modern civilization should prove to anyone the utter fallacy of this idea. The present generation's nerve-wrecking search for happiness proves to be unsuccessful because it is directed toward personal gratification instead of toward spiritual attainment. The widespread lack of happiness lies mainly in the neglect of the spiritual principle. Not only is there neglect but resentment and resistance. The personality opposes the advent of the impersonality of spirit, because it feels that under the sway of spirit its own selfish ways will be endangered. But before spirituality can even begin to manifest, the resistance of the personality must change into willing, longing aspiration. For the spiritualization of human life a longing rooted in the whole being is primarily necessary. Suitable conditions for spiritual life must be prepared. Spirit cannot find expression so long as the lower passions chain the higher aspirations to the rock of matter. Only as the soul is purified from all sensual affections, does it attain to liberty of spirit. Naturally the spiritual man must be stronger than his impulses, for true spirituality can be attained only when a pure life is led. Before one can attract the spiritual qualities, one must repulse the sexual tendencies. Can man rise to this spiritual level? On the possibility of his doing so rests all our hope of supplying any meaning and value to life. Not until the spiritual element finds expression in human nature is there a chance for the realization of an ideally harmonious and peaceful life on earth. Nineteen Marriage In the further ascent of man carnal marriage becomes a corrupt relic of immature conditions in the race. Harris the Wedding Guest 
It has long been thought that a permanent sexual partnership existed in many of the higher animal species. Later, more extensive and closer study seems to have shown that its occurrence is a great exception. But this scarcity of instances in the animal world does not disprove that monogamy is and remains an evolutionary institution belonging to the human stage. Man, having evolved beyond the animal, cannot take its ways of living as an exact model for his own. He has to raise the instinctive tendencies of the lower kingdom to a higher standard. To do this successfully he has to follow the fundamental lines of development which nature has laid down. In regard to mating the general trend has been that with a lengthening of the period of gestation and of helplessness of the progeny, there must be a union of male and female for the bringing up of the young, and this union must be of considerable duration. It is through this extended and devoted cooperation that sexual reproduction leads to the dawn of the love of mates and the evolution of parental emotions. For love develops an interdependence better than an independence. It is not the sexual communion that gives rise to affection and love, but the close cooperation and the community of interests. And this sharing of interests is to be raised from the material level to the mental, and then to the spiritual, until it loses all connection with sex. If nature has not on every side given the example of monogamy, yet the evolutionary development toward this relationship has been clearly indicated. If nature in its lower kingdom has not supplied many a perfected model of a permanent marriage relation, she has at least laid a solid foundation for it. On this natural basis humanity could have erected a beautiful structure of towering strength, designed with mounting lines of highest aspiration, constructed throughout of stone of flawless purity. But instead of adding to nature's, workman has discarded the natural foundation, and on more accessible but much lower ground, has built a flimsy structure for sexual convenience. Marriage as it is today is a corrupt institution. Compared with its ideal form, the actual marriage in its squalid perversity is as the wretched idol of the I savage to the reality which it is supposed to represent. It is only man's little clay image of the heavenly love, this cracked in the fire of daily life. Physical sense places it on a false basis. The perfect marriage utilizes to... sex and physical expression only for reproduction and serves in its secondary psychological effects as a means of arousing the higher emotions of reverence of and touch, compassion and self-sacrifice, leading to a spiritualization of affection. But the human imitation uses sex for sensual satisfaction. As These long as marriage not, contains a trace of this sensual case, element, it forms an impervious like obstacle oh, hey, to spiritual Max expansion. Landis, of Even though legalized by the state, sanctified American by the church, and acclaimed by popular standards, the licensed licentiousness of carnal marriage remains antagonistic to nature's purposes and to man's upwards. higher but development. The, surface, the mere going through well. a religious a rite or a legal formality articles, cannot and, and possibly change nature's physiological and spiritual laws. In Quite Max in harmony with the highest concepts of moral Despite philosophy, this, science refuses to admit However, that the ceremony of marriage nullifies or changes natural principles. Out of the Scientifically considered, there is no difference whatever between the married and the unmarried so far as the physical sex act and its consequences are concerned. Of course, even practical sociological considerations raise human reproduction and wedlock ethically and psychologically above that in unmarried relationship. But from whatever standpoint non-productive sexual intercourse in marriage may be sanctioned or condoned, it constitutes as much an infraction of natural law as out of wedlock. The sanction that has been invented is merely an ingenious defense of a desire. From nature's standpoint the same act cannot become good or bad, according as it is performed in or out of marriage. It is a strange delusion that marriage can make allowable and moral that which out of marriage is immoral. It is illogical and insincere and hypocritical to proclaim that what is unnecessary, condemnable and immoral before marriage should become moral, condonable and even necessary after the marriage ceremony. There is no worse prejudice than to believe that sensuality can be justified by the lawful bonds of marriage. If illicit intercourse is unnecessary to health, then licit intercourse is equally superfluous. There cannot be the slightest difference between the two kinds as far as necessity to health is concerned. Social or legal or religious contracts cannot affect the fact that sexual indulgence is not necessary to health. And always, under all circumstances, every purposeless or merely sensual communion is a waste of vital energy. Physiologically as well as morally lust is an abomination, whether it be in the state of wedlock or out of it. In regard to sex marriage in its existing form, is as incompatible as free love with the highest interpretations of the moral law, as well as of the physiological. 
The logical conclusion from the preceding remarks is not that marriage should be abolished, but that it should be elevated. Far from having outgrown the necessity of marriage, materialistic humanity has not even begun to understand what real marriage means. As long as the sexual method of reproduction lasts, a permanent partnership of one man with one woman is not to be substituted or supplemented by less durable, more exciting sexual attachments, but to be purified and evolved into a loftier union. Even if one holds that marriage is essentially the adjustment of the sexual tensions prevailing between the sexes, the fact remains that the adjustment may be accomplished in the manner of a purely spiritual completion. The true marriage is, beyond lower sex attraction. Continence in marriage is undoubtedly more difficult than in the unmarried state. Within the married relation, the sex desire is enormously stimulated because the opportunity for its satisfaction is unhindered. Moreover, the almost general approval given by a sense-bound thoughtless world to unreproductive intercourse in marriage tends to break down whatever scruples one or both of the wedded partners may have against it. It may require rare power of will, combined with high-mindedness and strong convictions, to resist entirely the desire for sexual gratification in the physical closeness of wedlock. Yet, strict continence in married life is not without illustrations of those who have voluntarily chosen it. There are couples who give up sexual relations absolutely, and are not any less happy, but often more happy on that account. In the ideal marriage the partners will unite in sexual congress, only in a longing for parenthood, conscious of the sacrificial nature of their act. No one can doubt that the bringing forth of a child is a sacrifice on the woman's part. That in its highest aspect the fructifying act is a sacrifice on the part of the male will gain recognition, when the value of the secretions of the sex glands and the currents of the life force in the body are better understood. Far from having to fear impairment of body or of nerves, those who seek the ideal may live a life of marital continence not only without injury but with positive benefit. Moreover, abstinence will but serve to strengthen mutual affection, whereas in most carnal marriages the affection gradually diminishes. The feeling of attachment becomes stronger and more constant when the conjugal relation is maintained habitually pure. In the recognition of this fact is to be found the secret of married happiness between wedded advanced and cultured individuals. For happiness in marriage depends for sure not on the animal functions, but on qualities of spirit. An unparalleled connubial happiness can only be realized when the great fact of the spiritual nature of the true marriage crystallizes into more clearness, when union is not sought in flesh, but in ideal companionship. After all, pure affection depends much more on ties of comradeship than on merely passionate elements. And really satisfactory comradeship is sexless. In the progress of marriage, with those who are spiritual the love of sex is exterminated, leaving the field free for the manifestation of true pure love. Twenty soulmates. All souls, not only pair of souls are one. Das, science of social organization. The soulmate theory propounds that somewhere in the universe each human soul has its supplementary counterpart, with which it was originally at one, and with which it must seek to be reunited. And this is usually interpreted as a reunion in the flesh. This theory is based apparently upon the hypothesis found in various ancient teachings that at one time there were no separate male and female bodies, but that each body was complete in itself, self-reproductive, containing equally active male and female elements, such as many plants still do possess. The theory suggests that nature, in creating separate sexes, suddenly split the hermaphroditic body into halves, at the same time splitting the indwelling soul into two separate units. Nature however is more likely to have worked slowly, to have changed the physical form gradually through endlessly succeeding generations, without in any way affecting the soul. In one series of changes, the female elements of the bodies were made paramount, leaving inactive rudiments of the male, in the other just the opposite procedure must have taken place. Proof of this evolutionary process can be seen in the vestigial organs in the bodies of each sex. Meantime in every individual case the indwelling soul remained just what it was, a complete being as before, now temporarily using a single sexed instead of a double sex body. This natural process does not present the slightest logical basis for the soulmate idea. Another source from which the soulmate theory may have sprung, is the little understood metaphysical concept known as the mystic marriage. Christian mystics have symbolically described this as the marriage to Christ, supreme love. 
philosophical mystics have spoken of it as their marriage to Sophia, supreme wisdom. Mohammedan mystics have written about it in the most glowing words as the union with the beloved, the spirit. In every case the language used in carrying out the simile has frequently been of such a nature as to mislead the reader who has no understanding of mystic lore, and to leave the impression that indeed a personal and sexual union with another soul was meant. But the mystic marriage does not refer to any personal union, not even of soul with soul. It personifies die impersonal and immaculate union of soul with spirit, with what may be called the divine counterpart of the soul. It depicts the reunion of the soul with that from which it came, and of which it is only an individualized part. The mystic marriage symbolizes the union of the soul with one's higher self, with the divine essence that dwells in each. As a result of this spiritual, inward union the perfect man with perfect love and with perfect wisdom is born. It is the union that every human being shall have to seek and bring about as evolution proceeds. But this union with spirit cannot take place so long as there remains a tendency toward sexual gratification. Sex has to be transcended before soul can know spirit. From whatever source it may have been taken, the soulmate theory confuses the idea of soul attraction with that of sex attraction, for it looks on the plane of the soul for a sexual mate. But the soul itself is sexless. All souls are of the selfsame nature, nor male, nor female are they. Souls do not propagate, therefore they need no reproductive faculty no sex. No wonder then that as a rule they are miserably deceived who look for a mate from on high. If they were willing to purify their sexual relation, they might find lasting soul companionship, which can be only sexless. But if the self-styled soulmates dwell on the sexual level they soon find not, but soulless sex communion. The theory of soulmates has not been demonstrated as workable in practice. Is there a single instance in which those who join because they thought themselves to be soulmates, have proven to be inseverably reunited halves of one unit? Their tie rarely survives the stage of sexual satiety, which never fails to come unless sex is surmounted. At best so-called soulmates are no better or no worse than any other mates. But too often soul mateship is only an excuse for those who want to change from one mate to another. However, Apart from doubtful soulmate theories a strong attraction may exist between soul and soul, between souls similarly attuned and equally high evolved. No greater boon can come to any soul than to be closely linked with another kindred one. But this can only take place when purity has been established to such an extent that the soul no longer yearns for the seductive pleasures of the senses. In a tie of soul with soul sex plays no part. Sex attraction must be overcome before soul can know soul. Sexuality and love are opposed principles. Luca Eros, too. Concupiscence has nothing in common with love. Popular opinion in its confusing way may declare them to be identical or inseparable, but they remain in essence mutually inimical. Love is spiritual and increases the dominion of spirit, sex is physical and emphasizes the power of matter at the cost of spirit. Love belongs to the soul, sex to the body. Love is eternal, sex is ephemeral. Love is selfless, sex is selfish, there is no selfishness so deep as the selfishness of sex indulgence. Love works for the interests of the other, sex for its own. Love radiates, sex vampirizes. Love in abundance refines and elevates, sex in abundance coarsens and degrades. Love by itself gives restful bliss, sex by itself gives restless cravings. Love speeds evolution, sex retards it. Basically earthly sex is opposed to spiritual love, and love, is antagonistic to those elements which press towards sexual union. In its true nature love can be known only when sex consciousness is absent. Love is the unifying principle in the universe. Where love exists there is a longing for unification for proximity, for sharing every expression of life on every plane of manifestation. Hence love between the sexes usually includes a longing to share parenthood, and as a means thereto, to share that most intimate relationship that can lead to parenthood. This relationship then comes about indirectly as a byproduct, not as a direct expression of love. Still, when this longing to share parenthood is either consciously or subconsciously present, sex communion might almost be called a love act. For in such a case the love element overwhelmingly exceeds the sex element, which is there only to serve its natural purpose. But even then as a rule sex disillusions love, so that for many a couple, with the rending of the bridal veil the illusion is destroyed. They soon discover that sex fulfillment is not love fulfillment. 
whenever the act is dissociated from its propagative purpose, it is entirely dissociated from love. Then it becomes an expression of merely physical attraction and gratification. Although momentarily uniting the bodies, it does not unify the souls, which is the unification that love looks for. Justification for the sexual act of two who love each other is often sought in calling it a reflection of the real oneness, but it remains as impossible to attain that oneness through its so-called reflection as it is to catch a bird by reaching out for its reflection in a pond. Evidently, an attraction that springs merely from sexual impulse cannot be love at all. Sex, seeking its own physical gratification, has not the slightest connection with love. Unreproductive sexual action is neither based on love, nor does it inspire love. Instead of leading to love, the animal attraction of one body for another ends in satiety and disgust, proof of which can be seen in numberless divorces, in short-lived so-called love affairs, and in the discordant relation of many married couples. Only rarely is true love strong enough to survive the demands of sex unscathed. Sooner than to promote love, lust readily passes into hate. Therefore love's arch foe is lust. Twenty one love versus sex. Sex desire, in order to make itself more acceptable, may disguise itself as love and call itself sex love. But the disguise cannot change its nature. Under all circumstances it remains true that the indulgence of the sexual appetite can by no means be regarded as an expression of love. It is only an expression of desire and love and desire are too unlike, mutually exclusive opposing conditions. Love is higher than sexual desire, and does not require sexual intimacy. The fullest fruition of love is without the loss of virginity. Only a slender thread connects sex and love. It consists of nature's secondary use of sexual reproduction as a means of laying the foundation for love. The whole strength of that thread lies in its element of reproduction, in joining two for the sake of the young. But as soon as the reproductive element is eliminated, the thread snaps. Then love and sex fall apart into their natural antagonism in which sex kills love. In uncountable cases love has been slain upon the sexual altar. Passion is the distortion of love. When one loves one rises above, passion. Just because of his love the courtly lover is pure. Those who truly love, will know that, sexual expression is, not so satisfying as spiritual affinity. The greater and purer their love, the less there remains of sex. Out of love and for the sake of love they renounce passion and sex. Thus love slays the liking of lechery, and brings into the soul true chastity. Chastity is a wealth that comes from abundance of love. In the course of evolution love must conquer sex. The serpent would devour the world, were it not vanquished by love, by that pure love which does not feed but defeats sex. When love comes into its own, it will automatically supersede sex. But the rehabilitation of love depends upon the recovery of man's spiritual significance. Not until man removes the greatest obstacle to his spiritual unfoldment, not until he frees himself from the overbearing power of sex, can love come into expression. Twenty-two Birth Control Sexual relations unfavorable to the rearing of offspring must tend towards degradation. Spencer, Principle of Ethic Repulsive to all of us is the custom of those ancient Pompeians who used emetics at their dinner parties. After eating all that the stomach would hold, they promptly emptied it in their vomitorium in order to be able to eat again. They did not eat for the natural purpose of preserving the body, but for the satisfaction of their unnatural appetite. They ate exclusively for the pleasurable sensation of tasting and swallowing food, for sense gratification. And they must have judged themselves extremely clever for having discovered how to circumvent the purpose for which nature has designed the digestive system. But today everybody looks back in disgust at that unwholesome and vulgar practice of the past. Yet, far more loathsome is the now widespread practice of contraception. By humiliating preparations which reduce the body to a mere instrument for sensual expression, or by other unethical methods, contraceptors seek to circumvent the purpose for which nature has designed the reproductive system. These nature thwarters want cohabitation, not for the natural purpose of race perpetuation, but for the satisfaction of their unnatural sex appetite for sensual gratification. 
So cunning and specious are the modern arguments which are advanced in support of contraception, and so strongly do they appeal to an already over-sensualized generation, that birth control has become a readily accepted custom of the day. But undoubtedly a more sensitized, world of the future will view contraceptives with the distaste now felt for the ancient resort of emetics. Because humanity is what it is, birth control has found countless propagandists and adherents. But just because humanity is no better than it is, its present standards cannot be accepted as the best and noblest. Just as a cry of all the world for war does not make war an ideal world condition, and just as a craving for narcotics in a growing number of people does not make their use an advisable habit for anyone, so does the popularity of contraceptives not justify their use. All that it proves is that there are many people who gladly welcome any means to evade a natural consequence of sexual indulgence. Whatever sociological and other purely materialistic contentions may be put forth to defend contraception, all its methods are and remain a sordid perversion of nature's designs and purposes. All methods that intentionally and artificially prevent the possibility of fructification are inherently unnatural and abnormal. All methods of producing the orgasm by contact of the sexes save the normal one are unphysiological, and therefore injurious. At the best they are tampering with nature and that is a dangerous thing in itself. Nature cannot be abused with impunity. She has her own unfailing way of upholding her precepts, and she is prompt to punish any infringement of her laws by those who are legally married as well as those who illicitly break them. Though she often seems to be satisfied with deferred payment, she exacts it finally in one coin or another. Never can any advantage be taken of nature by a trick. Under all circumstances, when no children are desired the exercise of the sexual function, is a detriment. When any kind of preventives of conception are used their uncertainty, their desperate matter-of-factness, and the probability that they are in one way or another dangerous or harmful, all these things are against them. There is no harmless way in which to prevent conception, at least not by artificial means. There is but one prescription which is both safe and sure namely, that the sexes shall remain apart. The best means to prevent conception is total sexual abstinence, and it is perfectly harmless. Every mode of prevention, other than that of living in chastity, is an evident violation of nature. The idealist insists that the proper method of birth control is self-control, and he condemns the use of contraceptives. Contraceptive practices are objected to by some authorities on the ground that they are liable to induce nervous or mental instability. Eminent neurologists and psychiatrists talk in terms of neuroses and psychoses as the result of the refusal of parenthood by those who yet practice sexual congress. When parenthood is wished for after using contraceptives for some time, there is often disappointment. This is because in the woman the use of contraceptives may have destroyed the capacity for motherhood, for it seems probable that sperm overloading is a cause of sterility. In fact, World-renowned authorities have posited sterility as an almost certain consequence of contraception. The gravest objection to the use of even the seemingly safest contraceptives is that they are psychologically unnatural. All the means that have been resorted to in order to prevent conception disturb the finer sensibilities of man and woman, especially of the woman, since here, as so often in matters of sex, the man's satisfaction is largely at the cost of the woman. The supreme objection to all methods of contraception is in the spiritual field. No one can practice any form of birth control without being injured spiritually. The very thought leading to the decision to reduce sexual congress to an act of unproductive self-gratification tends to paralyze every nascent spiritual faculty. Even if contraceptives were made absolutely reliable and not in the least injurious, their application would still remain not only an anti-natural, but also by its prevention of spiritual growth, an anti-evolutionary, hence in final effect an antisocial procedure. Twenty-three Eugenics To bring about a higher type of humanity, the individual must repress his strong animal impulses. Gruber die prostitution. Unquestionably, the procreation of children should be a matter far more carefully regulated by moral considerations than it is at present, for under conditions as they are the welfare of unborn populations of the earth, is continually being sacrificed to the sensualism of their progenitors. In order to remove the greatest obstacle to the improvement of the race, man must assume a more complete restraint over his reproductive functions and subordinate his inclinations to the future interests of his descendants. 
even where love links the parents, it rarely happens that in sexual relations much unselfish thought is bestowed upon unborn individuals. Yet a conscientious man and woman would not enter upon procreation without the most serious considerations as to the probable value of their progeny. To make the productive act ideally effective they will raise it to a deed of love for the unborn and gladly sacrifice their personal gratifications to the welfare of the child. Love between the parents is of course a factor of inestimable value to the progeny on account of the harmony which will influence conception, gestation and childhood. But eugenically considered, mutual love of the parents is not the greatest, not even an indispensable factor for the well-being of the baby. After all, procreation is carried on quite successfully by means of the ordinary organic functions, without any lofty ecstasy of personal love, and even artificial insemination, which entirely excludes the element of love of the parents for each other, has been demonstrated to be of practical eugenic value. The one imperative eugenic requirement is parental dedication to the child to be, even long before it is conceived. Most parents are ready for any sacrifice, any renunciation for the well-being of their child, once it is born. But for its greatest possible well-being potential parents, and that means all youth, must be willing to keep their bodies in such a condition that a faultless seed in a perfect soil shall be available for the prenatal growth. Almost as a rule however the male contribution to the seed has been weakened, and very often infected with inheritable disease, by abuse of the reproductive organs. And where in the past at least the soil, the mother's body, used to offer the fetus a fair chance, this factor too is more and more exposed to vitiation. Mankind seems to deteriorate deliberately into animalistic parents of an ever more wretched posterity. Any tampering with the sexual function before it is being used for the conception of a child endangers the purity of the seed and of the soil. Promiscuity is particularly fateful in this respect, because in the intimacy of the sexual act each of the partners leaves a permanent impression on the other. Traces of these impressions are carried to later partners, and eventually to descendants. Physical proof of this lies in the recognized fact that for a white woman, when stamped with the sexual vibrations of other races, to bring forth a white child, even in conjunction with a male of the white race, is impossible. Similarly the prospective father brings with him the commingled, usually polluting influences of every woman with whom he has sexually conjoined. And these influences affect not only the physical constitution, they are much farther reaching in their effect, for promiscuity and sex commerce adulterates the soul essences. Therefore unbroken virginity of both prospective parents until they come together for intended propagation is an essential eugenic requirement. Not less important for the progeny than sexual purity of the parents before intended reproductive action is the avoidance of ardent passion during coitus. For carnal passions are transmitted through conception and the fire of lust. The union of two bodies need not be spoiled by vulgar sensuality if a powerful affinity of souls imparts to it the ideal character of an appeal for their unborn child. A higher evolved ego can thus be attracted. Another notable eugenic requisite is absolute sexual abstinence during the period of gestation and of nursing. Undisturbed maternity is a vital and indisputable necessity for the improvement of humanity. If humanity would follow strictly the edicts of nature, coition would be absolutely omitted during the gestation period. The whole force at these times should be taken up with providing sustenance for the new body. If only for this reason, sexual intercourse should cease when the purpose of nature is fulfilled. But another reason for its cessation is that when exercised, it is very often found to be injurious to pregnant women. The venereal orgasm has the character of a violent nervous crisis, and in their condition, every nervous commotion has its danger. In normal individuals, it should be repugnant to the female during gestation. Where it is not, there is hereditarily perverted sexual physiology due to the unphysiological approaches of the male practice through the ages. Some obstetric writers have, granted a license which leads to more evil than good. For it is a more frequent cause of premature confinement than is commonly supposed. Also it is not unseldom a cause of miscarriage, and increases the pain and danger connected with childbirth. Therefore from an early period great authorities have declared themselves in opposition to the custom of practicing coitus during pregnancy. Even uncivilized nations have condemned the practice. And medical science is beginning to utter the same warning, and before long will probably be in a position to do so on a more solid and coherent evidence. 
an indication of scientific evidence has already come to light in favor of postponement of resumption of conjugal relations until after a baby has been weaned. It is contained in the discovery that prolactin, produced by glands in the mother's body for the purpose of stimulating milk secretion, at the same time inhibits the sex glands, thereby calling for abstinence from intercourse as long as feeding from the breast continues. It seems to show that parental behavior such as suckling and sex activity are antipathetic, by glandular decree. Foremost in eugenic interest remains the fact that sexual commerce during pregnancy and also during the lactation period is a violation of the rights of the unborn ego. Apart from physical considerations one of those rights is the opportunity to be born without such anti-evolutionary tendencies as can be forestalled by the parents. They have to consider that, such is the intimate connection between the mother and the embryo, that the exercise of any faculty, or of any organ of her body stimulates, the corresponding faculty or organ of the incipient child. On account of this impressionability of the embryo couples bring upon themselves by their sensuality the curse of sensual offspring. For one of the most certain effects of sexual indulgence during pregnancy is to develop abnormally the sexual impulses in the child. Here is the key to the origin of much of the sexual precocity and depravity which curse humanity and which stand in the way of evolutionary growth. Truly eugenic parents are those who limit sexual activity to intended reproduction. They are the direct benefactors of the race by begetting progeny who are not predisposed to vitiation. They prove that sexual continence is not only an ascetic but also an altruistic demand. It is by far the most essential precept for the evolutionary improvement of the race. Future generations will probably with a kind of horror look back at a period when the most important function which has fallen to the lot of man was entirely left to, caprice and lust. In the future, this will be carried on with a degree of conscious intelligence hitherto unknown, which will raise it from the following of a mere impulse to the completion of a splendid social purpose. An important part of the task of human parents is to enhance the spiritual life of the next generation by planting the seed of spirit in their own child. In order to be able to do this the parents-to-be must first unfold spirituality in themselves. Those who are imbued with a high degree of responsibility for the welfare of the race will not hesitate to apply its laws to their own lives now. Twenty-four Adolescents You just maturing youth. You male or female. Anticipate your own life, retract in time. Whitman Poem of Remembrance. Adolescence, the time of maturing youth, is that stormy period when the very worst and best impulses in the human soul struggle against each other for its possession. Every impulse that is allowed freedom of expression at this time leaves an indelible impression on the rest of life. During adolescence, the sexual element develops in the body and tries to press its claims. Overstimulated from within and from without and encouraged by popular casuistry, it clamors for satisfaction before it is matured. But if sex is yielded to prematurely, then to the same extent that this is done the individual will literally run to seed. Many an individual has had reason to regret the indulgences of his youth because of their effect upon his further life. Whenever allowed expression, early forms of indulgence interfere with normal growth of body, of emotions and of mind as well as with spiritual unfoldment. Growth in each of these directions is dependent upon the same force as is the sexual faculty. That life force, if expended in one channel, is lost for another. The longer its outlet towards sex is deferred, the greater is the refinement and breadth and strength of character resulting. Hence if the growth toward a perfected humanity is to be aided, a delay in entering actively on the sexual life must be one of the adaptations that has to go along with evolution. It is the only way to give the higher faculties a chance to come into expression at all. Therefore, the result of evolution has been to lengthen the period of development. The animal matures very quickly but only physically, and during its maturation nature takes care, through instinct, that no force is wasted in sexual channels. Savages develop physically and emotionally, by taboo the unspoiled tribes are restrained from premature sexual expression. Civilized individuals must pass through an additional mental development, and the period of adolescence is therefore necessarily prolonged. For young people sexual restraint is indispensable during a period of more and more years, if they are to mature well. The only way to an ever higher and fuller maturity is by self-restraint, 
by perfect sexual abstinence during an ever longer period of adolescence. In the average individual at the present time complete, maturity is reached by the woman after the 20th, and by the man not before the 25th year. As evolution advances and spiritual development is added to the mental, the period of adolescence and of needed absolute juvenile continence will be still more extended. The indisputable fact that strict continence is at no time more important than during adolescence has been recognized and stressed by every student of the subject. Yet the false rumor that sexual abstinence be injurious is exerting a most pernicious influence upon youth. In reality abstinence can in no way injure them whereas premature sexual acts mean shorten lives. Not that continence alone assures a long life, but, it is an evident contribution to longevity. In every individual case the maximum length of life attainable undoubtedly depends very much upon the preservation of the life force. The amount of this force available in one individual or another may vary greatly, each one seems limited to whatever quotum fate has put at his disposal. But a misdirected spending of one's energies will tend to shorten the physical existence and reduce the balance on which to draw for other essential and beneficial purposes. A point deserving special attention is that the sexual is in closest connection with the cerebral system. The immediate effect of sexual desire upon the brain is sometimes very marked. The nerves that supply the sexual centers are directly connected with the brain by means of the spinal canal. If those nerves become weakened the brain is at once affected to a corresponding degree. This is why the tampering with the sexual impulse tends to produce a lasting impression on the cerebral centers, and also why sexual indulgence is ruinous to mental health. The brain and the sexual organs are great rivals in using up bodily energy. When the reproductive organs make demands, they can be satisfied only at the expense of the brain. Therefore premature sexual activity impairs the educability of the child. Early sexual expression signs away the highest reaches of individual development, which otherwise could be attained. It produces mediocrity and conventionality of mind. The intellectual life of a whole nation must suffer if sexual activity is the rule among its young people. In a general way idealism is one of the most splendid characteristics of adolescent youth. Especially the joy, the cordial merriment, the sunny confidence of vigorous young people who have remained chaste are characteristic traits. Such youths are also the most gentle and sensitive, open to poetic inspiration, and to enthusiastic support of utopian movements. But as soon as youth yields to the sordidness of sexual expression for self-gratification, or to indulgence in erotic thoughts, the splendid enthusiasm disappears, often to make place for a cynical materialism. So much of the life force is then wasted on the sexual level that none can be transformed into the higher energy on which aspiration and idealism depend. Thus continence is connected with ideal aspirations no less than with physical vigor, and with mental clarity. Therefore the way to maintain a strong and pure idealism through life, is to adhere to continence. For many reasons then, the ideal of chastity is, the very highest that can be held up to youth. If it is the effort of their lives to be chaste, then indeed, shall abide for them an incorruptible felicity, then the cornerstone for a future utopia has been laid. Twenty-five Sex and Nutrition There is a direct contrast between the processes of conjugation and nutrition. Weissman, Essays upon Heredity A presumed analogy between sex and nutrition is frequently put forth in support of a pretended imperiousness of sexual intercourse. But in reality there is more contrast than analogy between the two. Nutrition sustains the life force, whereas sex consumes it. And while food and drink are vital necessities, the generative impulse does not serve any vital necessity, at least not of the individual. The function of reproduction is not essential to the maintenance of the organism. Men can survive without it, whereas they cannot survive without food or drink. If reproduction were entirely stopped the race would perish. But the continuation of the race does not require that everybody takes part in its propagation. Therefore, while the digestive system is designed for regular activity, the sexual organs are constructed for intermittent action, and their functions may be suspended without harm to either their anatomy or physiology. And the sexual appetite, unlike hunger or thirst, can be reduced to a more or less quiescent state, which far from injuring, may benefit the physical and psychic vigor generally. In fact, one may live without carnal activity, and never better than without it. 
Another distinction between sex and nutrition is that nutrition is inherently a selfish function, serving self-preservation, whereas the sexual act as intended by nature is an unselfish function in which the individual sacrifices a fragment of himself for the sake of the preservation of the race. Nutrition implies an increase in the capital of the body, reproduction always means a parting with some of the living material. While to part with this for the sake of the species is an act of self-sacrifice, doing so for selfish gratification without a chance of benefiting the race is but injurious self-waste. The only clear analogy between nutrition and sex lies in the fact that both are allowed to play too prominent a part in human existence. Instead of using them as natural means by which to keep oneself and the race alive, humanity has chosen to live and work, mainly in order to satisfy its self-created inordinate desire for unnatural food and drink beyond the needs of nutrition, and for unnatural sex expression beyond the needs of reproduction. Nature has implanted in living beings a nutritive and a reproductive appetite, only to the extent of her own needs, to ensure individual and collective preservation. And she has intermingled pleasure with necessary things, in order that the addition of pleasure may make the indispensable means of existence attractive to us, so that they shall not be neglected. But this bait of gratification is merely a device of nature, and not in itself an end which has any useful function. In unadulterated form no appetite exists, for its own sake merely, just to be gratified. However, nutrition and sex both are alike subject to abuse by those who pursue the pleasure of gratification of the animal appetites with disregard of their natural objects. Out of both, in his continuous search of pleasure for pleasure's sake, man has distilled a means of sense gratification. Both impulses have been perverted by overstimulation and by habitual indulgence. Both of these forms of abuse are degrading and obstructive to evolutionary growth. But the abuse of sex is the more injurious one, since it always consists in a deleterious way of spending vital elements, while the common errors in nutrition rarely omit a taking in of at least somebody building material. Basically everything beyond nature's simple needs is unnatural. Hence many other factors of civilized existence may have to be regarded as not exactly natural. But none of those other items are comparable with sex or with nutrition, since none affect the body as an instrument for spirit like these two. By the indulgence of the nutritive as well as of the reproductive function false cravings get ever stronger, and the body becomes more and more engrossed, so that a response to higher vibrations is made impossible. Indulgence in evanescent physical pleasures is ever at the cost of abiding spiritual joys. Twenty-six glands and secretions. Certain glands are much influenced by thinking of the conditions under which they are excited. Darwin expression of the emotions. Wondrous beyond human understanding are the workings of the glands, the biochemical factories in living bodies. Substances on which the body depends for its development and sustenance are manufactured by the glands from materials which they extract out of the mass of heterogeneous food that is put into the stomach. Left to themselves the glands perform their tasks instinctively according to nature's needs in a manner which the most learned can neither understand nor explain, their activity is backed by an intelligence that is not equaled by the greatest intellect of man. As long as not interfered with, the glands produce and contribute to the processes of life, just the kind of secretion that is needed, just when and where it is needed. They do this in response to messages originating in any part of the body requiring their particular product. So well has nature's intelligence arranged it that these messages, upon arriving at the gland, automatically stimulate it into accordant action. Glands in general secrete only under the influence of some special stimulation. Man has interfered with nature's normal stimulations and with the normal functioning of glands. With artificial excitations he has forced some glands to serve his pleasure, to work overtime to overproduce secretions. Especially has he overstimulated the glands that are connected with nutrition and with sex, particularly with sex. Modern physiology has emphasized the dual function of the essential reproductive glands, the ovaries and the testes. The ovaries are strictly analogous to the testes. Both produce external secretions for the generation of new bodies. And both testes and ovaries produce internal secretions for the upbuilding and regeneration of one's own body. These internal secretions play no part in the sexual act and are never expelled, but always taken up by the blood. While the external is what might be called the racial secretion, the internal is necessary for the individual's welfare. 
In regard to the internal secretions, the cases of the two sexes are strictly parallel. Apart from giving rise to the development of the secondary sexual characters, they are essential for physical and mental manhood and womanhood. The testes secrete substances which pass into the circulation and are of immense importance in the development of the organism. These substances are the internal secretions, which also add enormously to a man's magnetic and spiritual force. And in woman the ovaries elaborate an internal secretion, which is absorbed by the system, and which is necessary to the physical and spiritual well-being of woman. Modern science recognizes in the internal secretion of the sex glands the necessary factor for the right functioning of the whole organism, and in its weakening the cause of the deterioration of all other functions. Hence there is no surer way to destroy existing manhood or womanhood than such a course of life as deprives the body of this internal secretion. Sexual activity has a deleterious effect in this respect. Unfortunately the individual has the power to use the external or racial secretions for other than racial propagative purposes. The tragedy of this is that by every act which disposes of some external secretion, the formation of the internal is undoubtedly interfered with. When compelled to produce more external secretions than required for generation, the sex glands cannot supply the normal amount of internal secretions for regeneration. The physical harm in the habitual overproduction of external secretion seems to lie in the fact that it drains from the blood nutriment which is needed for the production of internal secretion. The best blood of the body goes to form the ingredients for reproduction in both sexes. The richest elements of that blood are used in the distillation of the reproductive fluids. The more these elements are extracted from the blood for the formation of external, the less they are available for internal secretions and for the essential processes which depend thereon. The whole body suffers when these vital elements are wasted. Not only every sexual act, but all irritation of the sex organs interferes with the formation of the internal secretion. Hence not only every wasteful sexual expression, but also every irritating stimulation of the sex impulse takes place at the cost of self-regeneration, mental and spiritual as well as physical. Even where the use of the external secretions is limited to generation in harmony with natural law, the formation of internal secretions is unfavorably affected. This in itself makes reproduction a sacrificial act. In such a case however the loss in spiritual potentialities is compensated by the sacrificial element in the purely generative act. But in every sexual expression which lacks propagative intention there is not but loss on the regenerative side, a greater and more irreparable loss according to the frequency of the indulgence. The prominent part played by the internal secretions of the sex glands of both men and women in every phase of individual development has been discovered only in modern times. This new knowledge confirms the idea that in order to make possible an advancement in evolution, more and more of the life force must be taken away from generative activity and turned into regenerative channels, for it shows that this force, instead of being used for the formation of the generative external, must be directed to the production of the regenerative internal secretions of the sex glands. Since the production of those important secretions depends on the well-functioning of the sex glands, it is evidently essential to the physical, mental and spiritual well-being of the individual that these glands are normally developed. Where the glands are deficient, there can be no efficient internal secretions. This fact however has been widely misunderstood and often willfully misinterpreted. It is quite erroneous to think that the glands must prove their normal efficiency in sexual expression, and that they must be kept in condition by such activity. Quite to the contrary, and as already emphasized in this chapter, the right functioning of these glands for the benefit of the individual is interfered with by every sexual act. The best proof of the well-functioning of the sex glands is to be found in as sound a physical body as other prevailing factors will permit, in a clear idealistic mind, and in a progressive spiritual growth of the individual. Twenty-seven: A Physiological Dilemma The reabsorption of semen can scarcely be said to be a part of the modern physiological doctrine. Ellis, Studies in the Psychology of Sex v. 180 It is not the intention of this study to delve into physiological details. But some facts have been so misunderstood and twisted into motives for unwarranted sexual acts that it is unavoidable to speak about them if current wrong impressions are to be counteracted. Until a few years ago, 
It was generally held that man's body could absorb the external secretions produced by its sex glands after these secretions had accumulated in the vesicles. But the possibility of such absorption has now by a few physiologists been doubted, and by some denied. Yet, one of the greatest modern authorities admits the possibility of conditions under which the highly vital fluid is partially at least reabsorbed and acts as a tonic to the entire system. Others too are still convinced that it is feasible that the secretions are reabsorbed, partly at least, by the rich plexi of lymphates which surround the canals. Apparently the question is not definitely settled. Most likely the absorption is neither impossible, nor always possible for the entire amount secreted. It seems that anyhow in the continent person, the semen is partly reabsorbed. That there is repeated mention of only partial absorption is not surprising. That nearly always whatever absorption takes place is less than what is produced is to be ascribed to the circumstance that in almost every case there is an unnatural overproduction which overtaxes the capacity of whatever apparatus for absorption exists. In present humanity, the sex glands have a tendency to form external secretions in larger quantities than are needed for reproduction. Racial habits have denatured these glands. They have long been artificially habituated to produce external secretions steadily, instead of only when needed for propagation. They have been inured to yield an unnatural overproduction, just as the lactic glands of the dairy cow have been trained to yield an abnormal overproduction. Under conditions of right thinking and right living the seminal fluid would be produced only when there is a demand for propagation. Formation of reproductive fluids at times when there is no question of propagation is as unnatural and abnormal as the formation of milk when there is no question of motherhood. Once formed, the accumulation of reproductive fluids is apt to cause some discomfort, even strain. This tension is usually mistaken for a manifestation of the reproductive impulse. But almost without exception the formation of the fluid by the sex glands results as little from the natural reproductive impulse as the flow of saliva at the thought or sight of a delicacy results from a natural hunger. Both conditions are caused by artificial stimulation and undue imagination. A man accustomed to abstinence will not suffer from any accumulation of secretions, and the longer the period of continence the less of the irritation and discomfort will be felt. The tension of the accumulated external secretion has given rise to the view met with among the ignorant that this fluid might be noxious if allowed to accumulate. It is regarded as an excretion to be got rid of like those of the bladder and the intestines. This view of the supposed necessity of expelling the reproductive fluid is supported by the new theory of non-absorption. But everything relevant that is known in biology and physiology indicates that nothing could be more false and pernicious. The external secretion of the sex glands is a vital fluid representing far greater potentiality than the same quantity of blood. It is not a waste material, and one positively and directly gains by the absorption of that secretion. This is evidenced by increased muscular action, a diminished sense of fatigue and enhanced recuperativeness. Undoubtedly the more the fluids are retained in the body, the greater fullness of life, health and power are experienced. Therefore under no circumstances apart from propagation should the external secretion be expelled voluntarily. If a surplus really should be removed, nature will do so without any voluntary action of the person and with a minimum loss of physical and psychic energy. After all, it matters little whether absorption of the reproductive fluids is possible or not. The essential point concerns not the way in which they are disposed of after being formed, but their non-formation. If their formation is prevented except in the service of propagation, absorption becomes superfluous. Of the greatest practical value is that the formation and accumulation of these external secretions is avoidable. Even the inherited tendency to their overproduction can be overcome if it is not reinforced by ever new excitations. The infallible way is to lessen the erotic stimuli. As a result of this, it becomes possible to utilize the vital elements of the blood constantly for the formation of the inner secretions, which enhance the development of greater physical and mental and spiritual power. Twenty-eight Erotic Dreams Erotic dreams are influenced by erotic desire. Nistrum, Natural Laws of Sexual Life in the consciousness of man an important part is played by what psychoanalysts have termed, the censor. Deeply implanted in man's nature there is the determination not to be content with oneself as one is, but somehow to be cleaner and higher, 
to suppress and reduce to nothingness the sort of things that drag one down, and to concentrate attention and effort on the higher parts of one's being. The so-called censor may well be interpreted as being an embodiment of that determination, that urge to reach an ever higher evolutionary stage. He can also be considered to be the impartial spectator, the judge within, who is a personification of conscience, warning against actions that are inconsistent with the stage which the individual has reached. Thus the censor is the equivalent of the good demon which every man has as a proper keeper, to bring him to perfection. Ultimately the censor represents spirit, albeit only a negative, inhibiting aspect thereof. The power of the censor depends upon how much of spirit can manifest through a person. The more spiritual one becomes the louder the censor warns against an ever wider range of tendencies which must be outgrown. In effect the censor acts as a guiding principle, which can be developed as a regulative, but which is easily obscured. In many people the censor is indeed very easily obscured. Especially often during sleep the censorship is removed. And even during the waking state old tendencies frequently succeed in passing the censor to find expression, if not in acts then in emotions, and in thoughts of a less desirable nature. To a great extent the thoughts of the day shape the dreams of the night. The waking thoughts and emotions have a powerful and determining influence upon the activities of the consciousness during the hours when the physical body is asleep. In almost every dream certain details are found which have their origin in the impressions or thoughts of one of the preceding days, or sometimes in seemingly forgotten impressions of longer ago. What kind of dreams can one expect when, after sensual stirrings have been admitted during waking hours, censorship is removed during sleep? It is but natural that then, the higher inhibitions gone, the lower passions surge to the front in turbulent welter. And it is no wonder that many of the phenomena of dreams are due to the sexual impulse. Even in good men there is a latent wild beast nature which peers out in sleep, and perhaps in women too. When the reasoning and ruling power is asleep, then the wild beast in human nature starts up and leaps about and seeks to satisfy its desires. Then the serpent is ever fruitful in alluring dreams. Then it is that sexual excitement entertained in a waking state induces ejaculation during sleep. The passive involuntary nocturnal orgasms undoubtedly are less harmful than any passionate voluntary mode of sexual expression. Once the sex glands have formed an oversupply of external secretion, which however should have been prevented, it is better to lose this unconsciously during sleep than to cause its expulsion in a conscious act. But in the majority of cases the generative glands would not form such an excessive secretion if they were not overstimulated or overworked. The fact that nocturnal losses are very general does not mean that they are normal. On the contrary, such emissions are always more or less abnormal. Nor does it mean that they are necessary. Health does not require that there ever should be an emission. The less frequently they occur the better. Always their frequency varies according to the degree in which the mind is directed to sexual matters. One who stimulates the mind with erotic fancies will experience them with greater frequency. But the more the mind while awake is occupied with other than sexual matters, the less frequent the excitements and emissions during sleep. They rarely occur in those who most nearly approach the standard of perfect chastity. Some continent persons never have nocturnal emissions. It is a mistake to believe that emissions during the dream state cannot be controlled. The sensor can be made to function during sleep as well as during the waking hours. In the dreamer there exists an unconscious propensity to conceive his erotic experiences as guilty. He is vaguely aware that emissions in sleep pollute. The reluctance of the will even during sleep to consent to the tendencies of the sexual system strengthens the idea of moral impurity in relation to the nocturnal pollution. It also shows that the censor is not always entirely off-duty. A little exercise of the will can force him to remain alert while one sleeps. With many people indeed the willpower becomes sufficiently awake to allow of their inhibiting the pollution when on the point of occurring. In order to prevent emissions during dreams, therefore exertion of will and control of thought are necessary. Especially the last thought as one sinks into slumber has an influence out of all proportion of the time it occupies the mind. When before going to sleep one has awakened his rational powers and fed them on noble thoughts, then one is least likely to be the sport of fanciful visions. Thus can anyone keep mind and body pure in the dreaming as well as in the waking state, and thereby fill a necessary requirement for spiritual evolution.
29. Perversion. Every expression of the sexual impulse that does not correspond with nature's purpose of propagation must be regarded as perverse. Croft Ebino, Psychopathia Sexualis. From the point of view of nature, the end and object of the sexual impulse is procreation. Therefore, every sexual act not having in view the propagation of the species is perverse. This is true whether the act be solitary or mutual, whether heterosexual with intended unproductiveness or homosexual, whether to be classed as prostitution or as birth control, whether technically labeled as inversion or as perversion, and whether the tendency to such acts be congenital or acquired. None of these acts have in view the perpetuation of the species, and all are therefore perversions. From the sociological point of view they may differ in degree of reprehensibility, but from the spiritual standpoint they are all equally objectionable and corrupt. What some writers have said about specific sexual aberrations may well be applied to all perversions of the reproductive impulse. They are a sad pathological acquisition of the human race, contrary to nature and due to unbridled lust. They are the negation of the higher order of things, ethically reprehensible, and destructive of everything noble and dignified in human nature. They deprive the system at large of what might have become general stimulation and vitality, and there is a continuously greater strain upon the nervous system. In their addicts self-control is being undermined, to such an extent that the person who shows sex abnormalities is potentially the most dangerous casual criminal. And worse than any of these effects are those that appear in the offspring, for acquired sexual perversion may be, an eradicable vice in the next generation. In short, not only from the unnatural loves of either sex, innumerable evils have come, but from every sexual perversion in the widest sense great evils have fallen upon individuals and upon humanity. It is true of every sexual perversion that the practice is contrary to the ends of humanity, for the end of humanity in respect to sexuality is to preserve the species without debasing the person. All perverse sexual acts do just the opposite, without preserving the species they debase the person, they interfere with the possibility of the soul's normal development. Also, he who indulges in them, is the reverse of happy. If humanity is ever to be capable of being raised to a condition of true happiness, passions must diminish. Pathological results of the most frequently occurring forms of perversion have been so often overstated, that now even a conservative statement of the truth one, finds little credence. But after all, the psychic effect, is even more deleterious than the physical. Of any perversion, the effects on the higher qualities are not easily exaggerated. One far more serious than any physical impairment, is the impairment of the idealism and the nobility of life. The finer endowments of man suffer graver lesions than do the physical. Every perversion inevitably coarsens man's whole moral and spiritual fiber. It is mere sense pleasure bought at the cost of the higher life. The modern way of looking upon perversion is to extenuate, and to condone it on the ground that it is often the result of inborn tendencies, or of specific glandular defects. On this same basis all crime too, should then be excused and tolerated, for undoubtedly the criminal as well as the pervert in many cases descends from tainted progenitors, or has deficient endocrines. To recognize this may lead to a better understanding of their disordered condition, and to the discovery of means by which to help, to correct, to cure them. It should also lead to ways of eugenically preventing the birth of ever more congenital criminals and perverts. But it does not mitigate the fact that perversion and crime both are intolerable abnormalities. Counteracting spiritual evolution, they cause mankind's devolution. They must necessarily be eliminated wherever the aim of society is evolutionary progress. Man has deliberately taken the sexual appetite away from its natural normal manifestation. Thirty sexual normalcy. Atkinson regenerative power. As a race, we are oversexed. By habitual indulgence, by cumulative heredity, by influence of surroundings, and by seeking or submitting to stimulation, the human sexual impulse has long since been developed to a state far beyond its natural normalcy. The excessive sex urge in man bears the stamp of a compulsion which is unnatural. Normal sexuality has been replaced by abnormal sensuality. The sex impulse is natural only as long as the fundamental design of the sexual act, propagation, is in view. At the evolutionary stage which most of humanity should have reached by now, the biological urge is entirely normal, 
only when it drives mate to mate in a longing to call forth another living being out of a union of the highest that each is able to contribute. When the urge appears at other times, it is abnormal and ought to be considered pathological. And at such other times to yield to the biological is to betray the spiritual. Normal human evolution calls for a steady ascent from the stage of animal instinct to that of spiritual self-consciousness and power. But the blinding glare of oversexedness has drawn humanity to bide and settle down in bypaths of evolution and to ignore the goal of the ascent toward spiritual heights. Oversexedness is an abnormal development which causes a delay, if not a permanent break in evolutionary growth. Yet so almost general a symptom has oversexedness become that it is erroneously regarded as a normal, natural condition. Where practice is so general, theory has accommodated itself so far as to assume that sexual intercourse is necessary and wholesome. Eleven public opinion on this point is misled by the peculiar quality of the human body that it readily accustoms itself to whatever habit it acquires, soon craves for it, and protests when the demands of the habit are not regularly obeyed. Once accustomed to alcohol or drugs or to sexual excitement a body manifests discomfort when its craving for gratification is not satisfied. This has led to the fallacy that it is necessary and even healthy to supply the gratification in order to remove the discomfort. But the normal, natural way to eliminate the latter is to ignore it and to prevent its repetition by establishing a purer standard. Not a single habit can constitute a necessity. Even where the tendency to a habit is inborn it can be overcome, provided the mind begins to see that the habit is undesirable. The first requirement for sexual normalcy is, therefore, a mental recognition that the present sexual habits of the race are abnormal. Then the individual will either avoid to become addicted, or if already an addict, will gradually break away from those habits. It should be clear to anyone that the existence of a sexual excitation is not sufficient to prove that it is normal. But in judging of matters relating to sexual morality, men have generally made little use of their reason. Abnormal stimulation of the sexual function has biased the discriminative faculty, which is needed to distinguish between natural and unnatural, between normal and abnormal. The prejudiced opinion of many who wish to justify their personal tendencies leads them to scoff the pure or normal standard and to decry this as though it were abnormal and morbid. This mistaken attitude is shared by many others who are misguided by the thought that normalcy is measured by the condition of a majority. But absolute normalcy does not consist in what the majority may do or think or be. In the absolute sense our oversexedness, howsoever widespread it may be, is an abnormal symptom, it is as much a deviation from normal sexuality as our general low rate of health is a departure from normal well-being. Humanity has caused its general lack of health as well as most of its other misery largely by its digression from nature's normal standards. Misery is nature's protest against degeneration. Every willful deviation from nature's normalcy is therefore followed by a severe and often painful reaction, even if that result is not always immediately apparent. In present humanity almost everyone seems to prefer to remain complacently in the hedonic state of oversexedness and to be indifferent to its deleterious results for the individual and for the race. In the general tendency of ready surrender to its dictates, the imperiousness of the sex impulse has been greatly overrated. But the sexual appetite is not insuperable. With a little strength of character and of will, it is not very difficult to overcome the abnormal drive of this urge. Only weaklings yield to sexual impulses which the normally strong feel but repress. After recognizing that sexual normalcy consists in purity, people of high principles free themselves from the grip of sex. Rising above all erotic influences and conditions, they take up again the long interrupted ascent toward the highest goal of human evolution, spiritual unfoldment. Thirty-one Continents if one is gated to idealism, continence should make powerful appeal to him. Collins, the doctor looks at love and life. Threaded through all the pages of this book, even where but faintly showing between the lines, is the ever-recurrent thought that the ideal sexual life is one of strict continence. Continence, the word is not used here loosely to denote moderation, in which sense it is so often applied to the very flexible moral standard of most people. By continence is meant the voluntary and entire abstinence from sexual indulgence in any form. Strict continence is meant, 
absolute abstinence except for purposes of propagation, abstinence not only from the gratification of the impulse, but also from mental and tactile caresses, and from all abnormal practices. All such dalliance is not abstinence. And because continence is not compatible with sexual excitement of any kind, it must involve a permanent abstention from indulgence in erotic imaginations and voluptuous reverie, and from any of the factors which arouse the sexual passion. Perfect sexual continence as an ideal to be striven for, cannot be dismissed as a mere monk-made superstition. Even for the most materialistic purposes, the value of abstinence has been generally acknowledged. It has always been a rule for athletes while training for contests and prize events. This fact about athletes has been often positively affirmed by the ancients, and strict abstinence is still adhered to in our own days in the preparation of participants for prize fights, league ball games and similar sports. During the period of intensive training sexual excitement is the one thing which is rigidly excluded. Clearly it is considered worthwhile and possible, even for the most full-blooded and hard-muscled men to be continent for a certain period for the sake of a chance to win a prize in a competitive contest. It will be found to be much more worthwhile, and just as possible, in the longer period of training for the acquisition of the inestimable prize of an expanded consciousness. This is the prize which everyone can win, for the feeling of control and power produced by continence plays its part in the production of spiritual insight. For spiritual results, however, it must include an obliteration of all sexual craving. After an experimental period of an observance of continence, the next step will most naturally come in the form of its permanent continuance. For it is only logical that what is profitable for a time should be always practiced, that it may be always profitable. Or shall one be willing only to abstain from what is ordinarily deemed a pleasure for the sake of a victory in wrestling and the like and, be incapable of a similar abstinence for the sake of a much nobler victory, which is the noblest of all? There are enough sexual stoics in the world to prove by experience that continence is not only possible but also practical. As every competent and responsible authority asserts, it does no harm to the individual. No one was ever yet in the slightest degree the worse for perfect continence. Where other factors do not counteract its salutary influence, there is exuberance of health, life and intelligence to be observed among chaste people. The more continently one lives the better work one can produce, because in body and in mind energy is gained by the establishment of continence. It enlivens perception. One who consistently lives the continent life, wins a power of concentration that is unknown to one who trifles with the sex impulses. Thus, for instance, the abstinent scientist can devote more of his energy to study, accomplishing greater results. And this applies analogically to any profession to any accomplishment. Only those who have left the animal man entirely behind are able to do the best work in many spheres of life. Hence for the most matter-of-fact reasons one can follow no more excellent rule of life than to acquire continence as the greatest wealth. And what makes this rule of paramount value is that at the same time one can save the spiritual store in the body by observing continence. The idea still prevails, because it fits in with inclination. Wollston. For humanity as a group a sexual necessity exists only in so far as the integrity of the race is concerned. But there is no necessity of everybody's sharing in the task of continuing the race. For the individual, the idea of biological sexual necessity is so obviously coupled with selfish interests as to give it the quality of a special bias. It rose from the excuses made by those whose lust controlled them. It is misleadingly supported by some sexologists who would build a norm for normal people on the basis of their abnormal cases. And it is almost ineradicable because men will accept any doctrine that flatters their desires. In reality, so-called physical relief is never necessary. The tradition of sex necessity is a dangerous lie, particularly as it is founded on the false assumption that cohabitant ion is essential to health. This pitiable argument is a pure sophism. It is a singularly false notion that man's vitality is weakened unless he has indulgence. Statements by eminent physicians flatly contradict this assumption. The sexual functions may remain unused without any injury to health. And this applies not only as some might think, to people of low vitality or little virility, also a strong person can live and live well, without any indulgence of the sex tendency. Therefore entirely refuted must be, the lie that continence is dangerous to health, for the opposite is true. Continence is one of the conditions essential to the attainment and maintenance of the highest degree of physical and mental vigor. 
there is no physiological basis for the irresponsible assertion that sexual intercourse is essential for the maintenance of the healthy metabolisms of the normal organism. It is but a pernicious pseudophysiology which teaches that the exercise of the generative functions is necessary in order to maintain physical and mental vigor. Science cannot subscribe to this, the less so when considering that in addition there is no adequate evidence that there is any intrinsic psychological necessity for sex indulgence, either in men or women. Such necessity is disproven by experience and is condemned by the best medical authorities throughout the world. Under no circumstances can unchastity be either necessary or justifiable. After all, the question as to the necessity of sexual intercourse has wider bearings than in relation to health. Overlooked and denied as it may be by many, there is in human existence something of far greater value than the physical body, and then desire, and then intellect. The well-being, and the growth of the spiritual element is the most important factor. And spiritual well-being depends upon normalization and purification of all the elements of individual existence. As already brought out in various preceding chapters, every yielding to the sexual impulse other than for propagation, deters from spiritual attainment, which is of paramount value for evolutionary progress. 32 The Notion of Necessity Thirty-three Virility. Sexual intercourse is not essential to the preservation of virility. Winslow, the family physician. It has been claimed that continence leads to impotence. But against this bias popular superstition many, distinguished medical writers maintain, that abstinence from sexual intercourse cannot be reckoned as a cause of impotence. A large group of the foremost medical authorities has endorsed a declaration that continence has not been shown to be detrimental to virility. Another medical group has declared that the sexual power is never lost through abstinence from cohabitation, any more than the ability to weep is lost through abstinence from weeping. This last statement hits the basic fallacy in the idea that sex organs need exercise. For the essential organs of generation are not muscles but glands. And unlike muscles, glands require no exercise, certainly no volitional exercise by their possessor, in order to keep the power to function when nature requires it. Hence the function of the sexual apparatus may be held in abeyance, without producing physical injury. Even after very long periods of abstinence, that apparatus can be sound and capable of being roused into activity. If impotence exists after long abstinence, it is not to be ascribed to the abstinence but to preoccupation with sexual questions, overstimulation of the sexual disposition and the like, because these irritate and thereby weaken the organs. A continent life, accompanied by a normal mental outlook, never yet resulted in impotence. Therefore, above all, normal people may practice continence for many years or indefinitely without any loss of sexual power. There is no loss of power, provided one does not keep the genital organs irritated, be it by sensory or by mental stimuli. Atrophy caused by sexual abstinence remains scientifically unproven. In fact, it may be affirmed that no amount of continence ever caused atrophy. Surely no continent person need be deterred from leading a chaste life by the apocryphal fear of atrophy. What is likely to become apparent after a period of strict continence is a normalization of what had been an abnormally overstimulated, sensualized virility. In this sense it is true that the sexual appetite diminishes with abstinence, but not the latent virile power. If abstinence be rigidly adhered to, the desire materially diminishes and a condition of sexual indifference endues. This is perfectly normal. Its result is that a previously existing unwholesome virility is apt to be reduced to a normal ability to propagate without sensual desire. Far from being detrimental, this normalization of the sexuality can only be beneficial to a wholesome virility and salutary to body and to spirit. 34. Health and Disease What an antiseptic is a pure life. Lowell My Study Windows, 578. Disease is the disharmony which follows disobedience to nature's laws. It is a scourge to drive us back into obedience to her laws. Every indulgence of the senses contrary to nature's purposes produces discord between man and nature. 
whether the indulgence consists in eating except for self-preservation, or in sexual expression except for racial preservation, it is bound to result in the disharmony that eventually becomes manifest in the form of disease. Each passion in man is capable of producing disease. But especially the misuse of the reproductive function is the underlying cause of much sickness, because the lower pelvic region is capable of deranging every bodily organ. There is no one function which, if disturbed, leads so certainly to general and feeling or to physical disorders, even though these often do not arise until much later. It is almost true that its misuse is the cause of all misery and disease. Every use of the sexual function beyond intended race preservation constitutes a misuse and excess. An excess brings on disease, misery, suffering, mental and physical. Specialists agree that the aggregate evils arising from excesses of this kind are greater than those arising from excesses of all other kinds put together. It is largely through the abuse of the sex force that man is more diseased than any animal. Free from man's influence animals do not indulge in sexual congress, except in the season of rut. The sexes become neutralized during the rest of the year. Thus their natural vitality is greatly conserved and intensified in their seed. But man's abuse of the sex force has gradually affected most of the human seed, of the valuable germ plasm, as a result of which mankind becomes with every century, more dwarfed and weakened. By sexual self-gratification man has become, a helpless, scrofulous being and, the wealthiest heir to constitutional and hereditary diseases. Through physical indulgence the human race is afflicted with puny and precarious healths and early deaths. The flesh of man is corrupt because by unwise cohabitation he has corrupted his race. Illness is his fate while his immortal spirit languishes in the bonds of sense. Continence would be of the greatest help in humanity's struggle against illness, because in the continent person the undiminished internal secretions of the sex glands are better able to fulfill their task of keeping the system immune to infections. Or where infection is already active in the body, these secretions can the more effectively combat the disease-producing toxins and prevent a serious outbreak. And should actual disease be insuppressible and take its course as a result from overruling causes, then a continent life shall have enabled the patient to save up force, which greatly assists in the recuperative powers. Of course, those who abstain from indulgence cannot immediately be vigorous and entirely free from ills. But when there are pathological symptoms in one who abstains from sexual acts, there certainly is an other cause than continence for conditions of ill health. Entirely unfounded and unfair is the popular tendency to ascribe to continence whatever ails a continent person. However, sometimes a diseased condition is caused in one who is outwardly continent by what might well be called an unchaste continence. When physical continence is not combined with chastity and thoughts, there can be no harmony, no balance in the body, hence no health. To be thoroughly effective the continence must be positively willed and supported from within, not but negatively and grudgingly accepted from outer compelling circumstances. Supported by inward purity, continence will lead unfailingly to greater strength and better health than would be attainable otherwise. Health depends on too many different factors to be permanently secured by continence alone. Heredity sets up its limitations. Unwholesome habits have a lasting influence. Overwork and worry frequently interfere. Often fatal to physical well-being are dietetic errors, and hardly anyone knows how to avoid these. And sometimes health is disturbed when a person is developing spiritually while neglecting to give sufficient attention to a proportionate purification and spiritualization of the body, or while failing to consider that the body, as it becomes a more delicate instrument, requires different and greater care than before. But whatever the momentarily disturbing factors, always in the direction of purity lie health and vitality. Thirty-five Venereal Diseases Venereal disease, in an educated age will be unknown. Sally B. Health Strength and Happiness, 25-394 On degenerated humanity venereal disease is a mark of moral deficiency. It is an affliction, self-attracted by recklessly playing with the fire of life. Wherever this game is played it exposes the players to the scourge of sexual disease. Due to the popularity of the perilous sexual game, diseases of the sexual function are more widespread and cause greater misery and suffering than any other disease of the human body, barring none. Those diseases are so prevalent because it is practically impossible to avoid venereal infection when having illicit intercourse, 
especially if this goes together as it usually does with promiscuousness. Wherever promiscuity increases, their venereal disease will certainly increase also. The incontestable argument against uncontrolled and unrestricted sexual expression remains that promiscuous indulgence is sure, sooner or later, to bring infection by one or both of the venereal diseases, gonorrhea and syphilis. These two are the infections which are so commonly associated with the unwise exercise of the racial impulse. They have been responsible for much of the misery in the world, and for vast suffering in the innocent as well as in those who incur the direct results of their own conduct. Many physicians know that the majority of diseases peculiar to women have their origin in a microscopic organism which men harbor, and which is the relic of an infection that has perhaps even been forgotten. There is no warrant for ordinary students wading into the pathology of the subject, the less pathology we read the better. All such descriptions as well as those of anatomical and physiological details may satisfy a prurient curiosity, but they have a tendency to stir up morbidity and eroticism and can rarely serve any edifying purpose. Yet everyone should know that venereal diseases are exceedingly grave. Every person should know something about the terrible consequences of both gonorrhea and syphilis and the relationship of these diseases to incurable conditions of many vital organs. It is now established that gonorrheal infection results in numberless cases in complications. The whole organism may be involved. It has also been found that syphilis predisposes the organism to the attacks of other diseases. It may become the cause of all maladies with which humanity is afflicted, and these often become the immediate cause of death, be it years after the venereal infection when there is no thought of connecting the new symptoms with their true origin. Thus indirectly, syphilis actually causes more deaths than any other infection. Moreover, what makes syphilis so exceedingly serious in its consequences is the fact that it is capable of reacting harmfully on subsequent generations. It may destroy the health and the very existence of the unborn children. It is a cause of the degeneration of the race. O.O. and gonorrhea, while not directly inheritable as such, is one of the most formidable and far-reaching infections by which the human race is attacked. Indirectly it is apt to cause serious infantile infections. Some high medical authorities regard gonorrhea as even more serious in its social consequences than syphilis. The insidious nature and destructive virulence of venereal diseases should be more widely known in order to offset the heedless way in which they are generally regarded. They are difficult to cure from the first, and almost impossible when thoroughly lodged in the system. When the outer symptoms have been suppressed, the disease often settles down into a latent and dormant condition, and years afterwards the poison will break out. Usually quite costly are the few fleeting moments of sexual gratification, heavy and enduring the penalty to be paid. All protective devices both mechanical and medicinal have failed to ensure safety from the venereal diseases. No method of absolutely ensuring against infection has been discovered, except one, continence, would solve the problem. Venereal disease is now so widespread that even for prudential reasons purity should be observed by old and young. Though fear is not a noble reason for abstaining from the yielding to an impulse or a passion, it is better to abstain on account of fear than not to abstain at all. Better let fear of punishment detain from murder and from theft, than to yield to an inclination to such actions. Better let continence be motivated by a fear for venereal diseases, than to have one yield to sexual passion, which is bound to lead to misery for self and for others. Of course, one who is only as good as fear will make him is not very good. One must have higher motives to impel to self-control. Chastity must have a far more solid foundation than fear. Higher than fear for dreadful physical results is prudence. Higher than prudence is the ethical consideration of not wanting to cause hurt to others. Higher than ethics is the spiritual motive of wanting to aid evolution and not to set up new causes for ever more misery. Whatever motive may lead up to it, the only satisfactory method of avoiding venereal disease is to live a clean life and that one method is open to all. Thirty-six. Neuroses. There is no evidence that continence produces any neurotic symptoms. Foundations of social hygiene. In many and sundry ways modern civilization increases the irritation of the nervous system. It overstimulates every personal element of human nature. 
As a result, neurotics represent a very large proportion of humanity, and their number seems to be rapidly increasing. Considering that above all else the sexual nature is being overstimulated, so that an increasing majority of mankind is oversexed and ever less continent, may not the growing percentage of neurotics have some special connection with the increased neglect of chastity? Under the spreading influence of misleading sophistries, there is less and less of what in popular speech is called repression, more and more of expression of sex. Is it then not more likely that the increase of cases of neurosis is caused by undue sex expression, whether in thought or act, rather than by so-called repression? Yet, psychoanalysts are inclined to trace to sex repression most of the nervous and mental disorders. However, what the psychoanalyst means when he says that psychoneuroses are due to repression is something very different from saying that they are due to sexual restraint. Not understanding the psychoanalytical theory, the lay public has transposed it into the fallacy that restraint or continence tends to produce neurosis, and this has been taken to support the erroneous notion that sex expression is generally advisable and even necessary. But the opinion which on pseudo-psychological grounds suggests or permits incontinence is absolutely false, it rests on misinterpretations, always biased and often deliberate. According to this idea, the one who allows his impulses and unbridled expression should be proof against neurosis. But daily experience shows that he may be as neurotic as others. In fact, there are more victims of neurasthenia among those who give free rein to their sensuality than among those who know how to escape the yoke of mere animalism. And this is to be expected since a weakness of will with regard to sexual temptations makes one less capable of resisting nervous disturbances. Refuting the idea that abstinence has a deleterious effect on the nervous system is the conspicuous fact that there are men and women whose daily experience proves that it is possible for even highly sexed individuals to remain continent without any abnormal psychological effects. 11. Some of the most prominent neurologists do not believe that continence leads to nervous disease. Physiology and pathology clearly show that the base of the trunk, when it has undue influence on life, works the destruction of the whole nervous system. An abnormal condition of irritability and disorder of the sex organs causes nervous derangement. But the strictly continent suffer little or none of that irritability one, and such disorder is practically unknown to them. Where neurotic conditions are observed in continent persons, it is not the continence which is responsible. Usually the patients have become neurasthenics for entirely different reasons, such as primary disposition, mental overexertion etc. One however, neurasthenia can occur when there is antagonism between impurity of the thoughts and purity of the body, but that would not be a case of true chastity. Anyone who notwithstanding physical abstinence persistently indulges his sex fantasies must expect to be the victim of psychological distress. For wherever conditions arise which specially stimulate the sexual emotions, neurasthenia may be produced. In such a case the real harm comes not from the restraint of sex desires, but from artificial stimulation beyond the means of healthy control. Hence what is to be avoided is mental and other overstimulation of the sex impulse. Since continence itself never produces neurosis, there is no foundation for the warnings against continence, which are now not only surreptitiously but often brazenly disseminated. In healthy and not hereditarily neuropathic people complete abstinence is possible without injury to the nervous system. However, it may be true that in individuals of neuropathic predisposition enforced abstinence may give rise to danger of nervous and mental diseases, and that the more one is predisposed to neurosis the harder is sexual abstinence. But since the neurotically predisposed should particularly guard against every avoidable loss of nervous energy, the practice of continence is especially advisable for them. For the continent person avoids all loss of nervous energy incidental to sexual excitement. Every waste of sexual power in either sex lowers the nervous tone of the entire system. Considerably so, because the nervous shock accompanying the exercise of the sexual organs is the most profound of all to which the system is subject and especially those who seek variations from the normal method, stamp their nervous systems with a malign influence. Therefore, to save nervous energy one should be strictly continent. For some, especially for those habituated to sexual acts, this may seem difficult. But it is well worthwhile to make the effort, because as a result of sexual abstinence one may acquire, a firmness of character which will place one beyond the reach of nerve-disturbing influences. 
The strength of will demonstrated and fortified in the process of mastering the sexual impulse is in itself a protection against neuroses. Thirty-seven medical advice. The real continent individuals do not require medical help? Tell me love vi. Sex in its pathological expressions in its disturbances and diseases which need to be cured is intrinsically a matter for expert medical attention. But since there is no pathology in continence, the subject of continence does not belong specifically to medical science. Therefore medical opinion on this subject need not carry more weight than serious lay opinion. The medical profession is made up of just as many kinds of people as any other group. For this reason a unanimous support of the ideal of continence can at no time be expected from their side, any more than from other large groups of men. As in other humans, so in physicians exists a danger to let personal inclination bias personal opinion, and this tendency is always particularly strong in regard to sexual behavior, in which almost every person wants to find justification for his own standard. Moreover, the medical practitioner's constant dealing with unreproductive and abnormal sex expression of patients is apt to obscure his vision of its ideal manifestation. And the modern materialistic trend, with its sophistical excuses for unrestrained sexual expression, has affected the ideas on this subject within the ranks of the medical profession as much as amongst laymen. On account of this, definite medical statements in support of sexual purity have become scarcer as the years pass by. But even if not a single medicus ever had expressed himself in favor of continence, the ideal would not be affected. Too many arguments apart from medical advice support its adequacy and its evolutionary indispensability. Even if the whole medical faculty had united in attacking the advisability and the feasibility of the ideal from a physical standpoint, its absolute value would still remain intact. For there is something in sexual purity that is superphysical something that remains inviolate and unshaken even though its physical defenses should be shattered. The spiritual value of the ideal is impervious to physical attacks. Be it then that medical opinion for or against continence is not necessarily conclusive, it is yet gratifying to find that many Medici, including some of the leaders in the sexological field, have published unequivocal statements in support of continence. As already demonstrated by quotations in preceding chapters, reputable physicians and physiologists unite in advocating a chaste and continent life, simply for the sake of one's health, independently of all other considerations. Scores of medical writers have already been quoted, and the science of a thousand others has affirmed that abstinence has never caused any disturbance to health. The American Medical Association has repeatedly repudiated the false doctrine that sexual continence is incompatible with health. A large English medical group has stated that there is no definite evidence to prove that continence in either sex results in any harmful effect upon the normal physiological activities of the organism. Outstanding specialists have declared that with all the opportunity of long experience, they have no knowledge of any harm resulting from a pure and moral life, have never found a man suffering from keeping himself pure have never observed a single instance of atrophy of the generative organs from this cause, have never seen diseases produced by chastity, and are without proof of their existence. Everywhere in the medical profession, there always have been strong supporters of the view that the yielding to desire is no more to be justified upon physiological or physical than upon moral or religious grounds, and that the control of the sexual desire is necessary from the hygienic standpoint. The majority of medical authorities maintain that man can always retain control over the sex urge. Should the urge become annoying, the best medical advice would still be that the real remedy for sexual distress is to remain continent. A pure life is best under all circumstances. Just as the opposite opinion cannot be accepted as final, because it has been subscribed to by some physicians, so the view entertained by the most advanced medical authorities about the benefits of continence does not have to be accepted on the word of any of them, it is a matter capable of individual proof. And an individual effort to obtain this proof will readily demonstrate that the subjugation of the sexual impulse develops all that is best and noblest, and that the control of this force seems to contribute definitely to intellectual growth and to spiritual development. Thirty-eight popular opinion. Young people are led astray, neither by temperament nor by the senses but by popular opinion. Rousseau. 
the colorless expression of immature minds which are deluded by warped echoes of half-truths, that's popular opinion. It covers the earth as though with a layer of viscid paste, which glues most of humanity down to a common, very common level. Devoid of depth, despoiled of elevation, it is in one word shallow. Whoever pulls himself loose from the confining adherence to popular opinion and rises morally and spiritually above the surrounding group, is scoffed and ridiculed. This has always been the fate of those who aspired to realities within instead of reaching like most of the others for unrealities without. Always the wisdom lover is rebuked by the many as though he were beside himself. Always men are attacked for seeking perfection. And if they try to tell the others that greater things can be acquired by a renouncing of the lesser, they're hated and despised. Always men seek to vilify, whoever teaches them to discipline the senses in order that their higher nature may appear, and he escapes with rare good fortune if his chastity or his virility is not assailed. What else can be expected when the mass of men, are so prone to lust that they cannot delight in any pleasure save such as they receive from bodily sensations? In the world in which we live, when one is seen rejecting these physical sensations for the sake of spiritual realization, it is the usual thing that the rest are of opinion that to him who has no part in bodily pleasure life is not worth living. However, in matters where strong desires and lusts are concerned the majority, is usually wrong. In their opinion on such matters, most people are misled by their own sensual attractions. In turning all their thoughts and desires towards transitory things, they know nothing of the inner life, which the one who separates himself from the masses strives to reach. The majority, limited in vision to material interests, cannot possibly understand spiritual motives. Neither the spiritual man nor spiritual things can be judged by the carnal mind, which shapes the fallacies of popular opinion. But as it is not for those to speak of graceful forms of the material world who have never seen them, so those should be silent, who have never known the face of moral wisdom, beautiful beyond the beauty of evening and of dawn. Those who have had a glimpse of spiritual beauty, will agree that it is the province only of the stupid to pay attention to the opinion of the multitude. For when, either from mental lassitude or in order not to be unpopular, one lets himself be held back by popular opinion from climbing spiritual heights, one never gets above the common planes. Of course it is much easier to go with the majority than to climb, painfully and slowly, to the heights of isolation, which have remained free from the profaning influence of the multitudes. Yet it is only on these heights that one can enjoy a wider outlook, breathe purer air, hear whisperings of spirit and conceive its wisdom. Thirty nine ascetism. My highest respect to the ascetic ideal in so far as it is honest. Nietzsche, Genealogy of Morals, one eleven, comma twenty six. In an unspoiled state, and again in a purified state, man is naturally ascetic in the sense of being abstemious, of leaving off whatever only serves to satisfy unnaturally stimulated, desire created cravings. In the unspoiled, such cravings do not yet exist, in the purified, they have been overcome. Between these two evolutionary conditions lies the intermediate one in which most of humanity now finds itself. By misusing the mind to overstimulate the body impulses man has abandoned the primitive, more innocent state. By clinging to sense gratification, he hinders his attainment of the higher, spiritualized condition. In the present deadlock of human evolution mankind chooses ignorantly or stubbornly to follow the dictates of bodily desires. Those however who are anxious to hasten evolution must inevitably free themselves from the domination of such desires, and for this purpose, the need of ascetic exercises, more or less drastic and rigid according to one's individual propensities, is undeniable. In many ways asceticism and chastity are useful means to desirable ends. An ascetic element is inseparable from all morality. It is an absolutely indispensable means for the attainment of moral freedom, especially in the sphere of sex. For only asceticism can free us from the yoke of our passions, and lead us to the highest goal of morality. But also those who want to conquer real knowledge have to, submit themselves to a kind of asceticism. Through regular exercise, the mind must be freed from the influence of the senses, in order to be able to function to its fullest capacity. In every way, asceticism, leads to a fuller life. And finally, by means of ascetic observances man becomes, a spiritual being. In no other way can those racial habits which render the body unserviceable as an organ of the spirit be overcome. 
The real purpose of asceticism is to remove the noxious weeds of physical indulgence in order to make room for valuable spiritual growth. So considered, the ascetic ideal has an element of eternal truth without which life can have no true culture. For first of all, asceticism is a discipline in self-control, it helps to fortify the character and the will it is a discipline of mind and body to fit men for the service of an ideal. Its purpose is to harden as well as to purify, to secure control over the appetites, and to bring the body into subjection to the will. It is unfortunate that many a fanatical ascetic has specialized in exaggerated, morbid and repellent austerities, as though one could acquire a spiritual asset by outdoing others in self-torture, or as though preparatory exercises themselves constituted the sought for end. Such ascetical extremists may well have succeeded by inflicting any smart to overthrow the strongest passion by the most violent pain, on the same principle that is applied in the modern medical method of counter-irritation. But by so cruelly crushing the lower side of life they frequently have crippled the physical body which, after all, is the vehicle through which man's higher faculties also must find expression. Apart from this unwarranted application of ascetic principles, there is a sane and civilized asceticism, which presents a quite different face. It holds that the ascetic is not he who punishes the body but who purifies the soul, at the same time that he disciplines and refines the body to bring it into vibratory harmony with spirit. This moderate and sensible asceticism emphasizes that its self-denying practices are only a contributory factor in inducing a spiritual result, and that they must be combined with the practical exercise of spiritual qualities. The sane ascetic strives to coordinate his personality, to unify his powers, by subordinating the lower to the higher, and where he represses it is with a view to development and enrichment. Indeed, the creed of the ascetic has a real and vital meaning. His voluntary celibacy and abstinence place at his disposal all that force which would be discharged by a man of the world, in domestic affection and in worldly pleasures and excitements. If evolution is to proceed without an interrupting retrogression, asceticism will have to be recognized as a basic thing in human nature, even though in many it be deeply buried under layers of sense-feeding soil. In the ascetic movements, there was an equally vital and important truth, which will have to be rehabilitated. That truth involves the fact that spiritual power cannot manifest where there is moral weakness, and that whatever is given to the body is taken from the spirit. Hence the principle of true asceticism is the principle of spiritual self-preservation. Excel the modern ascetic. Our day has created a new ascetic. Type, one finds him almost everywhere. By air, remaking of marriage. Enters, the modern ascetic. Not an emaciated sitter under a tree is he, as so many of his oriental brothers. He is neither dolorously pious like the early Christian or the standardized medieval type, nor long-faced and gloomy like the Puritan blue lawmaker is commonly represented to be. He is not mirthlessly narrow-minded, not solemnly condemning, not unctuously upbraiding others with a self-satisfied sham of superiority. Nor is he trying to force his ways or his convictions on his fellow men. On the contrary he is a cheerful, radiant person, happy in the spiritual felicity that is his, unostentatiously and unassumingly going his way, strict for himself in trying to apply the spiritual principles in everyday existence, while broad-mindedly understanding that others from different standpoints will view things differently. Seeing as he does in savage and sage a manifestation of the all, he feels in spirit oneness with all. People may call him meek because he is not aggressive, nor self-assertive, nor greedy, and because in his recognition of the one life in whatever physical form it may manifest he is no fighter, no killer, and will even choose rather to be strong in soul than in body. His meekness is not a sign of weakness, it is the expression of positive spiritual strength. Life might be easier for him if he went into solitude. But permanent solitude befits either the weaklings who seek protection against the hurts and hazards of worldly trials and temptations, or it belongs to those who have grown spiritually so strong as not to need the stimulating whip of worldly dilemmas anymore. It is just for developing this strength in regular exercise, and against unremitting opposition that the modern ascetic is living in the midst of a materialistic world. Instead of living solitarily he seeks solidarity. He tries in a way to lead the monastic life while remaining in the world, seeking not to detach himself from his fellow men, but only from earthly gratification. He attempts not to escape, but to conquer all those forces which are antithetical to his growing spiritual strength. He is a man in the world, 
but he will raise himself entirely above it. When such a one after many struggles with his own nature has finally conquered, he looks on the delusions of the world smiling and at rest. The modern ascetic seeks to approach an ideal. And whatever would deflect him from that ideal, whatever he recognizes as an obstacle between himself and the ideal, he unhesitatingly discards. Training his body as an instrument for spirit, he is truly an ascetic, realizing that asceticism is the necessary antechamber to spiritual perfection. While in that antechamber, he has to drop the non-essentials before he can be admitted into the sanctum. He knows that the senses more than aught else try to delude and draw him into potentially obstructive interests and actions, therefore he sedulously refrains from active part in all that would tend to reinforce the possible remnant of a sensual element in his nature. He is one in whom the better consciousness is so continuously active that it never allows his passions to get a hold of him. In most cases he does not beget children of his own flesh, but brings to birth the children of his spirit, be it sometimes in no more visible form than that of elevating thoughts. The more clearly the outline of the ideal rises before him, the more readily does all sense and specially sex allurement lose its attraction for him. Many people, failing to recognize the joy of ascendancy of the ascetic, think that he is painfully sacrificing what they hold to be life's pleasures. But they do not know that clean strong feeling of freedom, which surges over him when he has resisted the lure of some bodily appetite. He does not really have to sacrifice anything, for true asceticism consists in giving up that which one does not want, and this certainly excludes any idea of sacrifice. Eventually, when nothing remains in him that can respond to lower vibrations, all temptation naturally falls away from him. No, not a suffering martyr is the modern ascetic. He has discovered the possibility of attainment of some superior felicity, unattainable except through sexual continence. And that felicity, unknown to any seeker after sensual pleasure, is partly his already. Excelli Perfect Celibacy The world over, celibacy is the key to the higher spheres of life. Higher than the most continent life, which perchance still shares in the propagation of the race, is perfect celibacy. It lies above the realm of sex and beyond the reach of all sensual influences. The attainment of the loftiest condition of existence has at all times and by all races been sought through celibacy. The nominal celibacy of those who just happen to remain unmarried or of others who are celibates under compulsion without inner conviction, that of course is not sufficient for high spiritual results. True and perfect celibacy is required, such as those who for selfish reasons or entirely against their wishes, remain single hardly ever practice, even if they do abstain from intercourse and other sexual acts. Perfect celibacy is also far from those who abstain on account of fear, or because of impotence or other pathological conditions. In these cases, abstinence is no better than that of eunuchs, a mere privation without excellency. Mere abstinence from physical sexual acts does not establish perfect celibacy. Not until the mind itself is freed from sexual disturbances and longings, not until celibacy is the expression of the striving after an ideal state, or is self-willed and freely chosen for the sake of a lofty purpose, can there be a question of perfect celibacy. The real test of the efficacy of celibacy must be whether or not the celibate actually overcomes not merely physical impulse, but all consciousness of sex differences. No one considers it unnatural to rise above these differences in intellectual contacts. In spiritual companionship, and generally at an advanced evolutionary stage, it is even more essential to have risen entirely above every attraction of sex. In a few cases the soul does not consciously have to choose or will to free itself, but seems to be born free from sex attraction, free from sensual tendencies, with a natural inclination towards the perfect celibate life. This stage of spiritual evolutionary growth has not only been demonstrated in the prominent but exceptional examples of saint and saviorship, it is also frequently found in inconspicuous persons who, in whatever circumstances they are placed, are radiating centers of purity. The hypothesis that the incarnating soul has pre-existed, and has evolved by its own efforts in other lives, is probably the only one that can explain how in every instance, even when inborn, perfect celibacy, is a result of the victory of the spirit over the body. Forty-two Race Suicide The idea that the teaching of sexual abstinence may prematurely stop die propagation of the human race is absurd. 
Solovyov Justification of the Good I-254 Let someone hint at the necessity of our curbing our passions, and immediately the cry is raised that the human race is in danger. As if anyone, in surrendering to the desire of the flesh, had ever thought of safeguarding thereby the future of humanity. And as though those who indulge in sex do not intentionally prevent issue most of the time. But there need be no fear. Nature takes pretty good care, of her racial purposes. So long as the succession of generations is necessary for the development of the human species, the taste for bringing that succession about will certainly not disappear in man, that is, not in all men. The ideal of purification of the sexual life holds not the slightest danger for the continuation of the race. For this ideal, as applicable to the majority of mankind, is not that reproduction should be stopped, but that sex should be used for reproduction only. This certainly does not entail race suicide. It does not threaten the existence of the race, but only that of animal man, and in the course of evolution he will have to disappear, just as the prehistoric animals have been extinguished. In the records of the future spiritual human race, the present animal man will only vaguely be remembered as a kind of semi-human animal, which long before that time shall have passed out of existence. No danger is entailed by the fact that always there are a few who in dedication to spiritual ends, wish to and can entirely rise above animality and above sex. For these the ideal transcends the boundaries of sex and excludes their sharing in the propagation of the race. But as long as they are few they do not in the least endanger the existence of humanity, for it is never requisite that everyone shall breed, as little as that all need till the soil in order to feed the race. A danger might be seen in the far-off possibility that those who entirely abstain from sex become so numerous as to form the great majority. But even then, if perfect celibacy were chosen by the many for the sake of spiritual evolution, this would indicate that the larger portion of the race had reached a stage above that of animal man. Should nature find that it was then becoming unpractical to continue the human species by the sexual method, she can be trusted to institute a new reproductive system, in which sex plays no part. Thus the moment when all men will finally overcome the fleshly lust and become entirely chaste, will be the end of the historical process, not necessarily the end of the human race. It may well be, however, that attainment of the fully spiritualized stage will bring mankind to the point where it can step out of the human into a higher evolutionary kingdom. That would bring about the end of humanity as such. Not by suicide, but by what may be called its natural death, death in the same sense as graduation from school, may be called the death of the pupil who thereafter, in a higher institution of learning, becomes a student. Suicidal to the race is the customary abuse of sex, because it threatens humanity with an untimely death from self-inflicted diseases. If mankind adheres to its present sexual behavior it is likely to perish by the various vicious abuses and excesses which it has used the powers of its superior reason to devise and indulge. It threatens to degenerate and to destroy itself by an abuse of the very element by which it was intended to maintain, and by transmutation to regenerate itself. There can be no question of racial suicide when humanity rises spiritually, and thereby rises above sex, and when, after attaining every purpose of human existence, it leaves the human for the supermanic life. Forty-three Woman Two. The demand for sexual abstinence on the part of both sexes is put forward with good reason. Whining o'er sex and character. 2.14.345. Man and woman are basically alike. Although differing anatomically and physiologically, their bodies are but incidental variations of one fundamental form, as is indicated by the presence of vestigial organs in each. Even the primary reproductive organs of each are in all their parts represented in the opposite sex and the secondary characteristics of each lie dormant in the opposite sex. Apart from the body, and especially in latent spiritual possibilities, man and woman are perfectly equal one with the other. From the spiritual point of view, there is no difference between woman and man. The psychological trends that appear in men and in women are not specifically masculine or feminine. There is no pure masculinity or femininity in the psychological sense. Every individual contains both in many aspects. Both sexes are represented in every individual. And in the perfect man, eternal femininity and eternal masculinity come into contact with one another, in perfect balance. Apparent dissimilarities in traits of character and of mind, 
have been caused by the differing influences to which men and women have been exposed through countless ages. In personal ways of expression men acquired all that manliness implies, and women became what is now considered to be womanly, on account of the specific social rules under which each of the sexes evolved. Men were standardized in accordance with the accepted masculine model, and women were molded to conform with the prevailing canons of femininity. Sexually man and woman both are essentially and naturally pure. In this respect it may be held that there is no difference at all. But due to the fact that woman has been more shielded from sexually stimulating factors, she has generally manifested less sensuality, and as a result, more spirituality than man. In women sexual feeling is in the majority of cases in abeyance, and requires considerable excitement to be roused at all. In, not artificially stimulated women the libido is considerably weaker than it is in men. Although there are exceptions, there can be no doubt that, the normal sexual sentiment of woman is developed in the direction of, a longing for children. For this, when not for love's sake or for gain, she has endured man's passion, almost invariably in dispassionate surrender. Originally for the sake of maternity woman has focused her attention on attracting and pleasing the male. So intense has been this effort to attract him that from a means it has become an end in itself, while the racial purpose behind it has been neglected, and has become nearly obsolete. And while concentrating on man's, physical demands woman has retarded her further spiritual unfoldment. Still, woman is generally in spirituality superior to man. And morally the general superiority of woman over man is unquestionable. She can retain this twofold superiority as long as she does not begin to yearn for, and to indulge in sense gratification. But in recent times, many women have been led to regard sexual expression as a symbol of new freedom, and to desire it as a supposed mode of self-expression. They might change their modern viewpoint if they but knew that they have been led to their new attitude by a treacherous ruse of man. Modern Woman's Magna Carta was written by man. Under male debauched inspiration modern emancipated woman has extended the bounds of feminism. When woman began to assert her right to physical and social independence, and to break the thraldom of her sex, man saw the imminent danger of his loss of power over her. He came to a conscious or subconscious realization that the increasing intelligence of woman was removing from his grasp those superficial shallower female ministrations which he desires. Having to reckon with her growing mental faculties, he had to find new means of inveigling her into a continued compliance to his desires. And so, through screen and stage and print, he has assailed the more dignified attitude of woman towards sex. He has made morality seem ridiculous, faithfulness foolish, chastity a superstition, sex a compelling power. And by encouraging in her the use of the same stimulating factors that have overexcited him, including nicotine and alcoholic drinks, he has made her more receptive to the suggestion that his grosser desires are also hers. In his own interests man has invented various doctrines, which he has persuaded many women to believe. One of these man-made doctrines is a new system of psychology, which inculcates the idea that health and happiness can only be attained by giving free rein to supposedly natural impulses. Through this ultramodern psychosophistry, he has threatened her with imaginary dangers of neuroses of sickliness and wretchedness, if she does not yield to his amorous entreaties. And two, he has pretended to encourage her in her demand for equal rights with him. He has suggested that she as well as he shall have the right to live and love. And what is meant by this suggestion is, plainly, that she too seeks sexual experiences, probatively, promiscuously and prophylactically, but above all not propagatively. So specious and confusing have been man's methods of persuasion that woman has often been convinced. Undoubtedly in the end she will discover, through the painful method of trial and error, that the fewer her sex experiments the greater her ultimate well-being, spiritually as well as physically. Meantime, instead of lifting man to her own purer, higher level, she is descending toward his. Therefore an exhortation to sexual purity is now not being written for men only, but for women too for those at least who value health and happiness, if not for themselves then for the sake of the children which may be theirs, and especially for those who value spiritual growth. The process of spiritualization is the same for woman as it is for man. For both one of the first requirements for spiritual unfoldment is to rise above all sensual, and above all unproductive sexual expression. Thus only can one elude the cause of pain and sorrow, and reach spiritual power. Forty-four a single standard. 
The double standard of morals is wholly indefensible from the biological as from every other point of view. Popano, Problems of Reproduction Patriarchy and matriarchy each has occasionally prevailed in the course of evolution. Now the males, then the females have been dominant. Whenever either of the two sexes has wielded dictatorial authority, it has established a double standard of morals, one of license for itself, and one of inhibition for the subordinate sex. Because for many ages male rule has been supreme much of our feeling on this subject is due to laws and moral systems which were formed by men and were in the first place intended to shield them and their libertinism. Under the moral code that was contrived by men women have been regarded as inferior creatures. And they have contentedly accepted the status assigned to them. They have failed to resent masculine immorality. But in the ascendancy of their emancipation women begin to realize that duplex sexual morality is an ethic of injustice, of mendacity and of hypocrisy, and that it is the acme of immorality. By the disenthrallment of womanhood from sexual bondage, the double standard of sex ethics is doomed. One standard of morality must be established for men and women. The question is which standard is to be adopted. Women may be granted like sexual freedoms to those which men possess, or the rigid canons of sexual behavior, which are already imposed upon women may be imposed upon men also. Both these trends are conspicuously in evidence today. If woman insists on stepping into the ways of man, complete racial degeneration will undoubtedly follow. For she supplies almost entirely the elements out of which the succeeding generation is formed. The chastity of the mothers of the race in the past has helped to at least partly offset the damaging results of male unchastity and has so far prevented the complete breakdown of the race. Only if man adopts the chastity which used to be so highly praised in woman, regeneration of the race will become possible. In the period of transition from the double standard to a single symptoms of lack of balance and of flagrant extremes are bound to manifest. Every revolutionary movement drives a large contingent of the emotional and of the ignorant to indiscriminate, impassioned, ruinous acts. The successful revolt of woman for emancipation has been helpful in the approach to a single standard. But in many cases women's new freedom is a rather smudgy carbon copy of man's petty vices. Too often the demanded equality has become equality in lust and passion. Emancipation has grown into licentiousness. If women want to perfect their emancipation, they will have to impose their higher standards on men, rather than accept the lower standards, which they rightly use to deprecate in men. For the sake of woman's cause there is a need of, a woman-made code of sex morality, on which the women of the future will act for their own protection, and for the protection of children, and on which they will therefore require men to act. The task will assuredly not be accomplished by women copying men's sexual soullessness, but by the rule of chastity, becoming generally enforced in practice through the refusal of women to be parties to its violation. In the end, the double standard of sex morality can be removed not by the revolt of woman, but by the restraint of man. When a lasting and uplifting single standard is established the morality of men will be judged by the same standard as the morality of women. Men will be forced to place a curb upon their passions and learn to exercise control. Ultimately chastity will be the ideal for men as well as for women. Man must be made to see that the woman's cause is man's, they rise or sink together, dwarfed or godlike, bond or free. He should understand that, in delivering her he also delivers himself. And in order to deliver her, he must free himself of sex, for in that way only can he free woman. In his purity lies her salvation. The most valid reason why man should not be inferior to woman in sexual purity is that the racial interest requires from him the same strict chastity as from the woman. Strict female chastity was originally demanded in the interest of posterity, the interest of posterity requires the same strict chastity in the man, in him it exacts the great chastity of paternity, to match the great chastity of maternity. A logical, ethical, noble single standard must necessarily be one of strict chastity for all. The single standard can never be one of equal rights. Rights are too often conflicting. Rights can only be upheld at the cost of inequality. The ideal single standard will have to be one of equal duties, of equally shared racial responsibility, rather than of equal rights. As long as physiological differences between the sexes exist, there can be no perfect sexual equality. But there can be and there must be for male and female equally a perfect liberty, not of but from sexual expression, except in dedicated loving service to the race. 
By accepting this standard of liberty for herself, and by enjoining it upon man, woman can finally and gloriously win her real emancipation. Adoption of the single standard of equal purity will automatically bring about not only woman's social and mental, and man's moral emancipation, but also the spiritual emancipation of both. Forty-five Freedom We are not free agents so long as we are on the rack of sex. Comfort Public Square The members of the younger generation are in open moral revolt, not quite without some justifiable reasons. They have discovered the undeniable fact that their predecessors and preceptors have run the business of life unto the brink of ruin, that bombastic and dogmatic sham and bigotry have begun to characterize the rules by which that business is conducted, and that under the polished surface of the structure in which life's business is carried on, dry rot from pretense prudery, cant and hypocrisy has developed. The elders who for so long have been the sacred guardians of civilization, have bungled their task abominably. As a result, the young people have an inkling that once precious assets have been squandered or neglected, so that little of value seems to be left over for the succeeding generation. The pity however is that they are trying to take charge before having acquired the necessary preparatory knowledge and the ability to do better than their elders. What they desire is freedom in their own ways of running life, although their own ways proper are decidedly improper. Blind are they to the fact that life is more than a childish having our own way than an indulgence of our whims and passions. It is not merely a list of opportunities for self-satisfaction, but a set of obligations for realizing spiritual good. Life is not made happy, by getting what we happen to want, neither by wantonness, but by seeking what can make us lastingly happy. Young people overlook the fact that liberty does not consist in taking liberties, nor in libertinism. They seem quite unaware that freedom must be won, by an incalculable discipline of the intellectual and moral powers, that only he is free, who has controlled his passion, and that we can know no freedom so long as we are slaves of the senses. We only reach absolute liberty, when we have the greatest authority over ourselves. Freedom from all restraint is what modern youth is fighting for, forgetting that it is restraint which characterizes the higher creature and betters the lower. Any constraint put upon impulse, desire passion, and any limitation of caprice and self-will, is regarded as a fettering of freedom. But we should look upon such limitation as the indispensable proviso of emancipation, instead of adhering to that false and misleading doctrine of freedom, which encourages our lower inclinations to run riot, while allowing our higher nature to pass into decay. The desire for freedom may become a source of antagonism to culture, and such so-called freedom, is liable to become the occasion for all imaginable excesses. It is under the influence of false teachings about freedom that in impassioned frenzy the rampageous revolters tear down whatever they consider an obstruction, barriers of decency, pillars of man-made laws and warning, signposts of the wisdom of the ages. Finally they crash into, and meet disaster for themselves in venturing to break up, the adamantine monuments of nature's own great laws. As in all previous premature revolts of untrained rebels the feasting and ravaging will go on until all are exhausted, their vital energies spent. Either they will wake up and realize their errors, or the task of clearing up the ruins will fall upon another generation. Intact under the ruins will then be found the long discarded treasure that has been known, and remembered always by just a very few, the treasure metaphorically consisting of the indestructible tablets on which are inscribed the manifestos of eternal spiritual laws. Only by studying those laws and by living in accordance, by becoming all at one with them can freedom be attained. By asserting once more the dominion of spirit over matter and of spiritual freedom over animal slavery, the soul learns that in the life of the spirit only is true liberty. Forty-six Crime The greatest cause of crimes is lust Plato laws. Crime as determined by passion is forced upon the attention of moralist and magistrate, by the large number of active and passive victims, for which it is responsible. Sexual immorality, is a most prolific source of crimes. Definitely sexual crimes are amongst the saddest phenomena of modern criminality, everywhere court dockets bear out the tale with murders for lust, and other crimes of jealousy and perversion. And indirectly too, in a more general sense the viciousness and crimes so prevalent in this day, are the logical harvest springing out of the unnatural sex relations of our artificial civilization. 
Considering that by far most of humanity's sexual acts are inherently unnatural and perverse, it is no wonder that the harvest in the form of crime is steadily increasing. With both men and women's sex as an immediate excitant to crime, is acknowledged to serve in much the same way as alcohol serves as an excitant to sex interest. Stirred beyond control, the fire of sexual lust kindles every species of wantonness. There is no criminal purpose and no evil deed, which the lust for carnal pleasure will not drive a person to undertake. Already in adolescent delinquency a strong connection between sensuality and crime is evident. The criminal habit commences in most young people, with illicit sexual indulgence. And experts have found sexual precocity characteristic of young criminals. All this adds force to the conclusion to which philosophers have come, namely that the lust for sexual excitement is the greatest ill of all one, and that concupiscence is the root of all evil. What humanity has made of the sexual urge by abuse and overstimulation undoubtedly constitutes the basic origin of most of the misery that oppresses mankind. Were concupiscence brought back within the limits of its natural purpose of racial preservation, there would be far less crime, because the greatest incentive would be lacking. Certainly, it is time that law enforcement gave more attention to the close correlation of sex and crime. Most people, of course, feel themselves far beyond the possibility of committing or of being accessories to the commitment of any crime. Yet, few are entirely free from sharing in the guilt of those who perpetrate sexual crimes. Part of the guilt falls on all who foster erotic thoughts and cherish passional emotions. It has become a platitude to say that thoughts are things, and hardly anyone seems to take it very seriously that also passional emotions create a variety of thought forms. Yet it seems only logical that every little thought or emotion sends out a vibratory wave, which links up with others of its own nature. They reinforce each other until very powerful blocks of emotion forms are floating about, and a person may readily be influenced by them. Thus it appears to be literally true that sensuality hangs over humanity like a heavy funereal pall, which is ready at any moment to pounce on the unwary and inject its poison into their emotional organism. All who are receptive, the young, the weak of character, the sensually sensitive, the criminally inclined, they all are dangerously exposed to the influence of the accumulated terrible thought forms to which many a self-righteous person has contributed a far from negligible share. In essence the merest erotic thinking is apt to contribute to somebody's criminal delinquency, which makes the thinker of sensual thoughts an instigator of crime. Considering this, one may well come to the conclusion that, in so far as moral responsibility is concerned, it is one of the greatest crimes to indulge in sexual sensuality. Forty-seven. The Altruism of Ethics As an ethical being man is naturally superior to passion. Kaiserling Book of Marriage The foundation of ethics is others-mindedness. Though often considered to be the equivalent of morality, ethics is strictly only that part of applied morality which in every act shows due consideration of others. It is the result of a recognition that each is but an integral part of the whole, and that therefore the true interests of others are identical with one's own. It is an expression, though as a rule an unconscious one, of the inner spiritual knowledge of the oneness of all life. If humanity is to build a better world out of the present conditions, the ideal that regulates the new world must be an ethical one. And in order to be truly ethical it must be altruistic, it must in every action give foremost consideration to the well-being of others. Its final test must be the total welfare and progress of society. Along with the application of ethical principles in other fields, a new and better sexual ethic is indispensable. It too, must be based on the interests of others, and this can be attained in one way only. The sexual impulse must be subordinated to the welfare of society, through the cultivation of inhibition. Therefore increasing inhibition of the lower centers by the higher and diminishing sexual passion, must play a strong part in determining conduct in the future. Thus alone can ethics become manifest in the sexual life of mankind. Any so-called ethics, which does not recognize the necessity of putting restraint upon naive desire is inherently absurd. After all, in the sexual domain as in every other field, the true interests of the individual and of the race are identical. For if man controls his desires for the sake of higher social motives, he himself rises in the scale of being. A consistent practice of inhibition of the sex impulse for ethical reasons leads toward individual and social evolutionary perfection at the same time. 
If we all so ordered our conduct that it should be in harmony with the destiny of mankind, the highest perfection would be attained. To approach this ideal state each must make such a contribution of his own, that if all contributed similarly the result would be perfection. But whenever a sensual impulse is permitted to influence thoughts and acts ethics is forgotten. Then the singular violence of amorous passion can lead to forgetfulness of the most sacred duties. All the indecencies of life have arisen as a result of this. At such times even the idealistically inclined often do not find it necessary to introduce higher ideals into their lives. To be effective under all circumstances ethics must be based on a view of life which emphasizes the spiritual power of man over mere impulse, a view in which the spiritual element is cultivated and practiced. The popular idea that sexual behavior is exclusively one's private affair is antagonistic to the very principle of ethics. The popular idea that sexual behavior is exclusively one's private affair is antagonistic to the very principle of ethics. Every sexual act touches the interests of society and of the race. Even whether or not directly harming another person, even whether or not fomenting and spreading disease, sexual activity is always intrinsically not just one's own but a racial affair. When the act is purely propagative the interests of the individual to be born, and thereby of coming generations, are evidently involved. In every other case sexual activity, in whatever form it may manifest, is an expression of sensual self-gratification, and as such is detrimental to the race. Every individual who claims the liberty to use the reproductive energy merely for his own pleasure spreads in society the germs of disorder. For a terrible interrelation joins that suppose private action to the most distant events in the social life. To divert the generative power into channels for personal gratification is detrimental to the race for this reason, also that it interferes with the spiritual development of the acting individual. Humanity can advance in its evolution only if the separate units progress. Hence to impede individual evolution in effect hampers the evolution of humanity. On this basis too, Sexual behavior proves to be by no means only one's private affair, but a matter of racial importance. For all these reasons every sexual act that is devoid of propagative intention, being inconsiderate of the best interests of humanity, is preeminently lacking in altruism and is unethical. If we want to be ethical our duty towards ourselves and the interest of humanity demand that we should have no passion. Many may consider this an extremist view. But ethics insists on the extreme. It is a hard ethic, you say, but only so can we cease to be beasts and begin to be gods. Forty-eight Supreme Morality The moral law must be the expression of supreme purity. Kant, Lectures on Ethics, 66 Changing with times and climes moral codes have fluctuated like fashions, customs and conventions. But all these varying arbitrary and relatively moral codes have made allowances for human shortcomings and limitations. They are merely distant semblances of an absolute, unvarying standard. There is a universal moral law, as universal and immutable as that of gravitation. It contains the standard of moral perfection. Only if the foundation of our actions is that they shall be consistent with the universal rule, which is valid at all times and for everyone, then our conduct has its source in the principle of true morality. The absolute moral law is for eternity engraved in the scrolls of spirit, not as an imposed command, but as a statement of facts in nature. To have access to these scrolls one must needs be spiritually evolved. Those who had reached that stage have always demonstrated the absolute moral law in their own lives, and many of them have tried to render the canons of this law, in as simple lucid terms as human language permits, in order that others might know the way to spiritual attainment. Based on nature's immutable laws, the principles of morality are axioms like those of geometry. These moral axioms can be condensed into one phrase, the need of purification, leading to faultless purity. In order to advance in harmony with evolution, and to grow spiritually, it is necessary to follow the principles of supreme morality in every respect. But in the realm of sex particularly great stress must be laid on the necessity of purification, because the spiritual in us is so overcome, so overweighted by the animal. The human constitution as it exists today, containing a large animal element, cannot furnish the basis of rational morality. Therefore, in practice morality should be based not on human nature in its existing vitiated condition, but on human nature ideal, as it may be in the future. 
essentially the moral task of man is spiritualization. To be effective, morality must work so, that in everything the realm of the spirit may be increased, because in that direction lies the evolutionary perfectibility of human nature. While striving after morality we are at the same time battling for our own spiritual self, for a complete self-consciousness of the spiritual life is attained first in morality, in a morality far above the common standard. No dabbling in halfway measures, which cater to personal deficiencies, can bring results. Unavoidably, in order to become spiritual, man must unfailingly apply the absolute moral law, for the truly spiritual man cannot be any moral man, if he were he would kill his spiritual life. Until spirituality has been gained, life is a never-ceasing duel between the animal impulse and morality. A heavy struggle sometimes. But any system of morality which accommodates itself to what is easy for man to do corrupts the perfection of humanity. Even for everyday existence the moral law must be, the law in obedience to which perfection consists. If there is to be any moral progress, the lower must be forced to give way to the higher. The moral principle, contradicts the passions and serves to check them. With regard to the corporeal life our moral task consists in not being passively determined by fleshly desires. Morality, demands actual struggle with the flesh. All such statements as just quoted are not arbitrarily conceived. They are only the practical expression of absolute moral law. Every breaking of that law, in other words, every act that is not perfectly pure, is spiritual suicide. Forty-nine laws. The supreme law can be known only when the ego has disentangled itself from the enticements of sex. We are all held fast and guided, not only in our physical but also our moral lives, by immutable laws. Law rules the universe. Macrocosm and microcosm, the invisible and the visible, the spiritual and the material worlds are definitely bound by nature's all-embracing laws. In the lower kingdoms natural law rules unprotested. The minerals as all matter, are subject to physical laws, most of which science has discovered and analyzed. In the vegetable kingdom the laws of life work automatically. In the animal kingdom nature's moral law finds unopposed expression through instinct. It is only in the human kingdom that the laws of nature are militated against by man's self-sufficiency and by the predominance of his desires over the mind. The primitive races have kept at least a few remnants of nature's higher laws as an instinctive basis for their distorted rules of taboo. But with an increasingly selfish use of the developing mind, mind itself has been subjugated and chained to matter, and this has caused the civilized races to become more and more blinded to the moral law of nature. Particularly blinding in this way is the enslavement of mind and body to the allurement of sex. Man seems to think that he is free to use the sexual function in any way he wants. He reasons like an outlaw who imagines that no law applies to him, and that he is free to take whatever he may want, so long as he is not caught. But results will somehow ultimately show that one cannot with impunity evade or break the laws, least of all nature's laws, because their application is automatic and inexorable. All of nature's moral and spiritual laws have been pushed into the background of human consciousness and have been replaced by man-made legislation, which expresses only the temporary moral standard of not yet highly evolved majorities. However, the eternal moral order cannot be cancelled by civil laws. Civil laws have their useful place in the scheme of evolution. With humanity as it is, social life would be impossible without civil codes and laws. And where the many are more amenable to compulsion, then to moral ideals, the rules laid down by legislation serve as a preparation for a higher morality. Where the conscious touch with nature's laws is lacking the man-made, lenient laws, which are framed to meet the weakness of human character, can serve temporarily as substitute moral guides. But since these substitutes are not but changeable makeshifts, and are of unreliable strength, they cannot be accepted as dependable permanent guides. The best that can be expected as an immediate effect of civil laws is to keep within the bounds of decency those who are still sub-moral. But as a standard of true morality, such laws are quite inadequate. Anyhow true morality cannot be legislated into a person, it cannot be enforced by civil law. By means of laws and regulations, ye cannot make them chaste that are not thither so. Man-made laws have never yet supplanted animality. Morality is a function of the human soul, it is not inculcated from without. Man has it primarily within himself. True morality must grow from within, 
concurrent with spiritual unfoldment. The moral law that lies at the center of nature can be understood only from within. By seeking to understand that law and by living up to its high standard one can outgrow the outer civil laws. But one will never violate them then. All who evade and violate civil laws prove by this very act that they are still sub-moral. Real morality consists in strict obedience to nature's highest spiritual laws. Obedience to nature's laws includes the practice of obedience to man-made laws, because it is impossible to violate a civil law without also violating some universal ethical or moral principle. And though one may succeed in escaping legal punishment, it is not possible to evade nature's retribution. Those who have really outgrown the need of civil laws have also outgrown every inclination to violate human laws as much as nature's laws. Nature will permit no violations of her laws, even though nations must perish in order to uphold them. Therefore we must all strenuously seek to live in accordance with nature, or else inevitably suffer disaster. In regard to the sexual life we must remember that chastity is the law of nature. In order to rise out of degradation, misery, poverty and ruin, the individual must come to a clear understanding of this law. Instead of wasting the life force and sex sensations, this energy should be used in idealistic, constructive ability. In order to progress on the path of evolution man, must re-establish the link with spirit by consciously bringing his physical as well as his mental life into harmony with nature's fundamental laws, for, that which links spirit to matter, is the laws of nature. L. Taboos Chastity forms part of the rules, known as taboo. Crawley, Studies of Savages and Sex in strong contrast to the spreading lack of chastity among the more or less civilized portion of humanity, the savage may be said to possess a natural chastity. Where he has lost this, the sexual depravity of savage races most often arises from the influences of civilized people. In territories inhabited by natives who are not yet contaminated by association with civilization and degraded by contact with white peoples, explorers have found that some tribes who are in other respects among the lowest are in this respect among the highest. They discovered that primitive man on the whole is more moral than civilized man. Outstanding is the fact that the majority of barbarous peoples emphasize prenuptial chastity as an ideal. For instance, in Borneo prenuptial intercourse was forbidden by the hill dyaks, in Nyas both seducer and seduced were put to death. In some of the independent tribes in the interior of the Philippine Islands chastity is held in great honor, and is protected by very severe laws. In Australia promiscuous intercourse between the sexes is not practiced by the aborigines, and their laws on the subject are very strict. Before the advent of the whites, it was almost death to a young man to have intercourse before being married. The Sulka in New Britain believe that sexual intercourse pollutes both men and women, married as well as unmarried. They who have lived among the Tasmanians, speak with respect of their purity. One chastity was highly regarded by the Basudos and the Bakewains in Africa, where the Nandi say that people are dirty when they have had sexual intercourse. In Ceylon among the Vedas, girls are protected with the keenest sense of honor. By the Bados and Dimals of India chastity is prized in man and woman, married and unmarried. Among the Cambodians strict chastity seems to prevail, and if we cross the Himalayas to the north, we find ourselves among wild people to whom sexual license is unknown. It cannot be denied that conditions of sexual depravity have been found in places where it could not possibly have been introduced by the white man. It would be strange if this were not the case. For even low tribes possess enough mind to be able to overstimulate and misdirect their sexual impulse. All in all, however, there is plenty of evidence to show that the importance, even sacredness of procreation is much more generally recognized by savage than by civilized peoples 18, and that primitive customs are generally chaste. In the case of the lowest savages, who seem still very close to the state of the animal kingdom, we may speak of an instinct for chastity. Their mind hardly awakened, they remain unconsciously dependent on the directions of nature's intelligence. Undoubtedly their chastity is a survival of an inborn and still instinctive obedience to the laws of nature. They are yet not spoiled by a wrong use of the mind. With those at a slightly more advanced stage instinct has been replaced by the unwritten law of taboo. And by taboo the sexuality of primitive man seems to be more strictly circumscribed than it is in higher levels of civilization. Not only does one meet with taboos against fornication and adultery, 
but in certain physiological crises, a woman must not be approached by a man. And the extremely widespread habit of avoiding intercourse during pregnancy and suckling is an admirable precaution in sexual hygiene. Also, many savages have made it a rule to refrain from sexual intercourse in time of war, and even before a fighting, harpooning or hunting expedition. In several tribes during such expeditions, also, the people who remain at home must observe strict chastity. Then again, a practice of abstinence from fleshly lusts has been observed by various peoples as a sympathetic charm to foster the growth of the crops. The facility with which the savage places these checks on sexual intercourse bears witness to the weakness of the sexual impulse. That impulse is inherently weak in the natural state, in civilization it is strong only because it has been unnaturally and unduly overstimulated. In many rules of taboo it is evident that savages esteem chastity for its value as a method of self-control which contributes towards the attainment of important ends. This is an attitude which civilization has lost, but necessarily must regain. The latest, most extensive ethnological investigations show conclusively that always there is a close relation between sexual opportunity and cultural condition. The societies where prenuptial continence is not imposed, and where the opportunities for sexual indulgence after marriage are greatest, exhibit the least amount of energy. In other words, the more restraint, the greater the energy available for the attainment of higher cultural conditions. This applies not only to savages, but to civilized man as well. The energy created by sexual restraint is the motive power which makes it possible for us to conceive desirable ends and to think out the means for realizing them. Whether, according to the individual's evolutionary progression, the sought for ends be of a physical, of a mental, or of a spiritual nature, increased restraint increases the obtainable results. Among many people's persons whose function it is to perform religious rites must be celibates. Westermark, Ethical Relativity from the primitive savage, kneeling before some supposedly sacred tree or holy stone, thrilled with the thought that somewhere at the back of created matter vibrates a force beyond his knowing, down to the great faiths of today, men have understood a reality behind the shifting panorama of nature. And they have ever tried to discover means of contacting that reality beyond material forms beyond matter, the reality that can only be found in the formless realm of spirit. Religion is the attempt to approach spirit, but spirit can only be reached when religion is freed from routine form. Of essential interest therefore are not the differences in rituals and dogmas of the different religions, but the points of agreement of their underlying principles. And of these one of the most striking in the teachings of practically all religions is the recognition of sexual purity as a prerequisite for conscious contact with the unknown force with spirit. Even in primitive society chastity is enjoined on solemn occasions. It is a common rule that he who performs a sacred act must be ceremonially clean, and no kind of uncleanness is more carefully to be avoided than sexual pollutions. It is almost generally believed that an act regarded as sacred would, if performed by an unclean individual, lack that efficacy which would otherwise be ascribed to it. Abundant evidence to support these last remarks has been found in numberless tribes, in many parts of the world. In southern India the priests of the Todas must be celibate while in office. On the South Sea Islands the Skaga of the Haidas refrains from sexual intercourse, the Marquesan candidate for the priesthood had to be chased for some years beforehand, in effort sexual uncleanness was especially avoided by sacred men, as it destroyed their sacredness, and the Tahitians seemed so convinced of the spiritualizing power of continence that they had a doctrine to the effect that if a man refrained from all connection with women some months before death, he passes immediately into his eternal mansion, as if already, by his abstinence, he were pure enough to be exempted from the general lot. In Africa, among the Chi people's candidates for religious offices, are trained for two or three years, during this period the novices, must refrain from all commerce with the other sex. In Lower Guinea we are told of a priest king, who is not allowed to so much as touch a woman, while even the cook of the priest king of Angoy, was expected to keep himself pure. But the strongest and strangest instance of belief in the influence of continence was met with in the Congo, where when the supreme pontiff left his residence to visit other places within his jurisdiction, all the people had to observe strict continence the whole time he was out, for it was supposed that any act of incontinence on their part would prove fatal to him. Lee Aboriginal Religion 
In North America, the Shawnee Indian had a great respect for certain persons who observed celibacy, and the Thlinkets believe that if a shaman does not observe continuous chastity, his own guardian spirit will kill him. In Mexico, any incontinence amongst the priests was severely punished. The priest who was convicted of having violated his chastity was delivered up to the people who killed him. In Ichgatlan, the high priest was obliged to abstain from commerce with any woman whatsoever, and if he unluckily failed, he was certain of being tom in pieces. Especially among the Maya nations of Central America, celibacy was held in high esteem. The natives of the Isthmus had a priesthood sworn to perpetual celibacy. In Guatemala, the Tohil priests were vowed to perpetual continence 18, and among the Chichas of Bogota, the priests were not allowed to marry. Sometimes strict continence was required of others, outside the priesthood. For instance, the manufacturers of the new Yucatan idols had to preserve their continence during the process. Also in Yucatan, they had two war captains, one of whom was chosen for a term of three years. During these years, he could know no woman, and the Chichen Itza kings lived in strict celibacy. Again, in Zapotecapan it was incumbent upon the pontiff of Ipa to be a shining light of chastity for the guidance of those who looked up to him, while priests of a lower order, added also to the credit of their profession by the excessive rigor with which they guarded their chastity, a glance or a sign which might be construed into a carnal desire was punished as criminal, and those who showed by their actions a strong disposition to violate their vow were relentlessly castrated. Some of these instances may be exaggerated and fanatical expressions of the conviction that continence is indispensable to the development of spiritual power. In our materialistic age nearly everybody is inclined to apply to all that has been said the banal epithet of superstition, which is so commonly used to decry anything that one does not, and does not want to understand. But does not this recurrence of a high regard, and a religious demand for chastity by so many different peoples in the most diverse parts of the world, suggest that something more than superstition must be its fundamental cause? Even if, the institutions in question have been based partly on superstition, it by no means follows that they have never been based on anything else. On the contrary, there is a strong presumption that they rest mainly on something much more solid than superstition. The only logical basis for the universal religious valuation of chastity lies in nature's law that yielding to the senses prevents all contact with spirit. Apparently those who originally laid down the rules for even the most primitive aboriginal religious usages were acquainted with the fact that sensuality so coarsens the vibrations of the body as to exclude the finer vibrations of spirit. Therefore they already taught what humanity still seems loath to learn namely, that the animal fife in man must be subordinated to the spiritual. Fifty-two Sacerdotal Celibacy the lusts of the flesh are particularly weakening to him who would give all his attention to the things of spirit, Papini, life of Christ. Religion in any form, even when disguised almost beyond recognition, is essentially a means of spiritualizing man, of bringing him closer to spirit. Where the individual is not capable of establishing a direct connection with spirit, some other person, from a medicine man to an ecclesiastic, is depended on to aid and to act as mediator. It is presupposed, of course, that such an intermediary himself is already closely linked to spirit. Therefore he should be expected to show in his daily life that he has freed himself from the domination of matter and from sensuous appetites. Recognizing that perfect mortification of passions makes a true religious man, there has usually been a demand for sexual purity in those who minister to the people's religious wants. This demand has been met even among native tribes, quite independent of the great world religions. Indeed, it seems to be but the expression of a universal principle that also in the leading religions of cultured humanity, or the more recent epoch, Buddhism and Christianity, religious celibacy is enjoined, with a view to raising the spiritual nature by suppressing one of the strongest sensual appetites. In Buddhism this rule of celibacy has been successfully maintained, except in later sects on foreign soil. It is asserted of the Buddhist priest that having put aside the habit and thought of sexual intercourse, his life is pure. In such old Buddhistic countries as Burma popular opinion is inflexible and inexorable on the point of celibacy, the people can never be brought to look upon any person as a priest or minister of religion, unless he live in that state. The law of celibacy is observed with a great scrupulosity, and a breach of it is a rare occasion. In Christianity sacerdotal, celibacy has been one of the most disputed problems. 
It had already been a subject of stirring controversy long before Protestants, so drastically turned against it in protest against abuses. Unfortunately, instead of attacking and correcting the abuses, they have repudiated the meritoriousness of celibacy itself. But abuses are no proof that the principle which is being abused is wrong. Abuses and exaggerations naturally accompany such a great and difficult attempt to elevate man above himself. The more sublime a doctrine is, the more it is exposed to abuse at the hands of human nature. Every part of this book tends to confirm that by sexual gratification one renders himself unfit for spiritual things, unfit therefore to be another's spiritual guide. Only perfect celibates can truly and effectively aid others in reaching up to spirit, and even then only if their celibacy is freely chosen, an outcome of their own inner conviction. Then, strengthening their own spiritual element, their purity is the elevation on which human nature culminates. To become ever more spiritual by outgrowing all carnal desires, that is the purpose of religious attainment, not only for ecclesiastics but for every single individual. Fifty-three Vestal Virgins Fire being incorrupt, the chastest of all mortal things, must look after the fire. Fire stands in every philosophical and religious system, as a representation of the spirit. Therefore fire has been worshipped, flames have been kept on altars, if only by burning candles, and perpetual fires have been tended in temples as a symbol of keeping alive the power of spirit. In most places the care of such sacred fires was entrusted to consecrated virgins, symbolizing the fact that sexual purity is essential in keeping the spiritual fire within man burning. The ancients universally held virginity as a transcendental, mysterious something, which exercised power supernaturally. Wherever virgin priestesses lived, they were distinguished by extraordinary influence and personal dignity. They were treated with marks of respect usually accorded to royalty. In Rome Numa built a temple to Vesta and appointed virgins to be her priestesses, under a necessity of continuing unmarried. If they suffered themselves to be debauched, they were delivered up to the most shameful and the most miserable death. Five even before Numa's time at Alba, there was an ancient temple of the goddess Vesta, and besides her virgins there were Junos at the town of Achaia, and Apollos amongst the Delphians, and Minervas in some places. The worship of Diana in her sacred grove at Nemi was of immemorial antiquity, her holy fire, tended by virgins, burned perpetually in a temple within the precinct. Scattered over Greece were shrines ministered at by virgins, best known of these has always been the temple at Delphi, where the prophetess entirely gives herself up to a divine spirit, and is illuminated with a ray of divine fire, and where only virgin maidens were consecrated to the service of the oracle. Also in other parts of Europe vestals have existed. At Kildare in Ireland the nuns of St. Bridget were in charge of a perpetual holy fire, in the island of Sina off the coast of Brittany, there was an oracle of a Gallic deity whose worship was cared for by virgin priestesses, and in Lithuania there seemed to have been holy fires that were looked after by virgins. In some other parts of the world, the worshippers turned to the sun as the solar system's central fire, in which they saw the manifestation of spirit. Connected with their worship, too, were consecrated virgins. For instance, in ancient Persia there were sun priestesses, who were obliged to refrain from intercourse with men, and in Yucatan existed an order of vestals, whose duty was to tend the sacred fire, the emblem of the sun, and to keep strictly chaste. Particularly esteemed among the Incas of Peru, was the perpetual virginity which women observed in many conventual houses, these virgins were dedicated to the sun. There was a law for the nun who should transgress this rule of life, that she should be buried alive, and that her accomplice should be strangled, this was the law, but no one ever transgressed it. And besides those who professed perpetual virginity in the monasteries, there were many women of the blood royal who led the same life in their own houses, these women were held in great veneration for their purity. Also in Mexico women, took care of the sacred fires. Nothing was more zealously guarded than the chastity of these virgins. Any trespass was unpardonable. Thus in civilizations of a fairly advanced order a reverence for perfect chastity was frequently found, proving again that it seems to be an integral part of man's spiritual nature. The homage paid to Vestals everywhere was an expression of the intuitive recognition of the great significance of unimpaired virginity, as a means of linking up with spirit. Only an overculture of the senses as providers of stimuli for sensual gratification, has gradually caused an ever greater disregard of sexual purity, and has cut most of humanity off from any contact with the spiritual part of their own inner nature.
Live Virgin Births. The idealization of virginity may be observed in the stories of supernatural birth. Crawley, Studies of Savages and Sex. Everywhere heroes of extraordinary achievement or extraordinary qualities have been of extraordinary birth. Especially those spiritual giants who are looked upon as saviors are almost without exception said not to have been born like ordinary men, but from virgins. The birth story of Jesus has, and had had before his era, its parallels in traditions of other religions and in legends of many peoples. The oldest recorded tale of Immaculate Conception is about Sri Krishna, this first of the messiahs, this eldest of the sons of God, of whom it is told that he was born of the virgin Devaki who, seeing herself overshadowed by the spirit of the universe, conceived the divine child. About the Buddha the belief soon sprang up that he had no earthly father, the opinion is authoritatively handed down that Buddha had his birth through a virgin, on her, descended the spirit and entered her womb. The Siamese likewise had a savior called Kodam, who was virgin-born. Another instance in Persia, is the begetting of Zoroaster through the drinking of Homa juice, infused with his guardian spirit. And in China the Xing Mu or Holy Mother, conceived and bore a son while yet a virgin. The infant became a great man and performed miracles. A similar story is told in regard to Lotza. Apollonius was also born of a virgin mother according to the stories that were recorded of him during and shortly after his time. Even Plato was reputed by his followers to have been born of a virgin. Among spiritual teachers and leaders on the American continent is the Aztec Quetzalcoatl, he who was born of the virgin Chachawitzli, to whom the Lord of Existence appeared and breathed upon her, thereby quickening life within her. Similarly the ancient mentor of the Mexicans, Huitzilopochtli is said to have been miraculously brought forth by a woman who perceived a ball of feathers floating down to her through the air, taking which she found herself pregnant. And of Montezuma, divine priest, prophet, leader and legislator of the Pueblo cities of New Mexico, the legend tells how he was immaculately conceived by a drop of dew falling on the breast of his mother. In almost endless variety such stories of miraculous conception are also related in connection with less spiritual but nationally idolized and idealized heroes. In popular legend and folklore, it is almost incumbent on the hero to be born in such an abnormal manner. The Romans believed that the founders of their city and race were the offspring of the virgin Ilia. They also claimed that the mother of their king Serius Tullius conceived by a phantom, when alone in the room in which a miraculous manifestation had been seen to take place, and that the mother of Julius Caesar conceived him miraculously in a temple of Apollo. The emperor Alexander likewise was conceived by a virgin. Cyrus king of Persia was believed to have been of divine origin. So was the birth of the famous Genghis Khan ascribed to the glance of a divine or quasi-divine being. In Ireland both Conchobar and Cochulain were of supernatural birth, while in Bogota Gasheda was a virgin who brought forth Garanchika, a famous chief. Fo Hai, the founder of the Chinese Empire, was the child of a virgin, who ate a certain flower. The Finnish hero who became king and master of Karyala was born from Mariata, virgin mother of the Northland. In a very similar way, the American Indian Hiawatha is described as being the son of the virginal Winona and the West Wind. The incident appears in the mythology of more than one American people, and the supernatural birth is known in large groups of the Pacific Islands. 1. Whether in its physical, biological aspect immaculate conception ever did or could take place is not the question here. And for present purposes it matters not whether in its highest metaphysical aspect its oft-repeated story first of all may have been intended to symbolize the cosmic process of creation, that is, the impregnation of virgin matter by the divine breath out of which a universe is born. Of more general interest remains the indubitable fact that so many peoples have deemed the ordinary way of propagation to be too common, too coarse, too lowly for those whom they worshipped. In the popular mind the mightier the hero the greater the need for providing him with a worthy entrance upon his mortal existence. Popular belief has wanted such at least to be disconnected from and raised above all vulgar touch of sex, and has therefore ascribed their birth to an immaculate conception, in other words, to a pure and passionless one. Pure must be the form into which such an individual is born. Race consciousness apparently has always everywhere, intuitively known that qualities worthy of worship belong to realms where the sense of sex dwells not. There is however, still another aspect of the idea of immaculate conception. It serves as a universal symbol of the coming into expression in the human individual of what has variously been called the higher self, the Christ within, the spirit. 
In this aspect the idea of virgin birth shows explicitly that only in the body of a virgin of either sex can spirit come to fruition. LV The Bible Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians v. 16 All the great faiths have taught abstinence, and Christianity too has not failed to bring out that impurity lies the essence of all religion, always is purity insisted on as a means to salvation. Unless man doth partake of unspotted virginity, the hope of salvation is cut off. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, knowing that they which were not defiled with women, were redeemed, and that blessed are the undefiled. Every one should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification, not in the lust of concupiscence, should know especially that the lust of the flesh is not of the Father, but that it is a man-made, mind-fed distortion of the natural faculty to propagate the race. There is no enemy to the faith like the lower nature of the individual, and the carnal mind is enmity against God. Hence the advice to put off, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and to make not provision for the flesh, to fulfill the lusts thereof. But how many Christians follow this advice? Their marriage is frequently no more than the making of such a provision. The essence of the New Testament is the negation of sex, and the recommendation of genuine and pure celibacy, is expressed in the New Testament in such sayings as, concerning virgins, it is good for a man so to be, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. It is even stated that it is not good to marry. But all men cannot receive this saying, since it is meant for those only who wholeheartedly seek spiritual unfoldment. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, they are foolishness to him, only he that is able to receive it, let him receive it. The carnal marriage in genuine Christianity is merely, something allowed to those who lack strength to aspire to the highest. Such marriage is a concession to human nature, to human weakness. It is accepted as something apparently as unavoidable for spiritual infants as diapers are for babes. Better to marry than to burn, better let babies have diapers than be unclean. At the same time a higher form of marriage is spoken of, one in which they that have mates be as though they had none, a marriage in which personal ties are based on a community of spiritual interests, and in which spiritual love transcends physical attractions. This is the ideal marriage for men and women who seek support in each other, in an effort to outgrow the animal, to grow up to the spiritual. And they will not fail to find that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. The Gospel clearly shows what the requirements are for those who long to hasten evolution. They should walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, because it is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. In an evolutionary sense, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life. A strict requirement for one who wishes to be a true Christian, is laid down in the statement that they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the passions and the lust thereof. Since the flesh lusteth against the spirit, it is evidently necessary to overcome the lusts of the flesh, in order to become spiritual. Some very practical hints are given to help in this process, best of all, whatever things are pure, think on these things, and let no filthy communication come from your mouth, also remember that filthy dreamers defile the flesh. Through night and day the watchword is, to overcome. In the scripture overcome is used to symbolize the triumph, over sex desire. To him that overcometh great things are promised. In the end he that overcometh, shall go no more out, apparently meaning that he shall not have to be reborn, because he shall have accomplished the purpose of existence in human form. Definitely according to the teachings of scripture, the only way that perfection can be attained is by saving the seed, for whosoever is born of God, his seed remaineth in him. The Bible could hardly have been clearer in teaching and beseeching people to abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul and in emphasizing the elevating power of sexual purity. LVI Early Christianity The early Christians preached a doctrine of sexual asceticism, as the ideal for those who would rise to the heights of spiritual life, Bigelow Sex Education. A new movement is always purest in its inception, when it is unencumbered by rules and bylaws of organization, not yet encrusted with formalities. It has then not yet suffered from commentators and interpreters. To find the motive power of a movement, it must be studied as it was in the beginning, when its adherents joined it from conviction, by their own free choice. In the early centuries Christianity demanded purity of life. 
strictness and morals and inner purity were the primary requirements. As a result, for nearly 200 years after its establishment the Christian community exhibited a moral purity which has never been surpassed. In the genuine and original Christianity the ascetic tendency is unmistakable, it is the summit towards which all strive upwards, and as in other ascetic movements celibacy was the first and always the chief asceticism. In the pure spiritual vision of the devotees, virginity became the radiant ideal, for men as well as for women, for there are virgins of both sexes. Chastity was the supreme virtue, the mystic key to Christian holiness. Enthusiastic converts took the vow of chastity. Some associated themselves with congenial souls of the opposite sex and formed platonic unions in which they aspired to maintain the purity which they had vowed. This institution of spiritual mates continued to flourish for many generations. However, all vows of continence were a matter of individual volition, and therein lay their strength. Vows cannot be very effective unless they are the outcome of an inner conviction. The writings of the early church fathers reflect the life, the thoughts, the aspirations of the Christians of their day. All of these fathers speak of the chastity and sobriety which characterized the sect, and of marriages of which the sole object was the securing of offspring. It was urged that a believer should not touch his wife, except only for the sake of children, because to have intercourse except for procreation is to do injury to nature. The fathers exhorted their flocks to abstinence from sexual gratification because they considered such abstinence to be the practical method in the science of the divine life, furnishing men with the power of assimilating themselves with spiritual natures in other words, because only by parsimony of the flesh can one gain the spirit. Therefore, they said, renounce we things carnal, that we may at length bear fruit spiritual. Every kindling up of the lurking passion runs counter to the spirit, Every indulgence of carnal thought and desire leads away from it. No man can serve the flesh and the spirit. Thus among the early Christians we find the old it ever new and ever true teaching that those who can should overcome the serpent, the creeping monster which devours the earth, they should do so because the desire of lust makes one a stranger to the language of the spirit. Fifty-seven Mysticism in mystic work the serpent must be overcome. Problems of Mysticism A mystic is one who in intense devotional contemplation reaches up to union with the divine. Mysticism is an entirely spiritual activity. The business of the mystic is to remake his entire personality in the interest of his spiritual self. He must become spiritual, and for this purpose he must attain an uncommon purity of life. The self must be purged of its devotion to sense, because only when the tumult of the senses is stilled, can the eternal wisdom be revealed to the one who seeks mystic communion. Therefore, the purification of the senses is the first stage of mystic life. A life of strict asceticism has seemed the only way by which the carnal self could be purged. For this reason genuine mysticism cannot exist without asceticism. In order to still the impulses of the senses the mystic must adopt ascetic practices, oft very rigorously at first, as the preliminary training for a larger spiritual life. And he must normally continue some of those practices because the spiritual exaltation, which is a part of the mystic's life would be impossible without asceticism. The highest degrees of spiritual exaltation are hardly conceivable without prolonged mortification of sensual appetites. Therefore, all the great mystics observed strict continence. True mysticism has nothing whatever to do with sexuality. The true mystic has risen above sex to the planes where sex is not. The mystical manuals show that for spiritual education, the sexual libido must be withdrawn from its original use. All the writings by mystics bring out the necessity of sexual purity in their quest. Like most of the literature of their time, the language of their dissertations is usually dull and involved but some of the clearest of their own statements follow. No one can be enlightened unless he be first purified. And purity is this, that a man withdraws from all unchaste deeds in whatever manner they be. For unchastity in actions takes away the purity of the body, unchastity in thoughts takes away the purity of the soul. Chastity is the power which opens the soul to the things of heaven, whereas fleshly likings take a man far from the clear sight of spiritual things. Animal man merely gratifies an animal desire, and knows nothing of the delight of spiritual essences. Only by annihilating and subduing the passions can the understanding become divine. People think that we are in pain and great penance, but we have more true delight in a day than others have in the world all their lives. 
spiritual comforts exceed all the delights of the world and all pleasures of the flesh. Even although abstinences give some pain to the body, yet they so lessen the power of bodily appetites and passions, and so increase our taste for spiritual joys, that even these severities add to the enjoyment of our lives. No bodily and fleshly pleasure can ever take place without spiritual loss. Even a longing after sensual pleasures is unapt for spiritual enjoyments. Hence we must purify ourselves from the affections which we have to venial acts, for these affections, weaken the powers of the spirit. Perfection cannot be attained, until all passions and fleshly lusts are burnt out, so that only those who fight against their own passions, may conquer and obtain perfection. All who follow the lust of the flesh are dead in soul. To live the spiritual life of the soul farewell must be said to all that delights the senses, the pleasures of the flesh must be utterly renounced. For as fire and water will not mix, so spirituality and carnality cannot be experienced together. All these quotations are from Christian mystics only. But mystics have existed in every religion, and also independent of established forms of religion. The similarity of their experiences is one of the most convincing indications that all forms of religion and of spiritual philosophy are based on a single truth, on one reality, which the mystic in his highest state of contemplation seeks to approach. Quotations from other mystics given elsewhere will supply additional proof that there is one requirement, which is unanimously acknowledged to be indispensable for their work, and which no true mystic has ever failed to fulfill. They have transcended the sense world in order to live on high levels the spiritual life. The mystics often may have been one-sided in their concentrated effort to reach a spiritualized consciousness. But just as all others who have aspired to spiritual heights, they have recognized the great transmutability of the sexual libido, and they have exemplified it as die most essential need for spiritual development. Not only to mystics but to all who seek to acquire greater and lasting happiness through higher evolutionary attainment applies the rule that within oneself animal man must be killed to make room for spiritual man. Fifty eight Christian Science. The serpent pursues with hatred the spiritual idea. Eddy Science and Health. Amongst modern religious movements, Christian science demands attention. Having introduced applied metaphysics into Orthodox religion, it analyzes every subject in a way characteristically its own. And from its unusual viewpoint, it joins other religions in supporting in its highest teachings the ideal of sexual purity. Its founders' emphatic utterances on this ideal are particularly noteworthy, because they embody a restatement of the early Christian viewpoint, after verification by a knowledge of modern psychology. Holding that it is not wise to take a halting and halfway position, Christian science commands man to conquer lust with chastity. It warns against the downward tendencies of sensualism and impurity. It even holds that essentially celibacy is nearer right than marriage. As of every other religion so of Christian science, the purpose is to spiritualize its adherents in its own way. But then, there is but one way, which leads to spiritual being. Since there is no sensuality in spirit, spirit is only heard when the senses are silent. The flesh and spirit can no more unite in action than good can coincide with evil. Those who have hope in immortality, as Christian scientists have, must keep in mind that nothing sensual is immortal, Hence everything that in the least savors of sensuality must be extirpated before the hope for immortality can be attained. According to the teachings of Christian science corporeal sense is the serpent. And more definitely in its literature the serpent is identified with lust. For the manual speaks of that old serpent whose name is devil, and then defines devil, amongst other things as, the lust of the flesh. Therefore the statement that the serpent will struggle to destroy the spiritual idea again brings out that any remnant of sensuality is looked upon as an obstruction to spirituality. Moreover there is the very practical consideration that if sexual propensities were dominated by Christian love for both the living and the unborn, a subject on which Christian science is emphatic, many existing charitable societies would have no reason to be. For there can be no doubt that there would be fewer hospital and asylum cases, fewer ailing or deserted babies, fewer unfit adults to be taken care of by charity, if considerations of love ruled humanity's sexual expression. So from various angles sexual purity is insisted on, and purity from the Christian science standpoint, is to be realized through an identification with and a longing and love for purity. 
In popular thought Christian science is best known for its method of spiritual or mental healing. Undoubtedly, the extent to which physical health depends upon the mastery of the spirit over the body has not yet been fully realized. It cannot be realized and successfully demonstrated until a high degree of sexual purity has made spiritual development possible. Spiritual, mental, or magnetic healing can be accomplished only by the most pure. If Jesus obtained miraculous results in healing in such ways, it was possible to him because there never lived a man so far removed from appetites and passions as the Nazarene. Healers who lack that perfect purity may succeed in raising physical health vibrations in a patient. But along with this, they are liable to transmit to the subject some of their own mixed emanations of doubtful purity, which are likely to prove detrimental in other than physical ways. To emulate the spiritual healing powers of the Christ, it is prerequisite to emulate his perfect purity. This ideal state can be attained by anyone who really in every way will abide by the morale of absolute Christian science, which consists of self-abnegation and purity. Only by self-abnegation and purity, including perfect sexual purity, can one demonstrate that it is chastity and purity which really attest to the divine origin and operation of Christian science. LX Islam. Whoever is afflicted with lust is veiled from all spiritual things. No religion can be judged by what the masses have made of its teachings. One has to look for its highest aspect in the lives and the writings of its wisest and most saintly adherents. Among the Mohammedans the saintliest and wisest men and women have always been the Sufis, the mystics of Islam, whose soul have been freed from the defilement of the flesh. Their existence dates back to the days of their prophet, and already the early Sufis wanted to be free from all that concerned the phenomenal world, in order to be free for the world of spiritual things. Very soon the Sufis realized the advantage of celibacy for the mystic, therefore Sufism was founded on celibacy. Sufism is, to keep far from the claims of the senses, and to adhere to spiritual qualities. The natural desires in the Sufi are bridled with the bridle of knowledge, for he recognizes that while man is continually being directed by intellect and passion into contrary ways, passion is a fake guide, and he is commanded to resist it. The Prophet himself had said, Thy worst enemy is thy nafs, which is between thy two sides. Nafs is the seat of passion and lust, it constitutes the great obstacle to attainment. Mortification of the nafs is the chief work of devotion, no disciple who neglects this duty will ever learn the rudiments of Sufism. The principle of mortification is that the nafs should be weaned from those things to which it is accustomed, that it shall be brought to recognize the impurity of its actions. Self-mortification as advanced Sufis understand it is a moral transmutation of the inner man. They hold that complete independence from the carnal self is a state which, if lost, means loss of eternal bliss. Their concept of fauna, which in some respects closely coincides with the Buddhist's idea of nirvana, involves the extinction of all passions and desires. The Sufis are not the only Mohammedans who are convinced that sexual acts interfere with spiritual expression. Among the Turks the order of calendars is bound to perpetual virginity. The Moors say that, when one is sexually unclean, the reciting of passages of the Quran is of no avail, and a person who is sexually unclean is not allowed to pray. Also any Mohammedan would not dare to approach the sanctuary of a saint in a state of sexual uncleanness. And in regard to the pilgrimage to Mecca, which every good Mohammedan aspires to undertake, the Quran admonishes that whosoever purposeth to go on pilgrimage, let him not know a woman nor transgress during the pilgrimage. The charge that Muhammad allowed men to pander to their passions is ludicrous. He imposed fasts upon every one of his followers to assist them to detach themselves from the passions. He banned alcoholic drinks in order to assist their efforts at self-control. Long and frequent periods of sexual abstinence are enjoined. There must for instance be no sexual intercourse during the thirty days of the Ramadan fast. Although this rule is not strictly prescribed in the Quran, it is so understood by the Sufis who hold that the religious practice of fasting involves not only keeping the belly without food and drink, but also guarding the eye from lustful looks, the tongue from foul words, and the body from following after worldly things. Only one who acts in this manner is truly keeping his fast. And in addition to the fast the Prophet enforced, forms of self-discipline, imposed with the aim of subordinating the habits of the body to the spiritual welfare of the soul. 
Whatever concessions Mohammedanism as it is practiced may have made to the masses, it nevertheless shows in its teachings an understanding of the fact that the abandonment of sensual desires draws the soul towards heaven. In this way at least the esotericists among the Mohammedans reaffirm the basic law that a strict purification of the sexual life is absolutely necessary for progressed evolutionary unfoldment. LX Judaism. If man purifies himself he will receive the assistance of the holy soul. The sanctity of perfect continence may be traced through the most distant ages and the most various creeds including Judaism. It may be true that Judaism was in some respects the least ascetic of religions, but in it appear prophets, whose lives were severely austere. Moreover, that the Jews entertained ideas of peculiar sanctity as attaching to the restraint of the animal passion is shown, by the vows of continence of the Pharisees. Whole Hebrew sects have regarded virginity as the ideal of sanctity. Especially the Essenes, lived in a condition of celibacy, while the fear of, reinforcing the lower appetites of the human being inspired the vegetarianism of the Jewish therapeuti. In the Nazarenes too the Jews possess such a body of men. The Old Testament indicates that among the Hebrews we find the restriction of sexual intercourse, in connection with the Theophany at Sinai, and with the use of consecrated bread. Those who celebrate the Passover also are bidden to do so with their loins mortified. Strict continence was required of the Hebrew congregation, before entering the temple. And there is mention of a similar abstinence being imposed by the old law on the Levites, during their term of service in the temple. Also when the Israelites marched forth to war, they were bound by certain rules of ceremonial purity, and they had to practice continence. Under all circumstances, over against all other views, Judaism holds firmly to the purity of the human being. It is even claimed that Jewish ethics excels all other ethical systems in its insistence on purity, any unchaste look, thought or act, and all profanity of speech is declared to be an unpardonable offense. Conclusive proof of the Hebrews' appreciation of sexual abstinence can be found in the Talmud, which treats of the common law, customs and ritual considered essential to the outward life of the Israelite. The Torah teaching or law has been revealed only for the purpose of purifying human beings. And more effectively than anything else, abstinence leads to purity, and purity leads to holiness. Therefore be temperate and chaste, and purify and sanctify thyself from all iniquity. A splendid instance of Talmudic wisdom in regard to sexual purity is contained in the line stating that there is a small organ in the human body which is always hungry if one tries to satisfy it, and always satisfied if one starves it. In their entirety, the laws have been given to Israel to purify it and to cleanse it from fleshly appetites. Hebrew philosophers too have strongly emphasized the need of sexual purification. Philo, for instance, called attention to the moral disease seated in the flesh. He warned that, the passions injure the mind, and that, their onset is swift and difficult to withstand. He affirmed that, the perfect man must be pure in every word, and in every action in his whole life. Maimonides reminded his readers of the fact that the rabbis command that man should conquer his desires. And he held that those who wish to be men in truth, must constantly endeavor to reduce the wants of the body, such as cohabiting. Later Hebrew thinkers made it clear that moral regeneration must be an outgrowth of one's own power, by great struggles must one obtain spiritual equilibrium. Despite the sensual propensity innate in man's nature, he is vested with the power of conquering it. The sensuous desire in the body is, never a compulsion. Therefore one must lend no ear to appetite, and be chaste in private even as in the marketplace. In Judaism as in other religions the deepest and most valuable wisdom is to be found in its esoteric teachings. The Hebrew secret science known as the Gabala, can be found in its most accessible form in the Zohar, which is a Kabbalistic commentary on the Pentateuch wherein the entire system of the Gabala is compiled. In the Zohar it is stated that the mighty evil serpent, roams about in the world, and thus the child of man becomes polluted. When that strong serpent begins to arise, woe then unto thee. Only when man comes to cleanse himself, the holy soul sanctifies him. The good spirit comes to him from the day he becomes pure. But at the time man deviates from this way, the holy soul no longer has a connection with him. Knowing these sayings in the Zohar to be statements of a universal law, the original Kabbalistic companions led an ascetic and holy life, lest the mysterious and occult science might prove injurious to all concerned. After all, 
the most powerful enunciation of nature's law that spirituality cannot be combined with sexual indulgence, is contained in a masterpiece of Hebrew literature, namely in the allegory of Adam and Eve and the serpent. By the serpent the Jews typified the enemy of mankind. And according to rabbinical tradition, the serpent is the symbol of the sexual passion. Hence the temptation by the serpent characterizes mankind's yielding to the sexual impulse for self-gratification as its surrender to the antagonist of higher human attainment. The allegory of Adam and Eve, being driven away from the tree of life means that the race abused the mystery of life and dragged it down into the region of animalism and bestiality. This archaic Hebrew story records the fact that sexual indulgence has caused humanity to be driven from paradise, that is, from a purely spiritual manner of living. It teaches, by deduction, that the only way to regain a paradisical spiritual existence is along the path of sexual purification. This lesson is the greatest gift of Judaism to the world. Alexi The Religion of Ancient Egypt let the state of the shining ones be obtained, in place of the satisfying of the longing of lust, Book of the Dead. Only a fragmentary knowledge has been uncovered about ancient Egypt. But even from the fragments can the fact be verified that the Egyptians possessed deep knowledge about the evolutionary and the regenerative importance of sexual continence. Their greatest spiritual leader was Thoth, better known as Hermes, the name given to him by the Greeks. The Book of Thoth, contained the secret processes by which the regeneration of humanity was to be accomplished. It taught that no man can be saved without regeneration, and that this regeneration or spiritual rebirth is an escape from the delusions of the body, which has with mass of matter blocked the senses and crammed them full of loathsome lust. All that in man is animal is proner unto bad than unto good, and where there's passion, nowhere is there good, for where is night, day is nowhere. Thus passions and desires are ills exceeding great but greatest ill of all is that each of these things is thought down here to be the greatest good. However, it is possible to free oneself from these ills, namely by continence, the power against desire. Just throw out of work the body's senses, and thy divinity shall come to birth. Then passion and desire withdraw, and thus it is that man does speed thereafter upwards to the harmony. And then the knowledge of joy has come, and on its coming sorrow flees away. Thus taught thrice greatest Hermes. Other indications of similar knowledge can be found in the Book of the Dead, which is the general body of texts having reference to the burial of the dead, and to the new life in the world beyond the grave, which texts were in use among the Egyptians since about 4500 B. C. It contains such suggestive sections as, the chapter of repulsing the serpent, and the chapter of a man not being bitten by a serpent. It speaks of the serpent, coiled round a lotus flower, this flower symbolizing man, for the deceased is saying, I am the pure lotus. In the chapter generally known as the negative confession the person who has left the physical body appears as an applicant for spiritual instruction. To prove his worthiness he is saying, I have not defiled my body, I have not committed fornication, I have not polluted myself, I have not lusted, nor have I done any other abominable thing, I am pure, I am pure, I am pure. Triumphant sounds the announcement in another part of the Book of the Dead. The Apophis is overthrown. Now, Apophis is the serpent, the symbol of human passions. Also Apophis is the enemy of Ra, who is light. The passions are ever known as the enemies of spiritual enlightenment. Thus taught the Book of the Dead, and accordingly, the destruction of the serpent, frequently occurs in the Egyptian sculptures. That the power of sexual purity was recognized in ecclesiastic circles, is proven by the fact that chastity and purifications were common to all the Egyptian priests and that moreover the efficacy of abstinence was popularly acknowledged becomes apparent when one reads that when any king died all the inhabitants of Egypt united in mourning for him for seventy-two days, and no one would have dared to indulge in sexual intercourse during that time. Thus in ancient Egypt as elsewhere was abstinence from sexual acts, known to have an efficacious influence extending far beyond the physical realm. Sixty two Hinduism. Spiritual wisdom is the fruit of indifference to sensual pleasures, 